This is Audible. Audio Renaissance presents The Shock Doctrine The Rise of Disaster Capitalism by Naomi Klein. Read for you by Jennifer Wiltsey. Introduction Blank is beautiful. Three decades of erasing and remaking the world. I met Jamar Perry in September 2005 at the Big Red Cross shelter in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Dinner was being doled out by grinning young Scientologists and he was standing in line. I had just been busted for talking to evacuees without a media escort and was now doing my best to blend in, a white Canadian in a sea of African-American Southerners. I dodged into the food line behind Perry and asked him to talk to me as if we were old friends, which he kindly did. Born and raised in New Orleans, he'd been out of the flooded city for a week. He looked about 17 but told me he was 23. He and his family had waited forever, for the evacuation buses. When they didn't arrive, they had walked out in the baking sun. Finally, they ended up here, a sprawling convention center, normally home to pharmaceutical trade shows and Capital City Carnage, the ultimate in steel cage fighting. Now jammed with 2,000 cots and a mess of angry, exhausted people being patrolled by edgy National Guard soldiers just back from Iraq. The news racing around the shelter that day was that Richard Baker, a prominent Republican congressman from this city, had told a group of lobbyists, We finally cleaned up public housing in New Orleans. We couldn't do it, but God did. Joseph Canizaro, one of New Orleans' wealthiest developers, had just expressed a similar sentiment. I think we have a clean sheet to start again, and with that clean sheet we have some very big opportunities. All that week, the Louisiana State Legislature in Baton Rouge had been crawling with corporate lobbyists helping to lock in those big opportunities. Lower taxes, fewer regulations, cheaper workers, and a smaller, safer city, which in practice meant leveling the public housing projects and replacing them with condos. Hearing all the talk of fresh starts and clean sheets, you could almost forget the toxic stew of rubble, chemical outflows, and human remains just a few miles down the highway. Over at the shelter, Jamar could think of nothing else. I really don't see it as cleaning up the city. What I see is that a lot of people got killed uptown. People who shouldn't have died. He was speaking quietly, but an older man in line in front of us overheard and whipped around. What is wrong with these people in Baton Rouge? This isn't an opportunity. It's a goddamn tragedy. Are they blind? A mother with two kids chimed in. No, they're not blind. They're evil. They see just fine. One of those who saw opportunity in the floodwaters of New Orleans was Milton Friedman, grand guru of the movement for unfettered capitalism and the man credited with writing the rulebook for the contemporary hypermobile global economy. Ninety-three years old and in failing health, Uncle Milty, as he was known to his followers, nonetheless found the strength to write an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal three months after the levees broke. Most New Orleans schools are in ruins, Friedman observed, as are the homes of the children who've attended them. The children are now scattered all over the country. This is a tragedy. It is also an opportunity to radically reform the educational system. Friedman's radical idea was that instead of spending a portion of the billions of dollars in reconstruction money on rebuilding and improving New Orleans' existing public school system, the government should provide families with vouchers which they could spend at private institutions, many run at a profit, that would be subsidized by the state. A network of right-wing think tanks seized on Friedman's proposal and descended on the city after the storm. The administration of George W. Bush backed up their plans with tens of millions of dollars to convert New Orleans schools into charter schools, publicly funded schools run by private entities according to their own rules. Charter schools are deeply polarizing in the United States, and nowhere more than in New Orleans, where they are seen by many African-American parents as a way of reversing the gains of the civil rights movement, which guaranteed all children the same standard of education. 
For Milton Friedman, however, the entire concept of a state-run school system reeked of socialism. In his view, the state's sole functions were to protect our freedom both from the enemies outside our gates and from our fellow citizens, to preserve law and order, to enforce private contracts, to foster competitive markets. In other words, to supply the police and the soldiers. Anything else, including providing free education, was an unfair interference in the market. In sharp contrast to the glacial pace with which the levees were repaired and the electricity grid was brought back online, the auctioning off of New Orleans' school system took place with military speed and precision. Within 19 months, with most of the city's poor residents still in exile, New Orleans' public school system had been almost completely replaced by privately run charter schools. Before Hurricane Katrina, the school board had run 123 public schools. Now it ran just four. Before that storm, there had been seven charter schools in the city. Now there were 30. New Orleans teachers used to be represented by a strong union. Now the union's contract had been shredded and its 4,700 members had all been fired. New Orleans was now, according to the New York Times, the nation's preeminent laboratory for the widespread use of charter schools. While the American Enterprise Institute, a Freedmanite think tank, enthused that Katrina accomplished in a day what Louisiana school reformers couldn't do after years of trying. Public school teachers, meanwhile, watching money allocated for the victims of the flood being diverted to erase a public system and replace it with a private one, were calling Friedman's plan an educational land grab. I call these orchestrated raids on the public sphere in the wake of catastrophic events, combined with the treatment of disasters as exciting market opportunities, disaster capitalism. Friedman's New Orleans op-ed ended up being his last public policy recommendation. He died less than a year later, on November 16, 2006, at age 94. Privatizing the school system of a mid-size American city may seem like a modest preoccupation for the man hailed as the most influential economist of the past half-century, one who counted among his disciples several U.S. presidents, British prime ministers, Russian oligarchs, Polish finance ministers, third world dictators, Chinese Communist Party secretaries, international monetary fund directors, and the past three chiefs of the U.S. Federal Reserve. Yet his determination to exploit the crisis in New Orleans, to advance a fundamentalist version of capitalism, was also an oddly fitting farewell from the boundlessly energetic five-foot-two-inch professor who, in his prime, described himself as an old-fashioned preacher delivering a Sunday sermon. For more than three decades, Friedman and his powerful followers had been perfecting this very strategy. Waiting for a major crisis or shock, then selling off pieces of the state to private players while citizens were still reeling from the shock, then quickly making the reforms permanent. In one of his most influential essays, Friedman articulated contemporary capitalism's core tactical nostrum, what I have come to understand as the shock doctrine. He observed that only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. Some people stockpile canned goods and water in preparation for major disasters. Friedmanites stockpile free market ideas. And once a crisis has struck, the University of Chicago professor was convinced that it was crucial to act swiftly, to impose rapid and irreversible change before the crisis-wracked society slipped back into the tyranny of the status quo. Friedman first learned how to exploit a large-scale shock or crisis in the mid-70s, when he acted as advisor to the Chilean dictator General Augusto Pinochet. Not only were Chileans in a state of shock following Pinochet's violent coup, but the country was also traumatized by severe hyperinflation. Friedman advised Pinochet to impose a rapid-fire transformation of the economy. Tax cuts, free trade, privatized services, cuts to social spending and deregulation. 
Eventually, Chileans even saw their public schools replaced with voucher-funded private ones. It was the most extreme capitalist makeover ever attempted anywhere, and it became known as a Chicago School Revolution, since so many of Pinochet's economists had studied under Friedman at the University of Chicago. Friedman predicted that the speed, suddenness, and scope of the economic shifts would provoke psychological reactions in the public that facilitate the adjustment. He coined a phrase for this painful tactic, economic shock treatment. In the decades since, whenever governments have imposed sweeping free market programs, the all-at-once shock treatment or shock therapy has been the method of choice. Pinochet also facilitated the adjustment with his own shock treatments. These were performed in the regime's many torture cells, inflicted on the writhing bodies of those deemed most likely to stand in the way of the capitalist transformation. Many in Latin America saw a direct connection between the economic shocks that impoverished millions and the epidemic of torture that punished hundreds of thousands of people who believed in a different kind of society. Exactly 30 years after such forms of shock descended on Chile, the formula re-emerged with far greater violence in Iraq. I started researching the free market's dependence on the power of shock four years ago, during the early days of the occupation of Iraq. After reporting from Baghdad on Washington's failed attempts to follow their shock and awe military doctrine with shock therapy, I traveled to Sri Lanka several months after the devastating 2004 tsunami and witnessed another version of the same maneuver. Foreign investors and international lenders had teamed up to use the atmosphere of panic to hand the entire tropical coastline over to entrepreneurs, who quickly built large resorts, blocking hundreds of thousands of fishing people from rebuilding their villages near the water. In a cruel twist of fate, nature has presented Sri Lanka with a unique opportunity, and out of this great tragedy will come a world-class tourism destination, the Sri Lankan government announced. By the time Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, and the nexus of Republican politicians, think tanks, and land developers started talking about clean sheets and exciting opportunities, it was clear that this was now the preferred method of advancing corporate goals, using moments of collective trauma to engage in radical social and economic engineering. Most people who survive a devastating disaster want the opposite of a clean slate. They want to salvage whatever they can and begin repairing what was not destroyed. They want to reaffirm their relatedness to the places that formed them. When I rebuild the city... I feel like I'm rebuilding myself, said Cassandra Andrews, a resident of New Orleans' heavily damaged Lower Ninth Ward, as she cleared away debris after the storm. But disaster capitalists have no interest in repairing what was. In Iraq, Sri Lanka, and New Orleans, the process deceptively called reconstruction began with finishing the job of the original disaster by erasing what was left of the public sphere and rooted communities then quickly moving to replace them with a kind of corporate New Jerusalem, all before the victims of war or natural disaster were able to regroup and stake their claims to what was theirs. Mike Battles puts it best. For us, the fear and disorder offered real promise. The 34-year-old ex-CIA operative was talking about how the chaos in Iraq had helped his unknown and inexperienced private security firm, Custer Battles, to shake roughly $100 million in contracts out of the federal government. When I began this research into the intersection between super profits and mega disasters, I thought I was witnessing a radical change in the way the drive to liberate markets was advancing around the world. Having been part of the movement against ballooning corporate power that made its global debut in Seattle in 1999, I was accustomed to seeing similar business-friendly policies imposed through arm-twisting at World Trade Organization summits, or as the conditions attached to loans from the International Monetary Fund. The three trademark demands, privatization, government deregulation, and deep cuts to social spending, tended to be extremely unpopular with citizens. But when the agreements were signed, there was still at least the pretext of mutual consent between the governments doing the negotiating, as well as a consensus among the supposed experts. Now, the same ideological program is being imposed via the most baldly coercive means possible. Under foreign military occupation after an invasion, or immediately following a cataclysmic natural disaster. 
September 11th appeared to have provided Washington with the green light to stop asking countries if they wanted the U.S. version of free trade and democracy and to start imposing it with shock and awe military force. As I dug deeper into the history of how this market model had swept the globe, however, I discovered that the idea of exploiting crisis and disaster has been the modus operandi of Milton Friedman's movement from the very beginning. This fundamentalist form of capitalism has always needed disasters to advance. It was certainly the case that the facilitating disasters were getting bigger and more shocking. But what was happening in Iraq and New Orleans was not a new post-September 11th invention. Rather, these bold experiments in crisis exploitation were the culmination of three decades of strict adherence to the shock doctrine. Seen through the lens of this doctrine, the past 35 years look very different. Some of the most infamous human rights violations of this era, which have tended to be viewed as sadistic acts carried out by anti-democratic regimes, were in fact either committed with the deliberate intent of terrorizing the public or actively harnessed to prepare the ground for the introduction of radical free market reforms. In Argentina in the 70s, the junta's disappearance of 30,000 people, most of them leftist activists, was integral to the imposition of the country's Chicago school policies, just as terror had been a partner for the same kind of economic metamorphosis in Chile. In China, in 1989, it was the shock of the Tiananmen Square massacre, and the subsequent arrests of tens of thousands that freed the hand of the Communist Party to convert much of the country into a sprawling export zone, staffed with workers too terrified to demand their rights. In Russia, in 1993, it was Boris Yeltsin's decision to send in tanks to set fire to the parliament building and lock up the opposition leaders that cleared the way for the fire sale privatization that created the country's notorious oligarchs. In Latin America and Africa in the 80s, it was a debt crisis that forced countries to be privatized or die, as one former IMF official put it. Coming unraveled by hyperinflation and too indebted to say no to demands that came bundled with foreign loans, governments accepted shock treatment on the promise that it would save them from deeper disaster. In Asia, it was the financial crisis of 1997-98, comparable in devastation to the Great Depression, that humbled the so-called Asian tigers, cracking open their markets to what the New York Times described as the world's biggest going-out-of-business sale. Many of these countries were democracies, but the radical free market transformations were not imposed democratically. Quite the opposite. As Friedman understood, the atmosphere of large-scale crisis provided the necessary pretext to overrule the expressed wishes of voters and to hand the country over to economic technocrats. For economic shock therapy to be applied without restraint, some sort of additional major collective trauma has always been required one that either temporarily suspended democratic practices or suppressed them entirely. This ideological crusade was born in the authoritarian regimes of South America. And in its largest new conquered territories, Russia and China, it coexists most comfortably and most profitably with an iron-fisted leadership. Shock Therapy Comes Home Friedman's Chicago school movement has been conquering territory around the world since the 70s, but until recently its vision had never been fully applied in its country of origin. Certainly Reagan had made headway, but the U.S. retained a welfare system, social security and public schools, where parents clung, in Friedman's words, to their irrational attachment to a socialist system. When the Republicans gained control of Congress in 1995, David Frum, a transplanted Canadian and future speechwriter for George W. Bush, was among the so-called neoconservatives calling for a shock therapy-style economic revolution in the U.S. Here's how I think we should do it. On a single day this summer, we eliminate 300 programs, each one costing a billion dollars or less. Frum didn't get his homegrown shock therapy at the time, largely because there was no domestic crisis to prepare the ground. But in 2001, that changed. When the September 11th attacks hit, the White House was packed with Friedman's disciples, including his close friend, Donald Rumsfeld. The Bush team seized the moment of collective vertigo with chilling speed. 
not, as some have claimed, because the administration deviously plotted the crisis, but because the key figures of the administration, veterans of earlier disaster capitalism experiments in Latin America and Eastern Europe, were part of a movement that prays for crisis, the way drought-struck farmers pray for rain, and the way Christian Zionist end-timers pray for the rapture. The Bush administration immediately seized upon the fear generated by the 9-11 attacks not only to launch the War on Terror, but to ensure that it is an almost completely for-profit venture, a booming new industry that has breathed new life into the faltering U.S. economy. Best understood as a disaster capitalism complex, it has much farther-reaching tentacles than the military-industrial complex that Dwight Eisenhower warned against at the end of his presidency. This is global war fought on every level by private companies whose involvement is paid for with public money, with the unending mandate of protecting the United States homeland in perpetuity while eliminating all evil abroad. In only a few short years, the complex has already expanded its market reach from fighting terrorism to international peacekeeping, to municipal policing, to responding to increasingly frequent natural disasters. The ultimate goal for the corporations at the center of the complex is to bring the model of for-profit government, which advances so rapidly in extraordinary circumstances, into the ordinary and day-to-day -day functioning of the state. In effect, to privatize the government. To kickstart the disaster capitalism complex, the Bush administration outsourced with no public debate many of the most sensitive and core functions of government. From providing health care to soldiers, to interrogating prisoners, to gathering and data mining information on all of us. The role of the government in this unending war is not that of an administrator managing a network of contractors, but of a deep-pocketed venture capitalist both providing its seed money for the complex's creation and becoming the biggest customer for its new services. Beyond the weapons contractors, who have seen their profits soar thanks to the war in Iraq, which, as of early 2007, was on track to cost $2 trillion, maintaining the U.S. military is now one of the fastest-growing service economies in the world. Then there's humanitarian relief and reconstruction. Pioneered in Iraq, for-profit relief and reconstruction has already become the new global paradigm. Responding to disaster is simply too hot an emerging market to be left to the non-profits. Why should UNICEF rebuild schools when it can be done by Bechtel, one of the largest engineering firms in the U.S.? Why put displaced people from Mississippi in subsidized empty apartments when they can be housed on Carnival cruise ships? Why deploy U.N. peacekeepers to Darfur when private security companies like Blackwater are looking for new clients. Amid the weapons trade, the private soldiers, for-profit reconstruction, and the homeland security industry, what has emerged as a result of the Bush administration's particular brand of post-September 11th shock therapy is a fully articulated new economy. It was built in the Bush era, but it now exists quite apart from any one administration, and will remain entrenched until the corporate supremacist ideology that underpins it is identified, isolated, and challenged. In scale, the disaster capitalism complex is on a par with the emerging market and information technology booms of the 90s. In fact, insiders say that the deals are even better than during the dot-com days. Indeed, the disaster economy may well have saved the world market from the full-blown recession it was facing on the eve of 9-11. In the attempt to relate the history of the ideological crusade that has culminated in the radical privatization of war and disaster, one problem recurs. The ideology is a shapeshifter, forever changing its name and switching identities. Friedman called himself a liberal, but his U.S. followers, who associated liberals with high taxes and hippies, tended to identify as conservatives, classical economists, free marketers, and later, as believers in Reaganomics or laissez-faire. In most of the world, their orthodoxy is known as neoliberalism, but it is often called free trade or simply globalization. Only since the mid-90s has the intellectual movement led by the right-wing think tanks with which Friedman had long associations 
Heritage Foundation, Cato Institute, and the American Enterprise Institute, called itself neoconservative, a worldview that has harnessed the full force of the U.S. military machine in the service of a corporate agenda. A more accurate term for a system that erases the boundaries between big government and big business is not liberal, conservative, or capitalist, but corporatist. Its main characteristics are huge transfers of public wealth to private hands, often accompanied by exploding debt, an ever-widening chasm between the dazzling rich and the disposable poor, and an aggressive nationalism that justifies bottomless spending on security. For those inside the bubble of extreme wealth created by such an arrangement, there can be no more profitable way to organize a society. But because of the obvious drawbacks for the vast majority of the population left outside the bubble, other features of the corporatist state tend to include aggressive surveillance, mass incarceration, shrinking civil liberties, and often, though not always, torture. Torture as Metaphor Torture, or in CIA language, coercive interrogation, is a set of techniques designed to put prisoners into a state of deep disorientation and shock in order to force them to make concessions against their will. One declassified CIA manual states, there is an interval, which may be extremely brief, of suspended animation, a kind of psychological shock or paralysis. It is caused by a traumatic or subtraumatic experience which explodes, as it were, the world that is familiar to the subject as well as his image of himself within that world. Experienced interrogators recognize this effect when it appears and know that at this moment the source is far more open to suggestion, far likelier to comply than he was just before he experienced the shock. The shock doctrine mimics this process precisely attempting to achieve on a mass scale what torture does one-on-one -on -one in the interrogation cell. The clearest example was the shock of September 11th, which for millions of people exploded the world that is familiar and opened up a period of deep disorientation and regression that the Bush administration expertly exploited. Suddenly we found ourselves living in a kind of year zero, in which everything we knew of the world before could now be dismissed as pre-9-11 thinking. Never strong in our knowledge of history, North Americans had become a blank slate, a clean sheet of paper on which the newest and most beautiful words can be written, as Mao said of his people. A new army of experts instantly materialized to write new and beautiful words on the receptive canvas of our post-trauma consciousness. Clash of civilizations, they inscribed, axis of evil, Islamo-fascism, homeland security. With everyone preoccupied by the deadly new culture wars, the Bush administration was able to pull off what it could only have dreamed of doing before 9-11. Wage privatized wars abroad and build a corporate security complex at home. Like the terrorized prisoner who gives up the names of comrades and renounces his faith, shocked societies often give up things they would otherwise fiercely protect. Jamar Perry and his fellow evacuees at the Baton Rouge shelter were supposed to give up their housing projects and public schools. After the tsunami, the fishing people in Sri Lanka were supposed to give up their valuable beachfront land to hoteliers. Iraqis, if all had gone according to plan, were supposed to be so shocked and awed that they would give up control of their oil reserves, their state companies, and their sovereignty to U.S. military bases and green zones. The Big Lie Milton Friedman devoted his life to fighting a peaceful battle of ideas against those who believed that governments had a responsibility to intervene in the market to soften its sharp edges. He believed history got off on the wrong track when politicians began listening to John Maynard Keynes, intellectual architect of the New Deal and the modern welfare state. The market crash of 1929 had created an overwhelming consensus that laissez-faire had failed and that governments needed to intervene in the economy to redistribute wealth and regulate corporations. During those dark days for laissez-faire, when communism conquered the East, the welfare state was embraced by the West and economic nationalism took root in the post-colonial South, 
Friedman and his mentor, Friedrich Hayek, patiently protected the flame of a pure version of capitalism, untarnished by Keynesian attempts to pool collective wealth to build more just societies. The major error, in my opinion, Friedman wrote in a letter to Pinochet in 1975, was to believe that it is possible to do good with other people's money. Few listened. Most people kept insisting that their governments could and should do good. Friedman was dismissively described in Time in 1969 as a pixie or a pest, and revered as a prophet only by a select few. Finally, after he'd spent decades in the intellectual wilderness, came the 80s and the rule of Margaret Thatcher, who called Friedman an intellectual freedom fighter, and Ronald Reagan, who was seen carrying a copy of Capitalism and Freedom, Friedman's manifesto, on the presidential campaign trail. At last, there were political leaders who had the courage to implement unfettered free markets in the real world. According to this official story, after Reagan and Thatcher peacefully and democratically liberated their respective markets, the freedom and prosperity that followed were so obviously desirable that when dictatorships started falling, from Manila to Berlin, the masses demanded Reaganomics alongside their Big Macs. When the Soviet Union finally collapsed, the people of the evil empire were also eager to join the Friedmanite Revolution, as were the communists turned capitalists in China. That meant that nothing was left to stand in the way of a truly global free market, one in which liberated corporations were not only free in their own countries, but free to travel across borders unhindered, unleashing prosperity around the world. Fortune magazine, in its Friedman tribute, wrote that he had the tide of history with him. A resolution was passed in the U.S. Congress praising Friedman as one of the world's foremost champions of liberty, not just in economics, but in all respects. The California governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger, declared January 29, 2007, to be a statewide Milton Friedman Day, and several cities and towns did the same. A headline in the Wall Street Journal encapsulated this tidy narrative. Freedom Man This audio program is a challenge to the central and most cherished claim in the official story, that the triumph of deregulated capitalism has been born of freedom, that unfettered free markets go hand in hand with democracy. Instead, I will show that this fundamentalist form of capitalism has consistently been midwifed by the most brutal forms of coercion inflicted on the collective body politic as well as on countless individual bodies. The history of the contemporary free market, better understood as the rise of corporatism, was written in shocks. The stakes are high. The corporatist alliance is in the midst of conquering its final frontiers. The closed oil economies of the Arab world and sectors of Western economies that have long been protected from profit-making, including responding to disasters and raising armies. Since there is not even the veneer of seeking public consent to privatize such essential functions, either at home or abroad, escalating levels of violence and ever larger disasters are required in order to reach the goal. Yet because the decisive role played by shocks and crises has been so effectively purged from the official record of the rise of the free market, the extreme tactics on display in Iraq and New Orleans are often mistaken for the unique incompetence or cronyism of the Bush White House. In fact, Bush's exploits merely represent the monstrously violent and creative culmination of a 50-year campaign for total corporate liberation. I am not arguing that all forms of market systems are inherently violent. It is eminently possible to have a market-based economy that requires no such brutality and demands no such ideological purity. A free market in consumer products can coexist with free public health care, with public schools, with a large segment of the economy, like a national oil company, held in state hands. It's equally possible to require corporations to pay decent wages, to respect the right of workers to form unions, and for governments to tax and redistribute wealth so that the sharp inequalities that mark the corporatist state are reduced. Markets need not be fundamentalist. Keynes proposed exactly that kind of mixed regulated economy after the Great Depression, a revolution in public policy that created the New Deal and transformations like it around the world. 
It was exactly that system of compromises, checks and balances, that Friedman's counter-revolution was launched to methodically dismantle in country after country. Seen in that light, the Chicago school strain of capitalism does indeed have something in common with other dangerous ideologies. The signature desire for unattainable purity, for a clean slate on which to build a re-engineered model society. This desire for godlike powers of total creation is precisely why free market ideologues are so drawn to crises and disasters. For 35 years, what has animated Friedman's counter-revolution is an attraction to a kind of freedom and possibility available only in times of cataclysmic change. When people with their stubborn habits and insistent demands are blasted out of the way, moments when democracy seems a practical impossibility. Believers in the shock doctrine are convinced that only a great rupture, a flood, a war, a terrorist attack, can generate the kind of vast, clean canvases they crave. It is in these malleable moments, when we are psychologically unmoored and physically uprooted, that these artists of the real plunge in their hands and begin their work of remaking the world. The Torture Lab Ewan Cameron, The CIA, and The Maniacal Quest to Erase and Remake the Human Mind. I don't talk to journalists anymore, says the strained voice at the other end of the phone, and then a tiny window. What do you want? I figure I have about twenty seconds to make my case, and it won't be easy. How do I explain what I want from Gail Kastner, the journey that brought me to her? The truth seems so bizarre. I am writing a book about shock, about how countries are shocked by wars, terror attacks, coup d'etat, and natural disasters, and then how they are shocked again by corporations and politicians who exploit the fear and disorientation of this first shock to push through economic shock therapy, and then how people who dare to resist this shock politics are, if necessary, shocked for a third time by police, soldiers, and prison interrogators, I want to talk to you because you are, by my estimation, among the most shocked people alive, being one of the few living survivors of the CIA's covert experiments in electroshock and other special interrogation techniques. And by the way, I have reason to believe that the research that was done on you in the 1950s at McGill University is now being applied to prisoners in Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib. No, I definitely can't say that. So I say this instead. I recently traveled to Iraq, and I am trying to understand the role torture is playing there. We are told it's about getting information, but I think it's more than that. I think it may also have to do with trying to build a model country, about erasing people and then trying to remake them from scratch. There is a long pause, and then a different tone of voice to the reply, still strained, but is it relief? You have just spelled out exactly what the CIA and you and Cameron did to me. They tried to erase and remake me, but it didn't work. In less than 24 hours, I am knocking on the door of Gail Kastner's apartment in a grim Montreal old-age home. It's open, comes a barely audible voice. Gail had told me she would leave the door unlocked because standing up is difficult for her. It's the tiny fractures down her spine that grow more painful as arthritis sets in. Her back pain is just one reminder of the 63 times that 150 to 200 volts of electricity penetrated the frontal lobes of her brain, while her body convulsed violently on the table, causing fractures, sprains, bloody lips, broken teeth. Gail greets me from a plush blue recliner. It has 20 positions, I later learn, and she adjusts them continuously, like a photographer trying to find focus. It is in this chair that she spends her days and nights, searching for comfort, trying to avoid sleep, and what she calls my electric dreams. That's when she sees him, Dr. Ewan Cameron, the long-dead psychiatrist who administered those shocks, as well as other torments, so many years ago. I had two visits from the imminent monster last night, she announces as soon as I walk in. I don't want to make you feel bad, but it's because of your call coming out of the blue like that, asking all those questions. I become aware that my presence here is very possibly unfair. This feeling deepens when I scan the apartment 
and realize that there is no place for me. Every single surface is crowded with towers of papers and books, precariously stacked but clearly in some kind of order, the books all marked with yellowing flags. Gail motions me to the one clear surface in the room, a wooden chair that I had overlooked, but she goes into minor panic when I ask for a four-inch space for the recorder. The end table beside her chair is out of the question. It is home to about twenty empty boxes of cigarettes, matinee regular, stacked in a perfect pyramid. It looks as if Gail has colored the insides of the boxes black, but looking closer, I realize it is actually extremely dense, minuscule handwriting. Names. Numbers. Thousands of words. Over the course of the day we spend talking, Gail often leans over to write something on a scrap of paper or a cigarette box. A note to myself, she explains, or I will never remember. The thickets of paper and cigarette boxes are, for Gail, something more than an unconventional filing system. They are her memory. For her entire adult life, Gail's mind has failed her. Facts evaporate instantly. Memories, if they are there, and many aren't, are like snapshots scattered on the ground. Sometimes she will remember an incident perfectly, what she calls a memory shard. But when asked for a date, she will be as much as two decades off. And so she makes lists and keeps everything, proof that her life actually happened. At first she apologizes for the clutter, but later she says, He did this to me. This apartment is part of the torture. For many years, Gail was quite mystified by her lack of memory, as well as other idiosyncrasies. She did not know, for instance, why a small electrical shop from a garage door opener set off an uncontrollable panic attack, or why her hands shook when she plugged in her hairdryer. Most of all, she could not understand why she could remember most events from her adult life, but almost nothing from before she turned twenty. When she ran into someone who claimed to know her from childhood, she'd say, I know who you are, but I can't quite place you. I faked it. Gail figured it was all part of her shaky mental health. In her twenties and thirties, she had struggled with depression and addiction to pills, and would sometimes have such severe breakdowns that she would end up hospitalized and comatose. These episodes provoked her family to disown her, leaving her so alone and desperate that she survived by scavenging from the bins outside grocery stores. There had also been hints that something even more traumatic had happened early on. Before her family cut ties, Gail and her identical twin sister used to have arguments about a time when Gail had been much sicker and Zella had had to take care of her. You have no idea what I went through, Zella would say. You would urinate on the living room floor and suck your thumb and talk baby talk, and you would demand the bottle of my baby. But Gail had no memory of ever doing such strange things. In her late forties, Gail began a relationship with a man named Jacob, whom she describes as her soulmate. Jacob was a Holocaust survivor, and he was also preoccupied with questions of memory and loss. For Jacob, who died more than a decade ago, Gail's unaccountably missing years were intensely troubling. There has to be a reason, he would say about the gaps in her life. There has to be a reason. In 1992, Gail and Jacob happened to pass by a newsstand with a large sensational headline, Brainwashing Experiments, Victims to be Compensated. Kastner started skimming the article, and several phrases immediately leaped out. Baby talk, memory loss, incontinence. Sitting in a nearby coffee shop, the couple read an incredible story about how, in the 1950s, the United States Central Intelligence Agency had funded a Montreal doctor to perform bizarre experiments on his psychiatric patients, keeping them asleep and in isolation for weeks, then administering huge doses of electroshock, as well as experimental drug cocktails, including the psychedelic LSD and the hallucinogen PCP, commonly known as angel dust. The experiments, which reduced patients to pre-verbal infantile states, had been performed at McGill University's Allen Memorial Institute, under the supervision of its director, Dr. Ewan Cameron. The CIA's funding of Cameron had been revealed in the late 70s through a Freedom of Information Act request, sparking hearings in the U.S. Senate. Nine of Cameron's former patients got together 
and sued the CIA as well as the Canadian government, which had also funded Cameron's research. Over protracted trials, the patient's lawyers argued that the experiments had violated all standards of medical ethics. They had gone to Cameron seeking relief from minor psychiatric ailments, postpartum depression, anxiety, even for help to deal with marital difficulties, and had been used, without their knowledge or permission, as human guinea pigs to satisfy the CIA's thirst for information about how to control the human mind. In 1988, the CIA settled, awarding a total of $750,000 in damages to the nine plaintiffs, at the time the largest settlement ever against the agency. Four years later, the Canadian government would agree to pay $100,000 in compensation to each patient who was part of the experiments. Like the free market economists who are convinced that only a large-scale disaster, a great unmaking, can prepare the ground for their reforms, Cameron believed that by inflicting an array of shocks to the human brain, he could unmake and erase faulty minds, then rebuild new personalities on that ever-elusive clean slate. Gail had been dimly aware of a story involving the CIA and McGill over the years, but she hadn't paid attention. She had never had anything to do with the Allen Memorial Institute. But now, sitting with Jacob, she focused on what the ex-patients were saying about their lives, the memory loss, the regression. I realized then that these people must have gone through the same thing I went through. I said, Jacob, this has got to be the reason. In the Shock Shop Kastner wrote to the Allen and requested her medical file. At first, being told that they had no record of her, she finally got it, all 138 pages. The doctor who had admitted her was Ewan Cameron. The letters, notes, and charts in Gail's medical file tell a heartbreaking story, one as much about the limited choices available to an 18-year-old girl in the 50s as about governments and doctors abusing their power. The file begins with Dr. Cameron's assessment of Gail on her admittance. She is a McGill nursing student, excelling in her studies, whom Cameron describes as a hitherto reasonably well-balanced individual. She is, however, suffering from anxiety, caused, Cameron plainly notes, by her abusive father, an intensely disturbing man who made repeated psychological assaults on his daughter. In their early notes, the nurses seem to like Gail. She bonds with them about nursing, and they describe her as cheerful, sociable, and neat. But over the months she spent in and out of their care, Gail underwent a radical personality transformation, one that is meticulously documented in the file. After a few weeks, she showed childish behavior, expressed bizarre ideas, and apparently was hallucinated and destructive. The notes report that this intelligent young woman could now manage to count only to six. Next, she is manipulative, hostile, and very aggressive then passive and listless, unable to recognize her family members. Her final diagnosis is schizophrenic with marked hysterical features, far more serious than the anxiety she displayed when she arrived. The metamorphosis no doubt had something to do with the treatments that are also all listed in Kastner's chart. Huge doses of insulin, inducing multiple comas, strange combinations of uppers and downers, long periods when she was kept in a drug-induced sleep, and eight times as many electroshocks as was standard at the time. The Quest for Blankness After reading over her medical file several times, Gail Kastner turned herself into a kind of archaeologist of her own life, reading and studying everything that could potentially explain what happened to her at the hospital. She learned that Ewan Cameron, a Scottish-born American citizen, had reached the very pinnacle of his profession. He had been president of the American Psychiatric Association, president of the Canadian Psychiatric Association, and president of the World Psychiatric Association. In 1945, he was one of only three American psychiatrists asked to testify to the sanity of Rudolf Hess at the war crimes trials in Nuremberg. By the time Gale began her investigation, Cameron was long dead but he had left dozens of academic papers and published lectures behind. Several books had also been published about the CIA's funding of mind-control experiments, 
works that included plenty of detail about Cameron's relationship to the agency. Gail read them all, marking relevant passages, making timelines, and cross-referencing the dates with her own medical file. What she came to understand was that by the early 1950s, Cameron had rejected the standard Freudian approach of using talk therapy to try to uncover the root causes of his patients' mental illnesses. His ambition was not to mend or repair his patients, but to recreate them, using a method he invented called psychic driving. According to his published papers from the time, he believed that the only way to teach his patients healthy new behaviors was to get inside their minds and break up old pathological patterns. The first step was de-patterning, which had a stunning goal, to return the mind to a state when it was, as Aristotle claimed, a writing tablet on which as yet nothing actually stands written, a tabula rasa. Cameron believed he could reach that state by attacking the brain with everything known to interfere with its normal functioning, all at once. It was shock and awe warfare on the mind. By the late 1940s, electroshock was becoming increasingly popular among psychiatrists in Europe and North America. It caused less permanent damage than surgical lobotomy, and it seemed to help. Hysterical patients frequently calmed down, and in some cases, the jolt of electricity appeared to make the person more lucid. But these were only observations, and even the doctors who developed the technique could not provide a scientific explanation for how it worked. They were aware of its side effects, though. There was no question that ECT could result in amnesia. It was by far the most common complaint associated with the treatment. Closely related to memory loss, the other side effect widely reported was regression. In dozens of clinical studies, doctors noted that in the immediate aftermath of treatment, patients sucked their thumbs, curled up in the fetal position, needed to be spoon-fed, and cried for their mothers. These behaviors usually passed quickly, but in some cases, when large doses of shock were used, doctors reported that their patients had regressed completely, forgetting how to walk and talk. Like pro-war hawks who call for the bombing of countries back to the Stone Age, Cameron saw shock therapy as a means to blast his patients back into their infancy, to regress them completely. In a 1962 paper, he described the state to which he wanted to reduce patients like Gail Kastner. There is not only a loss of the space-time image, but loss of all feeling that it should be present. During this stage, the patient may show a variety of other phenomena, such as loss of a second language or all knowledge of his marital status. In more advanced forms, he may be unable to walk without support, to feed himself, and he may show double incontinence. All aspects of his memorial function are severely disturbed. To de-pattern his patients, Cameron used a relatively new device called the Page Russell, which administered up to six consecutive jolts instead of a single one. Frustrated that his patients still seemed to be clinging to remnants of their personalities, he further disoriented them with uppers, downers, and hallucinogens. Chlorpromazine, barbiturates, sodium amytal, nitrous oxide, disoxin. Once complete depatterning had been achieved and the earlier personality had been satisfactorily wiped out, the psychic driving could begin. It consisted of Cameron playing his patient's tape-recorded messages such as, You are a good mother and wife, and people enjoy your company. As a behaviorist, he believed that if he could get his patients to absorb the messages on the tape, they would start behaving differently. With patients shocked and drugged into an almost vegetative state, they could do nothing but listen to the messages. For 16 to 20 hours a day, for weeks. In one case, Cameron played a message continuously for 101 days. In the mid-50s, several researchers at the CIA became interested in Cameron's methods. It was the start of the Cold War hysteria, and the agency had just launched a covert program devoted to researching what it called Special Interrogation Techniques A declassified CIA memorandum explained that the program examined and investigated numerous unusual techniques of interrogation, including psychological harassment and such matters as total isolation, as well as the use of drugs and chemicals. First codenamed Project Bluebird, then Project Artichoke, it was finally renamed MK Ultra 
in 1953. Over the next decade, MK Ultra would spend $25 million on research in a quest to find new ways to break prisoners suspected of being communists and double agents. Eighty institutions were involved in the program, including 44 universities and 12 hospitals. The agents involved had no shortage of creative ideas for how to extract information from people who would rather not share it. The problem was finding ways to test those ideas. If word got out that the CIA was testing dangerous drugs on American soil, the entire program could be shut down, which is where the CIA's interest in Canadian researchers came in. The relationship dates back to June 1, 1951, and a tri-national meeting of intelligence agencies and academics at Montreal's Ritz-Carlton Hotel. The subject of the meeting was growing concern in the Western intelligence community that the communists had somehow discovered how to brainwash prisoners of war. The evidence was the fact that American GIs taken captive in Korea were going before cameras seemingly willingly and denouncing capitalism and imperialism. One of those at the Ritz meeting was Dr. Donald Hebb, director of psychology at McGill University. According to the declassified minutes, Hebb, trying to unlock the mystery of the GI confessions, speculated that the communists might be manipulating prisoners by placing them in intensive isolation and blocking input to their senses. The intelligence chiefs were impressed, and three months later Hebb had a research grant from Canada's Department of National Defense to conduct a series of classified sensory deprivation experiments. Hebb paid a group of 63 McGill students $20 a day to be isolated in a room wearing dark goggles, headphones playing white noise, and cardboard tubes covering their arms and hands so as to interfere with their sense of touch. For days, the students floated in a sea of nothingness, their eyes, ears, and hands unable to orient them, living inside their increasingly vivid imaginations. To see whether this deprivation made them more susceptible to brainwashing, Hebb then began playing recordings of voices talking about the existence of ghosts or the dishonesty of science, ideas the students had said they found objectionable before the experiment began. In a confidential report on Hebb's findings, the Defense Research Board concluded that sensory deprivation clearly caused extreme confusion as well as hallucinations among the student test subjects, and that a significant temporary lowering of intellectual efficiency occurred during and immediately after the period of perceptual deprivation. Furthermore, the students' hunger for stimulation made them surprisingly receptive to the ideas expressed on the tapes, and indeed several developed an interest in the occult that lasted weeks after the experiment had come to an end. It was as if the sensory deprivation partially erased their minds, and then the sensory stimuli rewrote their patterns. A copy of Hebb's major study was sent to the CIA, as well as 41 copies to the U.S. Navy and 42 copies to the U.S. Army. Hebb's report noted that four of the subjects remarked spontaneously that being in the apparatus was a form of torture, which meant that forcing them to stay past their threshold two or three days would clearly violate medical ethics. Aware of the limitations this placed on the experiment, Hebb wrote that more clear-cut results were not available because it is not possible to force subjects to spend 30 to 60 days in conditions of perceptual isolation. Not possible for Hebb, but it was perfectly possible for his McGill colleague and academic arch-rival, Dr. Ewan Cameron. In a suspension of academic niceties, Hebb would later describe Cameron as criminally stupid. Cameron had already convinced himself that violent destruction of the minds of his patients was the necessary first step on their journey to mental health and therefore not a violation of the Hippocratic Oath. As for consent, his patients were at his mercy. The standard consent form endowed Cameron with absolute power to treat, up to and including performing full frontal lobotomies. As the CIA dollars poured in, the Allen Memorial Institute seemed less like a hospital and more like a macabre prison. The first changes were the dramatically increased dosages of electroshock. Cameron started using the controversial Page Russell electroshock machine on his patients, twice a day for 30 days, a terrifying 360 individual shocks to each patient, far more than his earlier patients like Gale had received. 
To the already dizzying array of drugs he was giving his patients, he added more experimental, mind-altering ones that were of particular interest to the CIA, LSD, and PCP. He also added other weapons to his mind-blanking arsenal, sensory deprivation and extended sleep, a twin process he claimed would further reduce the defensiveness of the individual, making the patient more receptive to his taped messages. Cameron used the grant money to convert the basement into an isolation chamber. He soundproofed the room, piped in white noise, turned off the lights and put dark goggles and rubber eardrums on each patient, as well as cardboard tubing on the hands and arms, preventing him from touching his body, thus interfering with his self-image, as Cameron put it in a 1956 paper. But where Hebb students fled less intense sensory deprivation after only a couple of days, Cameron kept his patients in for weeks, with one of them trapped in the isolation box for 35 days. Cameron further starved his patients' senses in the so-called sleep room, where they were kept in drug-induced reverie for 20 to 22 hours a day, turned by nurses every two hours to prevent bed sores, and wakened only for meals and to go to the toilet. Patients were kept in this state for 15 to 30 days, though Cameron reported that some patients have been treated up to 65 days of continuous sleep. To make sure no one successfully escaped from this nightmare, Cameron gave one group of patients small doses of the drug curare, which induces paralysis, making them literal prisoners in their own bodies. In a 1960 paper, Cameron said there are two major factors that allow us to maintain a time and space image, that allow us, in other words, to know where we are and who we are. Those two forces are A, our continued sensory input, and B, our memory. With electroshock, Cameron annihilated memory. With his isolation boxes, he annihilated sensory input. He was determined to force his patients to completely lose their sense of where they were in time and space. Realizing that some patients were keeping track of time of day based on their meals, Cameron ordered the kitchen to mix it all up changing meal times and serving soup for breakfast and porridge for dinner. By varying these intervals and by changing the menu from the expected time, we were able to break up this structuring, Cameron reported with satisfaction. Even so, he discovered that despite his best efforts, one patient had maintained a connection with the outside world by noting the very faint rumble of a plane that flew over the hospital every morning at nine. To anyone familiar with the testimonies of torture survivors, this detail is a harrowing one. When prisoners are asked how they survived months or years of isolation and brutality, they often speak about hearing the ring of distant church bells, or the Muslim call to prayer, or children playing in a park nearby. When life is shrunk to the four walls of the prison cell, the rhythm of these outside sounds becomes a kind of lifeline, proof that the prisoner is still human that there is a world beyond torture. Cameron's work was funded by the CIA until 1961, and for many years it wasn't clear what, if anything, the U.S. government did with his research. In the late 70s and 80s, when proof of the CIA's funding for the experiments finally came out in Senate hearings, and then in the patient's groundbreaking class action lawsuit against the agency, journalists and legislators tended to accept the CIA's version of events that it was conducting research into brainwashing techniques in order to protect captured U.S. soldiers. Most of the press attention focused on the sensational detail that the government had been funding acid trips. In fact, a large part of the scandal when it finally broke was that the CIA and Ewan Cameron had recklessly shattered lives with their experiments for no good reason. The research appeared useless. Everyone knew by then that brainwashing was a Cold War myth, when John Gittinger, the CIA psychologist who first reached out to Cameron, was forced to testify before a joint Senate hearing, he called the support for Cameron a foolish mistake, a terrible mistake. The Science of Fear In 1988, the New York Times ran a groundbreaking investigation into U.S. involvement in torture and assassinations in Honduras. Florencio Caballero, an interrogator with Honduras's notoriously brutal Battalion 316, 
told the Times that he and 24 of his colleagues were taken to Texas and trained by the CIA. They taught us psychological methods to study the fears and weaknesses of a prisoner, make him stand up, don't let him sleep, keep him naked and isolated, put rats and cockroaches in his cell, give him bad food, serve him dead animals, throw cold water on him, change the temperature. There was one technique he failed to mention. Electroshock. Inez Murillo, a 24-year-old prisoner who was interrogated by Caballero and his colleagues, told the Times that she was electrocuted so many times that she screamed and fell down from the shock. The screams just escape you, she said. I smelled smoke and realized I was burning from the singes of the shocks. They said they would torture me until I went mad. I didn't believe them. But then they spread my legs and stuck the wires on my genitals. Murillo also said that there was someone else in the room, an American passing questions to her interrogators, whom the others called Mr. Mike. The revelations led to hearings of the Senate's Select Committee on Intelligence, where the CIA's Deputy Director, Richard Stoltz, confirmed that Caballero did indeed attend a CIA Human Resources Exploitation or Interrogation course. Finally, under threat of a lawsuit, and nine years after the original story was published, the CIA produced a handbook called Kubark Counterintelligence Interrogation. The title was in code. Kubark is, according to the New York Times, a cryptonym. Ku, a random diptych, and Bark, the agency's code word for itself at that time. The handbook is a 128-page secret manual on the interrogation of resistant sources that is heavily based on the research commissioned by MK Ultra. And you and Cameron's and Donald Hebb's experiments have left their marks all over it. Methods range from sensory deprivation to stress positions, from hooding to pain. The manual states on its first page that it is about to describe interrogation methods based on extensive research, including scientific inquiries conducted by specialists in closely related subjects. It represents a new age of precise, refined torture, not the gory, inexact torment that had been the standard since the Spanish Inquisition. In a kind of preface, the manual states, The intelligence service, which is able to bring pertinent modern knowledge to bear upon its problems, enjoys huge advantages over a service which conducts its clandestine business in 18th century fashion. It is no longer possible to discuss interrogation significantly without reference to the psychological research conducted in the past decade. What follows is a how-to guide on dismantling personalities. The manual includes a lengthy section on sensory deprivation that refers to a number of experiments at McGill University. It is the work of Cameron and his recipe for disturbing the time-space image that forms the core of the Kubark formula. The manual describes several of the techniques that were honed to depattern patients in the basement of the Allen Memorial Institute. The principle is that sessions should be so planned as to disrupt the source's sense of chronological order. Some interrogatees can be regressed by persistent manipulation of time, by retarding and advancing clocks, and serving meals at odd times, ten minutes or ten hours after the last food was given. Day and night are jumbled. What most captured the imagination of Kubark's authors more than any individual technique was Cameron's focus on regression. The idea that by depriving people of their sense of who they are and where they are in time and space, adults can be converted into dependent children whose minds are a blank slate of suggestibility. Wherever the Kubark method has been taught, certain clear patterns, all designed to induce, deepen, and sustain shock, have emerged. Prisoners are captured in the most jarring and disorienting way possible, late at night or in early morning raids, as the manual instructs. They are immediately hooded or blindfolded, stripped and beaten, then subjected to some form of sensory deprivation. And from Guatemala to Honduras, Vietnam to Iran, the Philippines to Chile, the use of electroshock is ubiquitous. In 1966, the CIA sent three psychiatrists to Saigon, armed with a Page Russell, the same kind of electroshock machine favored by Cameron. It was used so aggressively that it killed several prisoners. According to McCoy, in effect they were testing under field conditions 
whether you and Cameron's McGill depatterning techniques could actually alter human behavior. For U.S. intelligence officials, that kind of hands-on approach was rare. From the 70s on, the role favored by American agents was that of mentor or trainer, not direct interrogator. Testimony from Central American torture survivors in the 70s and 80s is littered with references to mysterious English-speaking men walking in and out of cells proposing questions or offering tips. Though sanctioned by successive administrations in Washington, the U.S. role in these dirty wars had to be covert, for obvious reasons. Torture, whether physical or psychological, clearly violates the Geneva Convention's blanket ban on any form of torture or cruelty, as well as the U.S. Army's own Uniform Code of Military Justice barring cruelty and oppression of prisoners. Simply put, what they were teaching was illegal, covert by its very nature. If anyone asked, U.S. agents were tutoring their developing world students in modern professional policing methods. They couldn't be responsible for excesses that happened outside their classes. On September 11, 2001, that long-time insistence on plausible deniability went out the window. The terrorist attack on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon was a different kind of shock from the ones imagined in the pages of the Kubark Manual, but its effects were remarkably similar. Profound disorientation, extreme fear and anxiety, and collective regression. Like the Kubark interrogator posing as a father figure, the Bush administration promptly used that fear to play the role of the all-protective parent, ready to defend the homeland and its vulnerable people by any means necessary. The shift in U.S. policy encapsulated by Vice President Dick Cheney's infamous statement about working the dark side meant that what had previously been performed by proxy with enough distance to deny knowledge would now be performed directly and openly defended. Despite all the talk of outsourced torture, the Bush administration's real innovation has been its insourcing, with prisoners being tortured by U.S. citizens in U.S.-run prisons or directly transported through extraordinary rendition to third countries on U.S. planes. That is what makes the Bush regime different. After the attacks of September 11th, it dared to demand the right to torture without shame. That left the administration subject to criminal prosecution, a problem it dealt with by changing the laws. The chain of events is well known. Then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, empowered by George W. Bush, decreed that prisoners captured in Afghanistan were not covered by the Geneva Conventions because they were enemy combatants, not POWs, a view confirmed by the White House legal counsel at the time, Alberto Gonzalez, subsequently U.S. Attorney General. Next, Rumsfeld approved a series of special interrogation practices for use in the War on Terror. These included the methods laid out in the CIA manuals. Use of isolation facility for up to 30 days, deprivation of light and auditory stimuli. The detainee may also have a hood placed over his head during transportation and questioning. Removal of clothing and using detainees' individual phobias, such as fear of dogs, to induce stress. According to the White House, torture was still banned. But now, to qualify as torture, the pain inflicted had to be equivalent in intensity to the pain accompanying serious physical injury, such as organ failure. According to these new rules, the U.S. government was free to use the methods it had developed in the 1950s under layers of secrecy and deniability. Only now, it was out in the open, without fear of prosecution. The Failure to Reconstruct Ewan Cameron's theories were based on the idea that shocking his patients into a chaotic regressed state would create the preconditions for him to rebirth healthy model citizens. It's little comfort to Gail Kastner with her fractured spine and shattered memories, but in his own writings Cameron envisioned his acts of destruction as creation, a gift to his fortunate patients who were, under his relentless repatterning, going to be born again. On this front, Cameron was a spectacular failure. No matter how fully he regressed his patients, they never absorbed or accepted the endlessly repeated messages on his tapes. Though he was a genius at destroying people, he could not remake them. 
A follow-up study conducted after Cameron left the Allen Memorial Institute found that 75% of his former patients were worse off after treatment than before they were admitted. Of his patients who held down full-time jobs before hospitalization, more than half were no longer able to, and many, like Gail, suffered from a host of new physical and psychological ailments. Psychic driving did not work, not even a little, and the Allen Memorial Institute eventually banned the practice. Cameron was sure that if he blasted away at the habits, patterns, and memories of his patients, he would eventually arrive at that pristine blank slate. But no matter how doggedly he shocked, drugged, and disoriented, he never got there. The opposite proved true. The more he blasted, the more shattered his patients became. Their minds weren't clean. Rather, they were a mess. Their memories fractured, their trust betrayed. Disaster capitalists share this same inability to distinguish between destruction and creation, between hurting and healing. It's a feeling I had frequently when I was in Iraq, nervously scanning the scarred landscape for the next explosion. Fervent believers in the redemptive powers of shock, the architects of the American-British invasion, imagined that their use of force would be so stunning, so overwhelming, that Iraqis would go into a kind of suspended animation much like the one described in the Kubark Manual. In that window of opportunity, Iraq's invaders would slip in another set of shocks. These ones, economic, which would create a model free market democracy on the blank slate that was post-invasion Iraq. But there was no blank slate. Only rubble and shattered, angry people who, when they resisted, were blasted with more shocks some of them based on those experiments performed on Gail Kastner all those years ago. We're really good at going out and breaking things, but the day I get to spend more time here working on construction rather than combat, that will be a very good day. General Peter W. Chiarelli, commander of the U.S. Army's 1st Cavalry Division, observed a year and a half after the official end of the war. That day never came. Like Cameron, Iraq shock doctors can destroy but they can't seem to rebuild. The Other Doctor Shock Milton Friedman and the Search for a Laissez-Faire Laboratory There are few academic environments as heavily mythologized as the University of Chicago's Economics Department in the 1950s, a place intensely conscious of itself not just as a school, but as a school of thought. It was not just training students— it was building and strengthening the Chicago School of Economics, the brainchild of a coterie of conservative academics whose ideas represented a revolutionary bulwark against the dominant status thinking of the day. Like you and Cameron's psychiatric department at McGill in the same period, the University of Chicago's economics department was in the thrall of an ambitious and charismatic man on a mission to fundamentally revolutionize his profession. That man was Milton Friedman. Friedman's mission, like Cameron's, rested on a dream of reaching back to a state of natural health, when all was in balance, before human interferences created distorting patterns. Where Cameron dreamed of returning the human mind to that pristine state, Friedman dreamed of depatterning societies, of returning them to a state of pure capitalism, cleansed of all interruptions, government regulations, trade barriers, and entrenched interests. Also like Cameron, Friedman believed that when the economy is highly distorted, the only way to reach that pre-lapsarian state was to deliberately inflict painful shocks. Only bitter medicine could clear those distortions and bad patterns out of the way. Frank Knight, one of the founders of Chicago School Economics, thought professors should inculcate in their students the belief that each economic theory is a sacred feature of the system, not a debatable hypothesis. The core of such sacred Chicago teachings was that the economic forces of supply, demand, inflation, and unemployment were, like the forces of nature, fixed and unchanging. In the truly free market imagined in Chicago classes and texts, these forces existed in perfect equilibrium, supply communicating with demand the way the moon pulls the tides. According to the Harvard sociologist Daniel Bell, this love of an idealized system is the defining quality of radical free market economics. Capitalism is envisaged as 
a jeweled set of movements, or a celestial clockwork. The challenge for Friedman and his colleagues was how to prove that a real-world market could live up to their rapturous imaginings. Friedman always prided himself on approaching economics as a science as hard and rigorous as physics or chemistry. But hard scientists could point to the behavior of the elements to prove their theories. Friedman could not point to any living economy that proved that if all distortions were stripped away, what would be left would be a society in perfect health and bounteous, since no country in the world met the criteria for perfect laissez-faire. Unable to test their theories in central banks and ministries of trade, Friedman and his colleagues had to settle for elaborate and ingenious mathematical equations and computer models mapped out in the basement workshops of the Social Sciences Building. Like all fundamentalist faiths, Chicago School Economics is, for its true believers, a closed loop. The starting premise is that the free market is a perfect scientific system, one in which individuals acting on their own self-interested desires create the maximum benefits for all. It follows ineluctably that if something is wrong within a free market economy, high inflation or soaring unemployment, it has to be because the market is not truly free. There must be some interference, some distortion in the system. The Chicago solution is always the same a stricter and more complete application of the fundamentals. This knack for thinking highly profitable thoughts appears to have its roots in Friedman's early childhood, when his parents, immigrants from Hungary, bought a garment factory in Rahway, New Jersey. The family apartment was in the same building as the shop floor, which, Friedman wrote, would be termed a sweatshop today. Those were volatile times for sweatshop owners with Marxists and anarchists organizing immigrant workers into unions to demand safety regulations and weekends off, and debating the theory of worker ownership at after-shift meetings. As the boss's son, Friedman no doubt heard a very different perspective on these debates. In the end, his father's factory went under, but in lectures and television appearances, Friedman spoke of it often, invoking it as a case study for the benefits of deregulated capitalism proof that even the worst, least regulated jobs offer the first rung on the ladder to freedom and prosperity. A large part of the appeal of Chicago school economics was that at a time when radical left ideas about workers' power were gaining ground around the world, it provided a way to defend the interests of owners that was just as radical and was infused with its own idealism. Where leftists promised freedom for workers from bosses, citizens from dictatorship, countries from colonialism, Friedman promised individual freedom, a project that elevated atomized citizens above any collective enterprise and liberated them to express their absolute free will through their consumer choices. The question, as always, was how to get to that wondrous place from here. The Marxists were clear. Revolution. Get rid of the current system, replace it with socialism. For the Chicagoans, the answer was not as straightforward. The United States was already a capitalist country, but as far as they were concerned, just barely. In the U.S., and in all supposedly capitalist economies, the Chicagoans saw interferences everywhere. To make products more affordable, politicians fixed prices. To make workers less exploited, they set minimum wages. To make sure everyone had access to education, they kept it in the hands of the state. These measures often seemed to help people, but Friedman and his colleagues were convinced, and they proved it with their models, that they were actually doing untold harm to the equilibrium of the market and the ability of its various forces to communicate with each other. The mission of the Chicago School was thus one of purification, stripping the market of these encumbrances so that the laws of laissez-faire could kick in. Much of this purism came from Friedrich Hayek, Friedman's own personal guru, who also taught at the University of Chicago for a stretch in the 1950s. The austere Austrian warned that any government involvement in the economy would lead society down the road to serfdom and had to be expunged. According to Arnold Harberger, a longtime professor at Chicago, the Austrians, as this clique within a clique was called, were so zealous that any state interference was not just wrong, but evil. Though always cloaked in the language of math and science, Friedman's vision coincided precisely with the interests of large multinationals, 
which by nature hunger for vast, new, unregulated markets. In the first stage of capitalist expansion, that kind of ravenous growth was provided by colonialism, by discovering new territories and grabbing land without paying for it, then extracting riches from the earth without compensating local populations. Friedman's war on the welfare state and big government held out the promise of a new font of rapid riches. Only this time, rather than conquering new territory, the state itself would be the new frontier. Its public services and assets auctioned off for far less than they were worth. The War Against Developmentalism When Eisenhower took office in 1953, Iran had a developmentalist leader in Mohammad Mossadegh, who had already nationalized the oil company, and Indonesia was in the hands of the increasingly ambitious Ahmed Sukarno, who was talking about linking up all the nationalist governments of the Third World into a superpower on par with the West and the Soviet bloc. Of particular concern to the State Department was the growing success of nationalist economics in the southern cone of Latin America. At a time when large portions of the globe were turning to Stalinism and Maoism, developmentalist proposals for import substitution were actually quite centrist. Still, the idea that Latin America deserved its own New Deal had powerful enemies. The continent's feudal landowners had been happy with the old status quo, which supplied them with steep profits and a limitless pool of poor peasants to work in the fields and mines. Now they were outraged to see their profits being diverted to build up other sectors, their workers demanding land redistribution, and the government keeping the price of their crops artificially low so food could be affordable. American and European corporations doing business in Latin America began to express similar complaints to their governments. Their products were being blocked at the borders, their workers were demanding higher wages, and, most alarmingly, there was growing talk that everything from foreign-owned mines to banks could be nationalized to finance Latin America's dream of economic independence. Under pressure from these corporate interests, a movement took hold in American and British foreign policy circles that attempted to pull developmentalist governments into the binary logic of the Cold War. Don't be fooled by the moderate democratic veneer, these hawks warned. Third world nationalism was the first step on the road to totalitarian communism and should be nipped in the bud. Two of the chief proponents of this theory were John Foster Dulles, Eisenhower's Secretary of State, and his brother Alan Dulles, head of the newly created CIA. The results of the Dulles's ascendancy were immediate. In 1953 and 1954, the CIA staged its first two coup d'etat, both against third world governments, that identified far more with Keynes than with Stalin. The first was in 1953, when a CIA plot successfully overthrew Mossadegh in Iran, replacing him with the brutal Shah. The next was the 1954 CIA-sponsored coup in Guatemala, done at the direct behest of the United Fruit Company. The corporation was indignant that President Jacobo Arbenz Guzman had expropriated some of its unused land with full compensation as part of his project to transform Guatemala, as he put it, from a backward country with a predominantly feudal economy into a modern capitalist state. Soon enough, Arbenz was out and United Fruit was back in charge. Eradicating developmentalism in the southern cone, where it had taken far deeper root, was a much greater challenge. Figuring out how to achieve that goal was the topic of discussion between two American men as they met in Santiago, Chile, in 1953. One was Albion Patterson, director of the U.S. International Cooperation Administration in Chile, the agency that would later become USAID, and the other was Theodore W. Schultz, chairman of the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. Patterson had become increasingly concerned about the maddening influence of Raoul Prebisch and Latin America's other pink economists. What we need to do is change the formation of the men to influence the education, which is very bad, he had stressed to a colleague. This objective coincided with Schultz's own belief that the U.S. government wasn't doing enough to fight the intellectual war with Marxism. The two men came up with a plan that would eventually turn Santiago, a hotbed of state-centered economics, into its opposite, a laboratory for cutting-edge free-market experiments 
giving Milton Friedman what he had longed for, a country in which to test his cherished theories. The original plan was simple. The U.S. government would pay to send Chilean students to study economics at what pretty much everyone recognized was the most rapidly anti-pink school in the world, the University of Chicago. Schultz and his colleagues at the university would also be paid to travel to Santiago to conduct research into the Chilean economy and to train students and professors in Chicago school fundamentals. What set the plan idea apart from other U.S. training programs that sponsored Latin American students, of which there were many, was its unabashedly ideological character. By selecting Chicago to train Chilean students, a school where the professors agitated for the near-complete dismantling of government with single-minded focus, the U.S. State Department was firing a shot across the bow in its war against developmentalism, effectively telling Chileans that the U.S. government had decided what ideas their elite students should and should not learn. This was such blatant U.S. intervention in Latin American affairs that when Albion Patterson approached the dean of the University of Chile, the country's premier university, and offered him a grant to set up the exchange program, the dean turned him down. Patterson went on to approach the dean of a lesser institution, Chile's Catholic University, a much more conservative school with no economics department. The dean at the Catholic University jumped at the offer, and what became known in Washington and Chicago as the Chile Project was born. Officially launched in 1956, the project saw 100 Chilean students pursue advanced degrees at the University of Chicago between 1957 and 1970. Their tuition and expenses paid for by U.S. taxpayers and U.S. foundations. In 1965, the program was expanded to include students from across Latin America, with particularly heavy participation from Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. The expansion was funded through a grant from the Ford Foundation and led to the creation of the Center for Latin American Economic Studies at the University of Chicago. Under the program, there were 40 to 50 Latin Americans studying graduate-level economics at any given time, roughly one-third of the department's total student population. In comparable programs at Harvard or MIT, there were just four or five Latin Americans. It was a startling achievement. In just a decade, the ultra-conservative University of Chicago had become the premier destination for Latin Americans wanting to study economics abroad a fact that would shape the course of the region's history for decades to come. When the first group of Chileans returned home from Chicago, they were even more Friedmanite than Friedman himself, in the words of Mario Zanyartu, an economist at Santiago's Catholic University. Many took up posts as economics professors in the Catholic University Economics Department, rapidly turning it into their own little Chicago school in the middle of Santiago. The same curriculum, the same English language texts, the same unyielding claim to pure and scientific knowledge. By 1963, 12 of the department's 13 full-time faculty members were graduates of the University of Chicago program, and Sergio de Castro, one of the first graduates, was appointed faculty chairman. Now Chilean students didn't need to travel all the way to the U.S. Hundreds could get a Chicago school education without leaving home. The students who went through the program, whether in Chicago or its franchise operation in Santiago, became known throughout the region as Los Chicago Boys. With more funding from U.S. aid, Chile's Chicago Boys became enthusiastic regional ambassadors for neoliberalism, traveling to Argentina and Colombia to set up more University of Chicago franchises in order to expand this knowledge throughout Latin America confronting the ideological positions which prevented freedom and perpetuated poverty and backwardness, according to one Chilean graduate. Juan Gabriel Valdez, Chile's foreign minister in the 1990s, described the process of training hundreds of Chilean economists in Chicago school orthodoxy as a striking example of an organized transfer of ideology from the United States to a country within its direct sphere of influence. The education of these Chileans derived from a specific project designed in the 1950s to influence the development of Chilean economic thinking. As a form of intellectual imperialism, it was certainly unabashed. There was, however, a problem. It wasn't working. According to a 1957 report from the University of Chicago to its funders at the State Department, 
the central purpose of the project was to train a generation of students who would become the intellectual leaders in economic affairs in Chile. The Chicago boys weren't leading their countries anywhere. In fact, they were being left behind. In the early 60s, the main economic debate in the Southern Cone was not about laissez-faire capitalism versus developmentalism, but about how best to take developmentalism to the next stage. At the polls and on the streets, the southern cone was surging to the left. It was in Chile, the epicenter of the Chicago experiment, that defeat in the battle of ideas was most evident. By Chile's historic 1970 elections, the country had moved so far left that all three major political parties were in favor of nationalizing the country's largest source of revenue, the copper mines then controlled by U.S. mining giants. The Chile project, in other words, was an expensive bust. As ideological warriors waging a peaceful battle of ideas with their left-wing foes, the Chicago boys had failed in their mission. Not only was the economic debate continuing to shift leftward, but the Chicago boys were so marginal that they did not even register on the Chilean electoral spectrum. It might have ended there, with the Chile project just a minor historical footnote. But something happened to rescue the Chicago boys from obscurity. Richard Nixon was elected president of the United States. Nixon had an imaginative and on the whole effective foreign policy, Friedman enthused, and nowhere was it more imaginative than in Chile. It was Nixon who would give the Chicago boys and their professors something they had long dreamed of, a chance to prove that their capitalist utopia was more than a theory in a basement workshop, a shot at remaking a country from scratch. Democracy had been inhospitable to the Chicago boys in Chile. Dictatorship would prove an easier fit. Salvador Allende's popular unity government won Chile's 1970 elections on a platform promising to put into government hands large sectors of the economy that were being run by foreign and local corporations. Allende was a new breed of Latin American revolutionary. Like Che Guevara, he was a doctor. But unlike Che, he looked the part of the Tweedy academic, not the romantic guerrilla. He could deliver a stump speech as fiery as any by Fidel Castro, but he was a fierce Democrat who believed that socialist change in Chile needed to come through the ballot box, not the barrel of a gun. When Nixon heard that Allende had been elected president, he famously ordered the CIA director Richard Helms to make the economy scream. Although Allende pledged to negotiate fair terms to compensate companies that were losing property and investments, U.S. multinationals feared that Allende represented the beginning of a Latin America-wide trend, and many were unwilling to accept the prospect of losing what was a growing portion of their bottom line. By 1968, 20% of total U.S. foreign investment was tied up in Latin America, and U.S. firms had 5,436 subsidiaries in the region. The profits that these investments were able to produce were staggering. Mining companies had invested $1 billion over the previous 50 years in Chile's copper mining industry, the largest in the world. But they had sent $7.2 billion home. As soon as Allende won the vote, and before he was even inaugurated, corporate America declared war on his administration. The center of activity was the Washington-based Ad Hoc Committee on Chile, a group that included the major U.S. mining companies with holdings in Chile, as well as the de facto leader of the group, the International Telephone and Telegraph Company, ITT, which owns 70% of Chile's soon-to-be nationalized phone company. Purina, Bank of America, and Pfizer Chemical also sent delegates at various stages. The committee's single purpose was to force Allende to back off his nationalizations by confronting him with economic collapse. They had many ideas for how to make Allende feel the pain. According to declassified meeting minutes, they planned to block U.S. loans to Chile and quietly have large U.S. private banks do the same, confer with foreign banking sources with the same thing in mind, delay buying from Chile over the next six months, use U.S. copper stockpile instead of buying from Chile, bring about a scarcity of U.S. dollars in Chile, and the list goes on. Allende appointed his close friend Orlando Letelier to be his ambassador to Washington. 
That gave him the task of negotiating the terms of expropriation with the same corporations plotting to sabotage the Allende government. Letelier, a fun-loving extrovert with a quintessential 70s mustache and a devastating singing voice, was much beloved in diplomatic circles. But even with all Letelier's charm and skill, the negotiations never stood a chance of success. In March 1972, in the midst of Letelier's tense negotiation with ITT, Jack Anderson, a syndicated newspaper columnist, published an explosive series of articles based on documents that showed that the telephone company had secretly plotted with the CIA and the State Department to block Allende from being inaugurated two years earlier. In the face of these allegations, and with Allende still in power, the U.S. Senate, controlled by Democrats, launched an investigation and uncovered a far-reaching conspiracy in which ITT had offered $1 million in bribes to Chilean opposition forces and sought to engage the CIA in a plan covertly to manipulate the outcome of the Chilean presidential election. The Senate report, released in June 1973, also found that when the plan failed and Allende took power, ITT moved to a new strategy designed to ensure that he would not make it through the next six months. Most alarming to the Senate was the relationship between ITT executives and the U.S. government. In testimony and documents, it became clear that ITT was directly involved in shaping U.S. policy toward Chile at the highest level. The company also took the liberty of preparing an 18-point strategy for the Nixon administration that contained a clear call for a military coup. Get to reliable sources within the Chilean military, it stated. Build up their planned discontent against Allende, thus bring about necessity of his removal. Yet despite years of relentless American dirty tricks, of which ITT was only the most scrutinized example, in 1973, Allende was still in power. Eight million dollars in covert spending had failed to weaken his base. In midterm parliamentary elections that year, Allende's party actually gained support beyond the number that had first elected it in 1970. Clearly, the desire for a different economic model had taken deep root in Chile, and support for a socialist alternative was growing. For Allende's opponents, who had been plotting his overthrow since the day the 1970 election results came in, that meant their problems would not be solved by simply getting rid of him. Someone else would just come along and replace him. A more radical plan was needed. Shortly after Allende was elected, the Catholic University, home of the Chicago Boys, became ground zero for the creation of what the CIA called a coup climate. Many students joined the fascist Patria e Libertad, and Goose stepped through the streets in open imitation of Hitler Youth. In September 1971, a year into Allende's mandate, the top business leaders in Chile held an emergency meeting in the seaside city of Viña del Mar to develop a coherent regime change strategy. According to Orlando Sanz, president of the National Association of Manufacturers, generously funded by the CIA, and many of the same foreign multinationals doing their own plotting in Washington, the gathering decided that Allende's government was incompatible with freedom in Chile and with the existence of private enterprise, and that the only way to avoid the end was to overthrow the government. The businessmen formed a war structure, one part of which would liaise with the military, another, according to Sanz, would prepare specific alternative programs to government programs that would systematically be passed on to the armed forces. Sons recruited several key Chicago boys to design those alternative programs and set them up in a new office near the presidential palace in Santiago. The group began holding weekly secret meetings during which they developed detailed proposals for how to radically remake their country along neoliberal lines. According to the subsequent U.S. Senate investigation, over 75% of the funding for this opposition research organization was coming directly from the CIA. For a time, the coup planning proceeded on two distinct tracks. The military plotted the extermination of Allende and his supporters, while the economists plotted the extermination of their ideas. As momentum built for a violent solution, a dialogue was opened between the two camps, with Roberto Kelly, a businessman associated with the CIA-financed newspaper El Mercurio, acting as the go-between. 
Through Kelly, the Chicago boys sent a five-page summary of their economic program to the Navy admiral in charge. The Navy gave the nod, and from then on, the Chicago boys worked frantically to have their program ready by the time of the coup. This 500-page document, an economic program that would guide the junta from its earliest days, came to be known in Chile as the BRIC. According to a later U.S. Senate committee, CIA collaborators were involved in preparing an initial overall economic plan which has served as the basis for the junta's most important economic decisions. Eight of the ten principal authors of the BRIC had studied economics at the University of Chicago. Although the overthrow of Allende was universally described as a military coup, Orlando Letelier, Allende's Washington ambassador, saw it as an equal partnership between the army and the economists. The Chicago boys, as they are known in Chile, Letelier wrote, convinced the generals that they were prepared to supplement the brutality which the military possessed with the intellectual assets it lacked. Chile's coup, when it finally came, would feature three distinct forms of shock, a recipe that would be duplicated in neighboring countries and would reemerge three decades later in Iraq. The shock of the coup itself was immediately followed by two additional forms of shock. One was Milton Friedman's capitalist shock treatment, a technique in which hundreds of Latin American economists had by now been trained at the University of Chicago and its various franchise institutions. The other was Ewan Cameron's shock, drug and sensory deprivation research, now codified as torture techniques in the Kubark Manual and disseminated through extensive CIA training programs for Latin American police and military. These three forms of shock converged on the bodies of Latin Americans and the body politic of the region, creating an unstoppable hurricane of mutually reinforcing destruction and reconstruction, erasure, and creation. Out of this live laboratory emerged the first neoliberal state and the first victory in its global counter-revolution. States of Shock The Bloody Birth of the Counter-Revolution General Augusto Pinochet and his supporters consistently referred to the events of September 11, 1973 not as a coup d'etat, but as a war. Santiago certainly looked like a war zone. Tanks fired as they rolled down the boulevards, and government buildings were under air assault by fighter jets. But there was something strange about this war. It had only one side. From the start, Pinochet had complete control of the army, navy, marines, and police. Meanwhile, President Salvador Allende had refused to organize his supporters into armed defense leagues, so he had no army of his own. The only resistance came from the presidential palace, La Moneda, and the rooftops around it, where Allende and his inner circle made a valiant effort to defend the seat of democracy. It was hardly a fair fight. Though there were just 36 Allende supporters inside, the military launched 24 rockets into the palace. Pinochet, the operation's vain and volatile commander, built like one of the tanks he rode in on, clearly wanted the event to be as dramatic and traumatic as possible. Even if the coup was not a war, it was designed to feel like one, a Chilean precursor to shock and awe. It could scarcely have been more shocking. Unlike neighboring Argentina, which had been ruled by six military governments in the previous four decades, Chile had no experience with this kind of violence. It had enjoyed 160 years of peaceful democratic rule, the past 41 uninterrupted. Now the presidential palace was in flames. The president's shrouded body was being carried out on a stretcher, and his closest colleagues were lying face down in the street at rifle point. A few minutes' drive from the presidential palace, Orlando Letelier, recently returned from Washington to take up a new post as Chile's defense minister, had gone to his office that morning in the ministry. As soon as he walked through the front door, he was ambushed by twelve soldiers in combat uniform, all pointing their submachine guns at him. With Allende dead, his cabinet in captivity, and no mass resistance in evidence, the junta's grand battle was over by mid-afternoon. Letelier and the other VIP prisoners were eventually taken to freezing Dawson Island in the southern Strait of Magellan, Pinochet's approximation of a Siberian work camp. 
Killing and locking up the government was not enough for Chile's new junta government, however. The generals were sure that their hold on power depended on Chileans being truly terrified. In the days that followed, roughly 13,500 civilians were arrested, loaded onto trucks, and imprisoned, according to a declassified CIA report. Thousands ended up in the two main football stadiums in Santiago, the Chile Stadium and the huge National Stadium. Inside the National Stadium, deaths replaced football as the public spectacle. Soldiers prowled the bleachers with hooded collaborators who pointed out subversives. The ones who were selected were hauled off to locker rooms and sky boxes transformed into makeshift torture chambers. Hundreds were executed. Lifeless bodies started showing up on the side of major highways or floating in murky urban canals. To make sure that the terror extended beyond the capital city, roving death squads singled out the highest-profile prisoners, as many as 26 at a time, and executed them. The entire country had gotten the message. Resistance is deadly. The Economic Front on the day of the coup, several Chicago boys were camped out at the printing presses of the right-wing El Mercurio newspaper. As shots were being fired in the streets outside, they frantically tried to get the document printed in time for the junta's first day on the job. Before midday the next day, the general officers of the armed forces who perform government duties had the plan on their desks. The proposals in the final document bore a striking resemblance to those found in Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom. Privatization, deregulation, and cuts to social spending. The free market trinity. To us it was a revolution, said Christiane Larulay, one of Pinochet's economic aides. It was a fair description. September 11, 1973, was far more than the violent end of Allende's peaceful socialist revolution. It was the beginning of what The Economist would later describe as a counter-revolution. The first concrete victory in the Chicago school campaign to seize back the gains that had been won under developmentalism and Keynesianism. In the coming years, the same policies laid out in The Brick would be imposed in dozens of other countries under cover of a wide range of crises. Jose Piñera, an alumnus of the economics department at the Catholic University, and a self-described Chicago boy, was doing graduate work at Harvard at the time of the coup. On hearing the good news, he returned home to help found a new country dedicated to liberty from the ashes of the old one. According to Piñera, who would eventually become Pinochet's Minister of Labor and Mining, this was the real revolution, a radical, comprehensive, and sustained move toward free markets. Augusto Pinochet took to power with unseemly relish adopting the airs of a monarch and claiming that destiny had given him the job. In short order, he staged a coup within a coup to unseat the other three military leaders with whom he had agreed to share power and named himself Supreme Chief of the Nation, as well as President. He basked in pomp and ceremony, proof of his right to rule, never missing an opportunity to put on his Prussian dress uniform, complete with cape. To get around Santiago, he chose a caravan of gold, bulletproof Mercedes Benzes. Pinochet had a knack for authoritarian rule, but he knew next to nothing about economics. That was a problem, because the campaign of corporate sabotage spearheaded by ITT had done an effective job of sending the economy into a tailspin, and Pinochet had a full-fledged crisis on his hands. From the start, there was a power struggle within the junta between those who simply wanted to reinstate the pre-Allende status quo and return quickly to democracy, and the Chicago boys, who were pushing for a head-to-toe free market makeover that would take years to impose. It was the Chicago boys' vision of a total country overhaul that appealed to Pinochet's newly unleashed ambition, and he immediately named several Chicago grads as senior economic advisors. He called them the technos, the technicians, which appealed to the Chicago pretension that fixing an economy was a matter of science, not of subjective human choices. For the first year and a half, Pinochet faithfully followed the Chicago rules. He privatized some, though not all, state-owned companies, including several banks. He allowed cutting-edge new forms of speculative finance. He flung open the borders to foreign imports, 
tearing down the barriers that had long protected Chilean manufacturers, and he cut government spending by 10%, except the military, which received a significant increase. He also eliminated price controls, a radical move in a country that had been regulating the cost of necessities such as bread and cooking oil for decades. The Chicago boys had confidently assured Pinochet that if he suddenly withdrew government involvement from these areas all at once, the natural laws of economics would rediscover their equilibrium, and inflation, which they viewed as a kind of economic fever indicating the presence of unhealthy organisms in the market, would magically go down. They were mistaken. In 1974, inflation reached 375%, the highest rate in the world and almost twice the top level under Allende. The cost of basics such as bread went through the roof. At the same time, Chileans were being thrown out of work because Pinochet's experiment with free trade was flooding the country with cheap imports. Local businesses were closing in droves, unable to compete. Unemployment hit record levels and hunger became rampant. The Chicago school's first laboratory was in freefall. Sergio de Castro and the other Chicago boys argued that the problem didn't lie with their theory, but with the fact that it wasn't being applied with sufficient strictness. The economy had failed to correct itself because there were still distortions left over from nearly half a century of government interference. Pinochet had to strip these distortions away. More cuts, more privatization, more speed. In that year and a half, many of the country's business elite had had their fill of the Chicago boys' adventures in extreme capitalism. The only people benefiting were foreign companies and a small clique of financiers known as the Piranhas, who were making a killing on speculation. The nuts and bolts manufacturers who had strongly supported the coup were getting wiped out. Orlando Sands, the president of the National Association of Manufacturers, who had brought the Chicago boys into the coup plot in the first place, declared the results of the experiment one of the greatest failures of our economic history. The manufacturers hadn't wanted Allende socialism, but had liked a managed economy just fine. Their agenda now in grave danger, the Chicago boys and the piranhas decided it was time to call in the big guns. In March 1975, Milton Friedman and Arnold Harberger flew to Santiago at the invitation of a major bank to help save the experiment. Greeted by the junta-controlled press as something of a rock star, the guru of the new order, Friedman hammered at a single theme. The junta was off to a good start, but it needed to embrace the free market with greater abandon. In speeches and interviews, he used a term that had never before been publicly applied to a real-world economic crisis. He called for shock treatment. He said it was the only medicine. Absolutely. There is no other. There is no other long-term solution. When a Chilean reporter pointed out that even Richard Nixon, then president of the U.S., imposed controls to temper the free market, Friedman snapped, I don't approve of them. I believe we should not apply them. I am against economic intervention by the government in my own country as well as in Chile. After a private meeting with Pinochet, Friedman made some personal notes about the encounter, which he reproduced decades later in his memoirs. He observed that the general was sympathetically attracted to the idea of a shock treatment, but was clearly distressed at the possible temporary unemployment that might be caused. At this point, Pinochet was already notorious the world over for ordering massacres in football stadiums. That the dictator was distressed by the human cost of shock therapy might have given Friedman pause. But Friedman assured the general that if he followed his advice to cut government spending even further, Pinochet would be able to take credit for an economic miracle. He could end inflation in months, while the unemployment problem would be equally brief and that subsequent recovery would be rapid. Immediately after Friedman's visit, Pinochet fired his economic minister and handed the job to Sergio de Castro, whom he later promoted to finance minister. De Castro stacked the government with his fellow Chicago boys, appointing one of them to head the central bank. Orlando Sands, who had objected to the mass layoffs and plant closures, was replaced as head of the Association of Manufacturers by someone with a more shock-friendly attitude. Freed of the naysayers, Pinochet and de Castro got to work stripping away the welfare state 
to arrive at their pure capitalist utopia. In 1975, they cut public spending by 27% in one blow. And they kept cutting until by 1980, it was half of what it had been under Allende. Health and education took the heaviest hits. Even The Economist, a free market cheerleader, called it an orgy of self-mutilation. De Castro privatized almost 500 state-owned companies and banks, practically giving many of them away, since the point was to get them as quickly as possible into their rightful place in the economic order. He took no pity on local companies and removed even more trade barriers. The result was the loss of 177,000 industrial jobs between 1973 and 1983. By the mid-80s, manufacturing as a percentage of the economy dropped to levels last seen during the Second World War. Shock treatment was an apt description for what Friedman had prescribed. Pinochet had deliberately sent his country into a deep recession based on the untested theory that the sudden contraction would jolt the economy into health. But causing a recession or a depression is a brutal idea, since it necessarily creates mass poverty, which is why no political leader had until this point been willing to test the theory. Who wants to be responsible for what Business Week described as a Dr. Strangelove world of deliberately induced depression? Pinochet did. In the first year of Friedman prescribed shock therapy, Chile's economy contracted by 15%, and unemployment, only 3% under Allende, reached 20%, a rate unheard of in Chile at the time. The country was certainly convulsing under its treatments. And contrary to Friedman's sunny predictions, the crisis lasted for years, not months. By 1986, one in five industrial workers had lost their jobs. The junta, which had instantly taken to Friedman's illness metaphors, was unapologetic, explaining that this path was chosen because it is the only one that goes directly to the sickness. Friedman concurred. When asked by a reporter whether the social cost of his policies would be excessive, he responded, Silly question. To another reporter, he said, My only concern is that they push it long enough and hard enough. Interestingly, the most powerful criticism of shock therapy came from one of Friedman's own former students, André Gunder Frank. During his time at the University of Chicago in the 50s, Gunder Frank, originally from Germany, had heard so much about Chile that when he graduated with a Ph.D. in economics, he decided to go see for himself the country his professors had portrayed as a mismanaged developmentalist dystopia. He liked what he saw and ended up teaching at the University of Chile, then serving as an economic advisor to the government of Salvador Allende, for whom he developed a great respect. As a Chicago boy in Chile who had defected from the school's free market orthodoxy, Gunder Frank had a unique perspective on the country's economic adventure. One year after Friedman prescribed maximum shock, he wrote a rage-fueled open letter to Arnold Harberger and Milton Friedman, in which he used his Chicago school education to examine how the Chilean patient has responded to your treatment. He calculated what it meant for a Chilean family to try to survive on what Pinochet claimed was a living wage. Roughly 74% of its income went simply to buying bread, forcing the family to cut out such luxury items as milk and bus fare to get to work. By comparison, under Allende, bread, milk, and bus fare took up 17% of a public employee's salary. Many children weren't getting milk at school either, since one of the junta's first moves had been to eliminate the school milk program. As a result of this cut, compounding the desperation at home, more and more students were fainting in class, and many stopped going altogether. Gunder Frank saw a direct connection between the brutal economic policies imposed by his former classmates and the violence Pinochet had unleashed on the country. Friedman's prescriptions were so wrenching, the disaffected Chicago boy wrote, that they could not be imposed or carried out without the twin elements that underlie them all, military force and political terror. The Myth of the Chilean Miracle even three decades later, Chile is still held up by free market enthusiasts as proof that Friedmanism works. When Pinochet died in December 2006, 
the New York Times praised him for transforming a bankrupt economy into the most prosperous in Latin America, while a Washington Post editorial said he had introduced the free market policies that produced the Chilean economic miracle. But the country's period of steady growth that is held up as proof of its miraculous success did not begin until the mid-80s, a full decade after the Chicago Boys implemented shock therapy. In 1982, despite its strict adherence to Chicago doctrine, Chile's economy crashed. Its debt exploded. It faced hyperinflation once again, and unemployment hit 30%, ten times higher than it was under Allende. The main cause was that the piranhas, the Enron-style financial houses that the Chicago boys had freed from all regulation, had bought up the country's assets on borrowed money and run up an enormous debt of $14 billion. The situation was so unstable that Pinochet was forced to do exactly what Allende had done. He nationalized many of these companies. In the face of the debacle, almost all the Chicago boys lost their influential government posts, including Sergio de Castro. The only thing that protected Chile from complete economic collapse in the early 80s was that Pinochet had never privatized Codelco, the state copper mine company nationalized by Allende. That one company generated 85% of Chile's export revenues, which meant that when the financial bubble burst, the state still had a steady source of funds. It's clear that Chile never was the laboratory of pure free markets that its cheerleaders claimed. Instead, it was a country where a small elite leapt from wealthy to super-rich in extremely short order. A highly profitable formula bankrolled by debt and heavily subsidized, then bailed out, with public funds. When the hype and salesmanship behind the miracle are stripped away, Chile under Pinochet and the Chicago Boys was not a capitalist state featuring a liberated market, but a corporatist one. What Chile pioneered under Pinochet was an evolution of corporatism, a mutually supporting alliance between a police state and large corporations, joining forces to wage all-out war on the third power sector, the workers. That war, what many Chileans understandably see as a war of the rich against the poor and middle class, is the real story of Chile's economic miracle. By 1988, when the economy had stabilized and was growing rapidly, 45% of the population had fallen below the poverty line. The richest 10% of Chileans, however, had seen their incomes increase by 83%. Even in 2007, Chile remained one of the most unequal societies in the world. Out of 123 countries, in which the United Nations tracks inequality, Chile ranked 116th, making it the eighth most unequal country on the list. If that track record qualifies Chile as a miracle for Chicago school economists, perhaps shock treatment was never really about jolting the economy into health. Perhaps it was meant to do exactly what it did, hoover wealth up to the top and shock much of the middle class out of existence. In Chile, if you were outside the wealth bubble, the miracle looked like the Great Depression. But inside its airtight cocoon, the profits flowed so free and fast that the easy wealth made possible by shock therapy-style reforms have been the crack cocaine of financial markets ever since. And that is why the financial world did not respond to the obvious contradictions of the Chile experiment by reassessing the basic assumptions of laissez-faire. Instead, it reacted with the junkie's logic. Where is the next fix? The revolution spreads. The people vanish. For a time, the next fix came from other countries in Latin America's southern cone, where the Chicago school counter-revolution quickly spread. Brazil was already under the control of a U.S.-supported junta, and several of Friedman's Brazilian students held key positions. Friedman traveled to Brazil in 1973, at the height of the regime's brutality, and declared the economic experiment a miracle. In Uruguay, the military had staged a coup in 1973, and the following year decided to go the Chicago route. The effects on Uruguay's previously egalitarian society were immediate. Real wages dropped by 28%, and hordes of scavengers appeared on the streets of Montevideo for the first time. 
Next to join the experiment was Argentina in 1976, when a junta seized power from Isabel Perón. That meant that Argentina, Chile, Uruguay, and Brazil, the countries that had been showcases of developmentalism, were now all run by U.S.-backed military governments and were living laboratories of Chicago School economics. By the mid-70s, disappearances had become the primary enforcement tool of the Chicago School juntas throughout the Southern Cone. Rather than openly killing or even arresting their prey, soldiers would snatch them, take them to clandestine camps, torture and often kill them, then deny any knowledge. Bodies were thrown into mass graves. According to Chile's Truth Commission established in May 1990, the secret police would dispose of some victims by dropping them into the ocean from helicopters after first cutting their stomach open with a knife to keep the bodies from floating. The Argentine junta excelled at striking just the right balance between public and private horror, carrying out enough of its terror in the open that everyone knew what was going on, but simultaneously keeping enough secret that it could always be denied. When someone was targeted to be eliminated, a fleet of military vehicles showed up at that person's home or workplace and cordoned off the block, often with a helicopter buzzing overhead. In broad daylight and in full view of the neighbors, police or soldiers battered down the door and dragged out the victim, who often shouted his or her name before disappearing into a waiting Ford Falcon in the hope that news of the event would reach the family. Some covert operations were even more brazen. Police were known to board crowded city buses and drag passengers off by their hair. In the city of Santa Fe, a couple was kidnapped right at the altar on their wedding day, in front of a church filled with people. The public character of terror did not stop with the initial capture. Once in custody, prisoners in Argentina were taken to one of more than 300 torture camps across the country. Many of them were located in densely populated residential areas one of the most notorious in a former athletic club on a busy street in Buenos Aires, another in a schoolhouse in central Bahia Blanca, and yet another in a wing of a working hospital. At these torture centers, military vehicles sped in and out at odd hours. Screams could be heard through the badly insulated walls, and strange body-shaped parcels were spotted being carried in and out, all silently registered by the nearby residents. The results of CIA training and the methods codified in the Kubark Manual are unmistakable in all the human rights reports from the Southern Cone in this sinister period. Early morning arrests, hooding, intense isolation, drugging, forced nudity, electroshock, and everywhere the terrible legacy of the McGill experiments in deliberately induced regression. Cleaning the Slate Terror does its work. In 1976, Orlando Letelier was back in Washington, D.C., no longer as an ambassador, but as an activist with a progressive think tank, the Institute for Policy Studies. Haunted by thoughts of the colleagues and friends still facing torture in junta camps, Letelier used his newly recovered freedom to expose Pinochet's crimes and to defend Allende's record against the CIA propaganda machine. The activism was having an effect, and Pinochet faced universal condemnation for his human rights record. What frustrated Letelier, a trained economist, was that even as the world gasped in horror at reports of summary executions and electroshock in the jails, most were silent in the face of the economic shock therapy. Or in the case of the international banks showering the junta with loans, downright giddy about Pinochet's embrace of free market fundamentals. Letelier rejected a frequently articulated notion that the junta had two separate, easily compartmentalized projects. One, a bold experiment in economic transformation, the other an evil system of grisly torture and terror. There was only one project, the former ambassador insisted, in which terror was the central tool of the free market transformation. Letelier went so far as to write in a searing essay for The Nation, that Milton Friedman, as the intellectual architect and unofficial advisor for the team of economists now running the Chilean economy, shared responsibility for Pinochet's crimes. The establishment of a free private economy and the control of inflation a la Friedman, Letelier argued, 
could not be done peacefully. The economic plan has had to be enforced, and in the Chilean context that could be done only by the killing of thousands, the establishment of concentration camps all over the country, the jailing of more than 100,000 persons in three years, regression for the majorities and economic freedom for small privileged groups are in Chile two sides of the same coin. There was, he wrote, an inner harmony between the free market and unlimited terror. Letelier's controversial article was published at the end of August 1976. Less than a month later, on September 21st, the 44-year-old economist was driving to work in downtown Washington, D.C. As he passed through the heart of the embassy district, a remote-controlled bomb planted under the driver's seat exploded, sending the car flying and blowing off both his legs. With his severed foot abandoned on the pavement, Letelier was rushed to George Washington Hospital. He was dead on arrival. An FBI investigation revealed that the bomb had been the work of Michael Townley, a senior member of Pinochet's secret police, later convicted in a U.S. federal court for the crime. The assassins had been admitted to the country on false passports with the knowledge of the CIA. Cleansing Cultures In Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay, the junta staged massive ideological cleanup operations, burning books by Freud, Marx, and Neruda, closing hundreds of newspapers and magazines, occupying universities, banning strikes and political meetings. Some of the most vicious attacks were reserved for the pink economists, whom the Chicago boys could not defeat before the coups. At the University of Chile, hundreds of professors were fired for inobservance of moral duties including André Gunder Frank, the dissident Chicagoan who wrote angry letters home to his former professors. During the coup, Gunder Frank reported that six students were shot on sight in the main entrance to the School of Economics to offer an object lesson to the remainder. In Santiago, the legendary left-wing folk singer Victor Jara was among those taken to the Chile Stadium. His treatment was the embodiment of the furious determination to silence a culture. First, the soldiers broke both his hands so he could not play the guitar. Then they shot him 44 times. To make sure he could not inspire from beyond the grave, the regime ordered his master recordings destroyed. A culture was being deliberately exterminated. Corporate-sponsored torture Attacks on union leaders were often carried out in close coordination with the owners of the workplaces and court cases filed in recent years provide some of the best documented examples of direct involvement by local subsidiaries of foreign multinationals. In the years prior to the coup in Argentina, the rise of left-wing militancy had affected foreign companies both economically and personally. Between 1972 and 1976, five executives from the auto company Fiat were assassinated. The fortunes of such companies changed dramatically when the junta took power and implemented Chicago school policies. Now they could flood the local market with imports, pay lower wages, lay workers off at will, and send their profits home unhindered by regulations. Several multinationals effusively expressed their gratitude. On the first new year under military rule in Argentina, Ford Motor Company took out a celebratory newspaper advertisement openly aligning itself with the regime. 1976. Once again, Argentina finds its way. 1977. New year of faith and hope for all Argentines of goodwill. Ford Motor of Argentina and its people commit themselves to the struggle to bring about the great destiny of the fatherland. Foreign corporations did more than thank the juntas for their fine work. Some were active participants in the terror campaigns. In Brazil, Several multinationals banded together and financed their own privatized torture squads. In mid-1969, just as the junta entered its most brutal phase, an extra-legal police force was launched called Operation Bandeirantes, known as OBAN. Staffed with military officers, OBAN was funded, according to Brazil Never Again, by contributions from various multinational corporations including Ford and General Motors. It was in Argentina, however, 
that the involvement of Ford's local subsidiary with the terror apparatus was most overt. The company supplied cars to the military, and the green Ford Falcon sedan was the vehicle used for thousands of kidnappings and disappearances. The Argentine psychologist and playwright Eduardo Pavlovsky described the car as the symbolic expression of terror, a death mobile. While Ford supplied the Junta with cars, the Junta provided Ford with a service of its own, ridding the assembly lines of troublesome trade unionists. Before the coup, Ford had been forced to make significant concessions to its workers, one hour off for lunch instead of 20 minutes, and 1% of the sale of each car to go to social service programs. All that changed abruptly on the day of the coup, when the counter-revolution began. The Ford factory in suburban Buenos Aires was turned into an armed camp. In the weeks that followed, it was swarming with military vehicles, including tanks and helicopters buzzing overhead. Workers have testified to the presence of a battalion of 100 soldiers permanently stationed at the factory. It looked like we were at war in Ford, and it was all directed at us, the workers, recalled Pedro Troiani, one of the Union delegates. Soldiers prowled the facility, grabbing and hooding the most active Union members, helpfully pointed out by the factory foreman. Troiani was among those pulled off the assembly line. He recalled that, before detaining me, they walked me around the factory. They did it right out in the open so that the people would see. Most startling was what happened next. Rather than being rushed off to a nearby prison, Troiani and others say soldiers took them to a detention facility that had been set up inside the factory gates. In their place of work, where they had been negotiating contracts just days before, workers were beaten, kicked, and, in two cases, electroshocked. They were then taken to outside prisons where the torture continued for weeks, and in some cases, months. In 2002, federal prosecutors filed a criminal complaint against Ford Argentina on behalf of Troiani and 14 other workers, alleging that the company is legally responsible for the repression that took place on its property. Mercedes-Benz, a subsidiary of Daimler Chrysler, is facing a similar investigation. According to the Latin American historian Karen Robert, by the end of the dictatorship, virtually all the shop floor delegates had been disappeared from the country's biggest firms, such as Mercedes-Benz, Chrysler, and Fiat Concord. It wasn't only unionists who faced preemptive attack. It was anyone who represented a vision of society built on values other than pure profit. Particularly brutal throughout the region were the attacks on farmers who had been involved in the struggle for land reform. In the slums, the targets of the preemptive strikes were community workers, many church-based, who organized the poorest sectors of society to demand health care, public housing, and education. In September 1976, a group of high school students banded together to ask for lower bus fare. For the junta, the collective action showed that the teenagers had been infected with the virus of Marxism, and it responded with genocidal fury, torturing and killing six of the high schoolers who had dared to make this subversive request. The pattern of these disappearances was clear. While the shock therapists were trying to remove all relics of collectivism from the economy, the shock troops were removing the representatives of that ethos from the streets, the universities, and the factory floors. As is the case with most state terror, the targeted killings served a dual purpose. First, they removed real obstacles to that project, the people most likely to fight back. Second, the fact that everyone witnessed the troublemakers being disappeared sent an unmistakable warning to those who might be thinking of resisting, thereby eliminating future obstacles. And it worked. We were confused and anguished, docile and waiting to take orders, People regressed, they became more dependent and fearful, recalled the Chilean psychiatrist Marco Antonio de la Parra. They were, in other words, in shock. So when economic shocks sent prices soaring and wages dropping, the streets in Chile, Argentina, and Uruguay remained clear and calm. There were no food riots, no general strikes. Families coped by quietly skipping meals, feeding their babies mate, a traditional tea that suppresses hunger, and waking up before dawn to walk for hours to work, saving on bus fare. Those who died from malnutrition or typhoid 
were quietly buried. Just a decade earlier, the countries of the Southern Cone, with their exploding industrial sectors, rapidly rising middle classes, and strong health and educational systems, had been the hope of the developing world. Now, rich and poor were hurtling into different economic worlds, with the wealthy gaining honorary citizenship in the state of Florida and the rest being pushed back into underdevelopment, a process that would deepen throughout the neoliberal restructurings of the post-dictatorship era. No longer inspirational examples, these countries were now terrifying warnings about what happens to poor nations that think they can pull themselves out of the third world. It was a conversion that paralleled what prisoners were going through inside the junta's torture centers. It wasn't enough to talk. They were forced to renounce their most cherished beliefs, betray their lovers and children. The ones who gave in were called quebrados, the broken ones. So it was in the southern cone. The region wasn't just beaten. It was broken. Quebrado. Entirely Unrelated how an ideology was cleansed of its crimes. For a brief period, it did seem that the crimes of the Southern Cone might actually stick to the neoliberal movement, discrediting it before it expanded beyond its first laboratory. After Milton Friedman's fateful trip to Chile in 1975, New York Times columnist Anthony Lewis asked a simple but inflammatory question. If the pure Chicago economic theory can be carried out in Chile only at the price of repression, should its authors feel some responsibility? After the murder of Orlando Latelier, grassroots activists picked up on his call for the intellectual architect of Chile's economic revolution to be held responsible for the human costs of his policies. In those years, Milton Friedman couldn't give a lecture without being interrupted by someone quoting Latelier, and he was forced to enter through the kitchen at several events where he was being honored. Students at the University of Chicago were so disturbed to learn of their professor's collaboration with the junta that they called for an academic investigation. Some academics backed them up, including the Austrian economist Gerhard Tintner, who fled European fascism and came to the U.S. in the 1930s. Tintner compared Chile under Pinochet to Germany under the Nazis and drew parallels between Friedman's support for Pinochet and the technocrats who collaborated with the Third Reich. Friedman, in turn, accused his critics of Nazism. Both Friedman and Harberger gladly took credit for the economic miracles performed by their Latin American Chicago boys. Sounding like a proud father, Friedman crowed in Newsweek in 1982 that the Chicago boys combined outstanding intellectual and executive ability with the courage of their convictions and a sense of dedication to implementing them. Harberger has said, I feel prouder about my students than of anything I have written. In fact, the Latino group is much more mine than the contribution to the literature. When it came to considering the human costs of the miracles their students performed, however, both men suddenly saw no relationship. Despite my sharp disagreement with the authoritarian political system of Chile, Friedman wrote in his Newsweek column, I do not regard it as evil for an economist to render technical economic advice to the Chilean government. In his memoir, Friedman claimed that Pinochet spent the first two years trying to run the economy on his own, and that it wasn't until 1975, when inflation still raged and a world recession triggered a depression in Chile, that General Pinochet turned to the Chicago boys. This was blatant revisionism. The Chicago boys had been working with the military before the coup even took place, and the economic transformation began on the day the junta took power. At other points, Friedman even claimed that Pinochet's entire reign, 17 years of dictatorship and tens of thousands tortured, was not a violent unmaking of democracy, but its opposite. The really important thing about the Chilean business is that free markets did work their way in bringing about a free society, Friedman said. Three weeks after Latelier was assassinated, news came that cut short the debates over how Pinochet's crimes reflected on the Chicago school movement. Milton Friedman had been awarded the 1976 Nobel Prize for Economics for his original and weighty work on the relationship between inflation and unemployment. 
Friedman used his Nobel address to argue that economics was as rigorous and objective a scientific discipline as physics, chemistry, and medicine, reliant on an impartial examination of the facts available. He conveniently ignored the fact that the central hypothesis for which he was receiving the prize was being graphically proven false by the breadlines, typhoid outbreaks, and shuttered factories in Chile, the one regime ruthless enough to put his ideas into practice. One year later, something else happened to define the parameters of the debate about the Southern Cone. Amnesty International won the Nobel Peace Prize, largely for its courageous and crusading work exposing the human rights abuses in Chile and Argentina. The Economics Prize is actually independent from the Peace Prize, awarded by a different committee and handed out in a different city. From afar, however, it seemed as if, with the two Nobel Prizes, the more prestigious jury in the world had issued its verdict. The shock of the torture chamber was to be forcefully condemned, but economic shock treatments were to be applauded, and the two forms of shock were, as Letelier had written with dripping irony, entirely unrelated. Saved by a War Thatcherism and Its Useful Enemies When Friedrich Hayek, patron saint of the Chicago School, returned from a visit to Chile in 1981, he was so impressed by Augusto Pinochet and the Chicago Boys that he sat down and wrote a letter to his friend Margaret Thatcher, Prime Minister of Britain. He urged her to use the South American country as a model for transforming Britain's Keynesian economy. The British Prime Minister was well acquainted with what she called the remarkable success of the Chilean economy, describing it as a striking example of economic reform from which we can learn many lessons. Yet despite her admiration for Pinochet, when Hayek first suggested that she emulate his shock therapy policies, Thatcher was far from convinced. In February 1982, the Prime Minister bluntly explained the problem in a private letter to her intellectual guru. I am sure you will agree that, in Britain, with our democratic institutions and the need for a high degree of consent, some of the measures adopted in Chile are quite unacceptable. Our reform must be in line with our traditions and our constitution. At times the process may seem painfully slow. The bottom line was that Chicago-style shock therapy just wasn't possible in a democracy like the UK. Thatcher was three years into her first term, sinking in the polls, and not about to guarantee a loss in the upcoming election by doing anything as radical or unpopular as Hayek was suggesting. For Hayek and the movement he represented, it was a disappointing assessment. The Southern Cones experiment had generated such spectacular profits, albeit for a small number of players, that there was tremendous appetite from increasingly global multinationals for new frontiers. And not just in developing countries, but in rich ones in the West, too where states controlled even more lucrative assets that could be run as for-profit interests. Phones, airlines, television airwaves, power companies. If anyone could have championed this agenda in the wealthy world, it would surely have been either Thatcher in England or the American president at the time, Ronald Reagan. Elected leaders, however, have to worry about what voters think of their job performance, which comes up for regular review. And in the early 80s, even with Reagan and Thatcher in power and Hayek and Friedman serving as influential advisors, it was not at all clear that the kind of radical economic agenda that had been imposed with such ferocious violence in the Southern Cone would ever be possible in Britain and the United States. A decade earlier, Friedman and his movement had faced a great disappointment in the U.S. at the hands of none other than Richard Nixon, one that seemed to confirm this point. Even though Nixon had helped put the Chicago boys in power in Chile, he had taken a very different route at home, an inconsistency Friedman would never forgive. When Nixon took office in 1969, Friedman thought his time had finally come to lead his domestic counter-revolution against the legacy of the New Deal. Few presidents have come closer to expressing a philosophy compatible with my own, Friedman wrote of Nixon. The two men met regularly in the Oval Office and Nixon named several of Friedman's like-minded friends and colleagues to key economics posts. One was the University of Chicago professor George Schultz, whom Friedman helped recruit to work for Nixon. Another was Donald Rumsfeld, then 37. In the 60s, 
Rumsfeld used to attend seminars at the University of Chicago, gatherings he later described in reverential terms. Rumsfeld called Friedman and his colleagues a cluster of geniuses, while he and other self-described young pups would come in and learn at their feet. I was so privileged. But in 1971, the U.S. economy was in a slump. Unemployment was high and inflation was pushing prices way up. Nixon knew that if he followed Friedman's laissez-faire advice, millions of angry citizens would vote him out of a job. He decided to put caps on the prices of necessities such as rent and oil. Friedman was outraged. Of all possible government distortions, price controls were the absolute worst. He called them a cancer that can destroy an economic system's capacity to function. Even more disgraceful, it was his own disciples who were the Keynesian enforcers. Rumsfeld was in charge of the wage and price control program, and he answered to Schultz, who at the time was director of the Office of Management and Budget. At one point, Friedman called Rumsfeld at the White House and berated his former young pup. According to Rumsfeld, Friedman instructed him, You have got to stop doing what you are doing. The novice bureaucrat replied that it seemed to be working. Inflation was going down, the economy was growing. Friedman fired back that that was the greatest crime of all. People are going to think that you're doing it. They're going to learn the wrong lesson. They did indeed, and they re-elected Nixon with 60% of the popular vote the following year. In his second term, the president proceeded to shred even more of Friedman's orthodoxies, passing a slew of new laws imposing higher environmental and safety standards on industry. We are all Keynesians now, Nixon famously proclaimed, the cruelest cut of all. So deep was this betrayal that Friedman would later describe Nixon as the most socialist of the presidents of the United States in the 20th century. Nixon's tenure was a stark lesson for Friedman. The University of Chicago professor had built a movement on the equation of capitalism and freedom, yet free people just didn't seem to vote for politicians who followed his advice. Worse, dictatorships, where freedom was markedly absent, were the only governments who were ready to put pure free market doctrine into practice. So while they griped about being betrayed at home, Chicago school luminaries junta hopped their way through the 70s. Almost everywhere that right-wing military dictatorships were in power, the University of Chicago's presence could be felt. Stephen Haggard, a staunch neoliberal political scientist at the University of California, conceded the sad fact that some of the widest-ranging reform efforts in the developing world were undertaken following military coups. Other success stories took place not after military coups, but in one-party states like Mexico, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. In direct contradiction of Friedman's central claim, Haggard concluded that good things such as democracy and market-oriented economic policy do not always go together. Indeed, in the early 80s, there was not a single case of a multi-party democracy going full-tilt free market. Leftists in the developing world have long argued that genuine democracy— with fair rules preventing corporations from buying elections, would necessarily result in governments committed to the redistribution of wealth. The logic is simple enough. In these countries, there are far more poor people than rich ones. Policies that directly redistribute land and raise wages, not trickle-down economics, are in the clear self-interest of a poor majority. Give all citizens the vote and a reasonably fair process, and they will elect the politicians who appear most likely to deliver jobs and land, not more free market promises. For all these reasons, Friedman had spent a fair bit of time staring down an intellectual paradox. As the heir to Adam Smith's mantle, he believed passionately that humans are governed by self-interest and that society works best when self-interest is allowed to govern almost all activities, except when it comes to a little activity called voting. Since most people in the world are either poor or live below the average income in their countries, including in the U.S., it is in their short-term self-interest to vote for politicians promising to redistribute wealth from the top of the economy down to them. Across the Atlantic, Thatcher was attempting an English version of Freedmanism, what has become known as the Ownership Society.
The effort centered on Britain's public housing, or council estates, which Thatcher opposed on philosophical grounds, believing that the state had no role to play in the housing market. The council estates were filled with the type of people who wouldn't vote Tory because it wasn't in their economic self-interest. Thatcher was convinced that if they could be brought into the market, they would start to identify with the interests of the wealthier people who opposed redistribution. With that in mind, she offered strong incentives to the residents of public housing to buy their flats at reduced rates. Those who could became homeowners, while those who couldn't faced rents that were almost twice as high as before. It was a divide-and-conquer strategy, and it worked. The renters continued to oppose Thatcher, the streets of Britain's large cities saw a visible increase in homelessness, but polls showed that more than half of the new owners did switch their party affiliation to the Tories. Although the estate sales offered a glimmer of hope for the possibility of hard-right economics in a democracy, Thatcher still looked poised to lose her job after just one term. By 1982, the number of unemployed had doubled under her watch, as had the inflation rate. After three years in office, Thatcher saw her personal approval rating plummet. Thatcher's catastrophic first term seemed to further confirm the lessons of the Nixon years, that the radical and highly profitable policies of the Chicago school couldn't survive in a democratic system. It seemed clear that the successful imposition of economic shock therapy required some other sort of shock, whether of a coup or of the torture chamber delivered by a repressive regime. That was an especially disturbing prospect on Wall Street, because in the early 80s, authoritarian regimes were starting to collapse around the world. Iran, Nicaragua, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, and many more would follow in what the conservative political scientist Samuel Huntington would term the third wave of democracy. These were worrying developments. What would prevent the emergence of another Allende, winning votes and support with populist policies. Washington had watched in horror as that very scenario played out in both Iran and Nicaragua in 1979. In Iran, the U.S.-backed Shah was overthrown by a coalition of leftists and Islamists. While the stories of hostages and ayatollahs made the news, the economic side of the program was also raising alarms in Washington. The Islamic regime, quickly turning into a brutal dictatorship, immediately nationalized the banking sector and then brought in a land redistribution program. It also imposed controls on imports and exports, a reversal of the Shah's free trade policies. Five months later, in Nicaragua, the U.S.-backed dictatorship of Anastasio Somoza de Baile fell to a popular revolt that installed the left-wing Sandinista government. It controlled imports and, like the Iranians, nationalized the banking industry. It added up to a grim prognosis for the dream of a global free market. By the early 80s, Freedmanites were facing the prospect that their revolution, less than a decade old, was already washed up. War to the Rescue Six weeks after Thatcher wrote that letter to Hayek, something happened that changed her mind and altered the destiny of the corporatist crusade. On April 2nd, 1982, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands, a relic of British colonial rule. The Falklands War, or the Malvinas War if you are Argentine, went down in history as a vicious but fairly minor battle. At the time, the Falklands appeared to have no strategic importance. The cluster of islands off the Argentine coast was thousands of miles from Britain and costly to guard and maintain. Argentina, too, had little use for them though having a British outpost in its waters was regarded as an affront to national pride. The legendary Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges scathingly described the land dispute as a fight between two bald men over a comb. From a military standpoint, the 11-week battle appears to have almost no historic significance. Overlooked, however, was the war's impact on the free market project, which was enormous. It was the Falklands War that gave Thatcher the political cover she needed to bring a program of radical capitalist transformation to a Western liberal democracy for the first time. Both sides in the conflict had good reasons to want a war. In 1982, Argentina's economy was collapsing under the weight of its debt and corruption, 
and human rights campaigns were gaining momentum. A new junta government, led by General Leopoldo Galtieri, calculated that the only thing more powerful than the anger at its continued suppression of democracy was anti-imperialist sentiment, which Galtieri expertly unleashed on the British for their refusal to give up the islands. Soon enough, the junta had Argentina's blue and white flag planted on that rocky outpost, and the country cheered on cue. When news arrived that Argentina had laid claim to the Falklands, Thatcher recognized it as a last-ditch hope to turn around her political fortunes and immediately went into Churchillian battle mode. Until this point, she had shown only disdain for the financial burden that the Falklands placed on government coffers. She had cut grants to the islands and announced major cutbacks to the Navy, including the armed ships that guarded the Falklands, moves read by the Argentine generals as clear indications that Britain was ready to cede the territory. One of Thatcher's biographers characterized her Falklands policy as practically an invitation to Argentina to invade. In the lead up to the war, critics across the political spectrum accused Thatcher of using the military for her own political goals. The Labour MP Tony Benn said, It looks more and more as if what is at stake is Mrs. Thatcher's reputation, not the Falkland Islands at all. While the conservative Financial Times noted, What is deplorable? is that the issue is rapidly becoming mixed up with political differences within Britain itself, which have nothing to do with the matter in hand. Not only the pride of the Argentine government is involved, so is the standing, perhaps even the survival, of the Tory government in Britain. Yet even with all of this healthy cynicism in the run-up, as soon as troops were deployed, the country was swept up in what a draft Labour Party resolution described as a jingoistic, militaristic frame of mind embracing the Falkland Islands as a last blast of glory for Britain's faded empire. Thatcher praised the Falkland spirit gripping the nation, which in practice meant that shouts of Ditch the Bitch faded while Up Your Junta t-shirts sold briskly. Neither London nor Buenos Aires made any serious attempt to avoid a showdown. Thatcher brushed aside the United Nations much as Bush and Blair did in the run-up to the war in Iraq, uninterested in sanctions or negotiations. Glorious victory was the only outcome that either side had any interest in. Thatcher was fighting for her political future, and she succeeded spectacularly. After the Falklands victory, which took the lives of 255 British soldiers and 655 Argentines, the Prime Minister was heralded as a war hero, her moniker Iron Lady transformed from insult to high praise. Her poll numbers were similarly transformed. Thatcher's personal approval rating more than doubled over the course of the battle, from 25 at the start to 59% at the end, paving the way for a decisive victory in the following year's election. The British military's counter-invasion of the Falklands was codenamed Operation Corporate, and though it was an odd name for a military campaign, it proved prescient. Thatcher used the enormous popularity afforded her by the victory, to launch the very corporatist revolution she had told Hayek was impossible before the war. When the coal miners went on strike in 1984, Thatcher cast the standoff as a continuation of the war with Argentina, calling for similarly brutal resolve. She famously declared, We had to fight the enemy without in the Falklands, and now we have to fight the enemy within, which is much more difficult but just as dangerous to liberty. With British workers now categorized as the enemy within, Thatcher unleashed the full force of the state on the strikers, including in a single confrontation 8,000 truncheon-wielding riot police, many on horseback, to storm a plant picket line, leading to roughly 700 injuries. Over the course of the long strike, the number of injuries reached into the thousands. As The Guardian reporter Seamus Milne documents in his definitive account of the strike, the enemy within Thatcher's secret war against the miners, the Prime Minister pressed the security services to intensify surveillance of the Union, and, in particular, its militant president, Arthur Scargill. What ensued was the most ambitious counter-surveillance operation ever mounted in Britain. The Union was infiltrated by multiple agents and informers, and all its phones were bugged, as were the homes and even the fish-and-chip shop frequented by its leadership. The chief executive of the union was alleged on the floor of the House of Commons to have been an MI5 agent sent in to destabilize and sabotage the union, 
though he denied the charge. Nigel Lawson, UK Chancellor of the Exchequer during the strike, explained that the Thatcher government considered the Union to be its enemy. It was just like arming to face the threat of Hitler in the late 1930s, Lawson said a decade later. One had to prepare. As in the Falklands, there was little interest in bargaining, just a focused determination to break the Union, regardless of the cost, and with 3,000 extra police a day, the cost was enormous. Colin Naylor, an acting police sergeant who was on the front lines of the conflict, described it as a civil war. By 1985, Thatcher had won this war too. Workers were going hungry and couldn't hold out. In the end, 966 people were fired. It was a devastating setback for Britain's most powerful union, and it sent a clear message to the others. If Thatcher was willing to go to the wall to break the coal miners, on whom the country depended for its lights and warmth, it would be suicide for weaker unions producing less crucial products and services to take on her new economic order. Better just to accept whatever was on offer. It was a message very similar to the one Ronald Reagan had sent a few months after he took office, with his response to a strike by the air traffic controllers. By not showing up to work, they had forfeited their jobs and will be terminated, Reagan said. Then he fired 11,400 of the country's most essential workers in a single blow, a shock from which the U.S. labor movement has yet to fully recover. In Britain, Thatcher parlayed her victory in the Falklands and over the miners into a major leap forward for her radical economic agenda. Between 1984 and 1988, the government privatized, among others, British Telecom, British Gas, British Airways, British Airport Authority, and British Steel, while it sold its shares in British Petroleum. Much as the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, would take an unpopular president and hand him an opportunity to launch a massive privatization initiative, in Bush's case the privatization of security, warfare, and reconstruction, Thatcher used her war to launch the first mass privatization auction in a Western democracy. This was the real Operation Corporate, one with historic implications. Thatcher's successful harnessing of the Falklands War was the first definitive evidence that a Chicago school economic program did not need military dictatorships and torture chambers in order to advance. She had proved that with a large enough political crisis to rally around, a limited version of shock therapy could be imposed in a democracy. It was in 1982 that Milton Friedman wrote the highly influential passage that best summarizes the shock doctrine. Only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces real change. When that crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. That, I believe, is our basic function, to develop alternatives to existing policies, to keep them alive and available until the politically impossible becomes politically inevitable. The kind of crisis Friedman had in mind was not military, but economic. If an economic crisis hits, and is severe enough, a currency meltdown, a market crash, a major recession, it blows everything else out of the water, and leaders are liberated to do whatever is necessary, or said to be necessary, in the name of responding to a national emergency. Crises are, in a way, democracy-free zones. Gaps in politics as usual when the need for consent and consensus do not seem to apply. Passing on odious debts In 1983, when the Argentine junta collapsed after the Falklands War, Argentines elected Raúl Alfonsín as their new president. The newly liberated country was rigged to detonate, thanks to the planting of a so-called debt bomb. As part of what the outgoing junta had termed a dignified transition to democracy, Washington insisted that the new government agree to pay off the debts amassed by the generals. During junta rule, Argentina's external debt had ballooned from $7.9 billion the year before the coup to $45 billion at the time of the handover. Debts owed to the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the U.S. Export-Import Bank, and private banks based in the U.S. It was much the same across the region. In Uruguay, 
The junta took a debt of half a billion dollars when it seized power and expanded it to five billion dollars, a huge load in a country of only three million people. In Brazil, the most dramatic case, the generals who came to power in 1964 promising financial order managed to take the debt from three billion dollars to 103 billion in 1985. At the time of the transitions to democracy, powerful arguments were made, both moral and legal, that these debts were odious and that newly liberated people should not be forced to pay the bills of their oppressors and tormentors. The case was especially strong in the southern cone, because so much of the foreign credit had gone straight to the military and police during the dictatorship years, to pay for guns, water cannons, and state-of-the-art torture camps. In Chile, for instance, the loans bankrolled a tripling in military spending, enlarging Chile's army from 47,000 in 1973 to 85,000 in 1980. In Argentina, the World Bank estimates that roughly $10 billion of the money borrowed by the generals went to military purchases. Much of what wasn't spent on weapons simply vanished. A culture of corruption permeated junta rule, a glimpse of the debauched future to come when the same freewheeling economic policy spread to Russia, China, and the free fraud zone of occupied Iraq to borrow a phrase from a disaffected U.S. advisor. According to a 2005 U.S. Senate report, Pinochet maintained a Byzantine web of at least 125 secret foreign bank accounts, listed under the names of various family members and combinations of his own name. The accounts, the most notorious of which were at the Washington, D.C.-based Riggs Bank, hid an estimated $27 million. In Argentina, the junta has been accused of being even more acquisitive. In 1984, José Martínez de Oz, architect of the economic program, was arrested on fraud charges relating to a massive state subsidy to one of the companies he used to head. The case was later dismissed. The World Bank, meanwhile, later tracked what happened to $35 billion in foreign loans borrowed by the junta and found that $19 billion, 46% of the total, was moved offshore. Swiss officials have confirmed that much of it ended up in numbered accounts. The U.S. Federal Reserve observed that in 1980 alone, Argentina's debt expanded by $9 billion. In that same year, the amount of money deposited abroad by Argentine citizens increased by $6.7 billion. Larry Yastad, a famed University of Chicago professor who personally trained many of Argentina's Chicago boys, has described these missing billions stolen under the noses of his students, as the greatest fraud of the 20th century. The remainder of the national debt was mostly spent on interest payments, as well as shady bailouts for private firms. In 1982, just before Argentina's dictatorship collapsed, the junta did one last favor for the corporate sector. Domingo Cavallo, president of Argentina's central bank, announced that the state would absorb the debts of large multinational and domestic firms that had, like Chile's piranhas, borrowed themselves to the verge of bankruptcy. The tidy arrangement meant that these companies continued to own their assets and profits, but the public had to pay off between 15 and $20 billion of their debts. Among the companies to receive this generous treatment were Ford Motor Argentina, Chase Manhattan, Citibank, IBM, and Mercedes-Benz. Those who favored defaulting on these illegitimately accumulated debts argued that the lenders knew or ought to have known that the money was being spent on repression and corruption. This case was bolstered recently when the State Department declassified the transcript of a meeting held on October 7, 1976, between Henry Kissinger, then Secretary of State, and Argentina's foreign minister under the military dictatorship, the Admiral Cesar Augusto Gazzetti. After discussing the international human rights outcry following the coup, Kissinger said, Look, our basic attitude is that we would like you to succeed. I have an old-fashioned view that friends ought to be supported. The quicker you succeed, the better. Kissinger then moved on to the topic of loans, encouraging Gazzetti to apply for as much foreign assistance as possible and fast, before Argentina's human rights problem tied the hands of the U.S. administration. There are two loans in the bank, Kissinger said, referring to the Inter-American Development Bank. 
we have no intention of voting against them. He also instructed the minister, proceed with your export-import bank requests. We would like your economic program to succeed, and we will do our best to help you. The transcript proves that the U.S. government approved loans to the junta, knowing they were being used in a campaign of terror. In the early 80s, it was these odious debts that Washington insisted Argentina's new democratic government had to repay. Bonfire of a Young Democracy Russia Chooses the Pinochet Option When Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev flew to London to attend his first G7 summit in July 1991, he had every reason to expect a hero's welcome. For the previous three years, he had seemed not so much to stride across the international stage as to float, charming the media, signing disarmament treaties, and picking up peace prizes, including the Nobel in 1990. He had even managed to do the previously unthinkable, win over the American public. The Russian leader so thoroughly challenged evil empire caricatures that the U.S. press had taken to calling him by a cuddly nickname, Gorby. And in 1987, Time magazine took the risky decision of making the Soviet president their man of the year. The editors explained that unlike his predecessors, gargoyles in fur hats, Gorbachev was Russia's own Ronald Reagan, a Kremlin version of the great communicator. The Nobel Prize Committee declared that thanks to his work, it is our hope that we are now celebrating the end of the Cold War. By the beginning of the 90s, with his twin policies of glasnost, openness, and perestroika, restructuring, Gorbachev had led the Soviet Union through a remarkable process of democratization. The press had been freed. Russia's parliament, local councils, president and vice president had been elected, and the constitutional court was independent. As for the economy, Gorbachev was moving toward a mixture of a free market and a strong safety net with key industries under public control, a process he predicted would take 10 to 15 years to be completed. His end goal was to build social democracy on the Scandinavian model, a socialist beacon for all mankind. At first, it seemed that the West also wanted Gorbachev to succeed in loosening up the Soviet economy and transforming it into something close to Sweden's. The Nobel Committee, explicitly described the prize as a way of offering support to the transition, a helping hand in an hour of need. And on a visit to Prague, Gorbachev made it clear that he couldn't do it all alone. Like mountain climbers on one rope, the world's nations can either climb together to the summit or fall together into the abyss, he said. So what happened at the G7 meeting in 1991 was totally unexpected. The nearly unanimous message that Gorbachev received from his fellow heads of state was that if he did not embrace radical economic shock therapy immediately, they would sever the rope and let him fall. Their suggestions as to the tempo and methods of transition were astonishing, Gorbachev wrote of the event. Poland had just completed a first round of shock therapy under the tutelage of the IMF and Jeffrey Sachs, a Harvard economist and the consensus among British Prime Minister John Major, U.S. President George H.W. Bush, Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, and Japanese Prime Minister Toshiki Kaifu, was that the Soviet Union had to follow Poland's lead on an even faster timetable. After the meeting, Gorbachev got the same marching orders from the IMF, the World Bank, and every other major lending institution. Later that year, when Russia asked for debt forgiveness to weather a catastrophic economic crisis, the stern answer was that the debts had to be honored. What happened next? The dissolution of the Soviet Union, Gorbachev's eclipse by Yeltsin, and the tumultuous course of economic shock therapy in Russia is a well-documented chapter of contemporary history. It is, however, a story too often told in the bland language of reform. A narrative so generic that it has hidden one of the greatest crimes committed against a democracy in modern history. Russia, like China, was forced to choose between a Chicago school economic program and an authentic democratic revolution. Faced with that choice, China's leaders had attacked their own people in order to prevent democracy from disturbing their free market plans. Russia was different. 
the democratic revolution was already well underway. In order to push through a Chicago school economic program, that peaceful and hopeful process that Gorbachev began had to be violently interrupted, then radically reversed. Gorbachev knew that the only way to impose the kind of shock therapy being advocated by the G7 and the IMF was with force, as did many in the West pushing for these policies. The Economist magazine, in an influential 1990 piece, urged Gorbachev to adopt strongman rule to smash the resistance that has blocked serious economic reform. Only two weeks after the Nobel Committee had declared an end to the Cold War, the economist was urging Gorbachev to model himself after one of the Cold War's most notorious killers. Under the heading, Mikhail Sergeyevich Pinochet, the article concluded that even though following its advice could cause possible bloodletting, it might, just might, be the Soviet Union's turn for what could be called the Pinochet approach to liberal economics. The Washington Post was willing to go further. In August 1991, the paper ran a commentary under the headline, Pinochet's Chile, a Pragmatic Model for Soviet Economy. The article supported the idea of a coup for getting rid of the slow-going Gorbachev. But the author, Michael Schrage, worried that the Soviet president's opponents had neither the savvy nor the support to seize the Pinochet option. They should model themselves, Schrage wrote, after a despot who really knew how to run a coup retired Chilean general Augusto Pinochet. Gorbachev soon found himself facing an adversary who was more than willing to play the role of a Russian Pinochet. Boris Yeltsin, though holding the post of Russian president, had a much lower profile than Gorbachev, who headed all the Soviet Union. That was to change dramatically on August 19, 1991, one month after the G7 summit. A group from the communist old guard drove tanks up to the White House, as the Russian parliament building is called. In a bid to halt the democratization process, they threatened to attack the country's first elected parliament. Amid a crowd of Russians determined to defend their new democracy, Yeltsin stood on one of the tanks and denounced the aggression as a cynical right-wing coup attempt. The tanks retreated, and Yeltsin emerged as a courageous defender of democracy. As a leader... Yeltsin had always been a kind of anti-Gorbachev. Where Gorbachev had projected propriety and sobriety, one of his most controversial measures was an aggressive anti-vodka drinking campaign, Yeltsin was a notorious glutton and a heavy drinker. Prior to the coup, many Russians harbored reservations about Yeltsin, but he had helped save democracy from a communist coup, and that made him, at least for the time being, a people's hero. Yeltsin immediately parlayed his triumphant showdown into increased political power. As long as the Soviet Union remained intact, he would always have less control than Gorbachev. But in December 1991, four months after the aborted coup, Yeltsin pulled off a political masterstroke. He formed an alliance with two other Soviet republics, a move that had the effect of abruptly dissolving the Soviet Union, thereby forcing Gorbachev's resignation. The abolition of the Soviet Union, the only country most Russians had ever known, was a powerful shock to the Russian psyche. And as the political scientist Stephen Cohen put it, it was the first of three traumatic shocks that Russians would endure over the next three years. Russia's conversion to capitalism had much in common with the corrupt approach that had sparked the Tiananmen Square protests in China two years earlier. Moscow's mayor, Gavril Popov, has claimed there were really only two options for how to break up the centrally controlled economy. Property can be divided among all members of society, or the best pieces can be given to the leaders. In a word, there's the democratic approach, and there's the nomenclatura apparatchik approach. Yeltsin took the latter approach, and he was in a hurry. In late 1991, he went to the parliament and made an unorthodox proposal. If they gave him one year of special powers under which he could issue laws by decree rather than bring them to Parliament for a vote, he would solve the economic crisis and give them back a thriving, healthy system. What Yeltsin was asking for was the kind of executive power enjoyed by dictators, not Democrats. 
but the Parliament was still grateful to the President for his role during the attempted coup, and the country was desperate for foreign aid. The answer was yes. Yeltsin could have one year of absolute power to remake Russia's economy. He immediately assembled a team of economists, many of whom in the final years of communism had formed a kind of free market book club, reading the basic texts of the Chicago school thinkers and discussing how the theories could be applied in Russia. Though they had never studied in the U.S., they were such devoted fans of Milton Friedman that the Russian press took to calling Yeltsin's team the Chicago Boys, a knockoff of the original title, and fitting in the context of Russia's thriving black market economy. In the West, they were dubbed the Young Reformers. The group's figurehead was Igor Gaidar, whom Yeltsin named as one of his two deputy prime ministers. Piotr Avon, a Yeltsin minister during 1991-92, who was part of this inner circle, said of his former clique, their identification of themselves with God, which flowed naturally from their belief in their all-round superiority, was, unfortunately, typical of our reformers. Surveying the group that had suddenly ascended to power in Moscow, the Russian newspaper Nezhevizhmaya Gazeta observed the rather astonishing development that, for the first time, Russia will get in its government a team of liberals who consider themselves followers of Friedrich von Hayek and the Chicago School of Milton Friedman. Their policies were quite clear. Strict financial stabilization according to shock therapy recipes. At the same time as Yeltsin made these appointments, the newspaper noted he had also put the notorious strongman Yuri Skokov in charge of the defense and repressive departments, the army, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and the State Security Committee. The decisions were clearly connected. Probably the strong Skokov can ensure strict stabilization in politics, while the strong economists guarantee it in the economy. The article ended with a prediction. It will come as no surprise if they attempt to construct something like a homegrown Pinochet system, in which the role of the Chicago boys will be played by Gaidar's team. To provide ideological and technical backup for Yeltsin's Chicago boys, the U.S. government funded its own transition experts whose jobs ranged from writing privatization decrees to launching a New York-style stock exchange to designing a Russian mutual fund market. In the fall of 1992, USAID awarded a $2.1 million contract to the Harvard Institute for International Development, which sent teams of young lawyers and economists to shadow the Gaidar team. In May 1995, Harvard named its economic star Jeffrey Sachs director of the Harvard Institute for International Development, which meant that he played two roles in Russia's reform period. He began as a freelance advisor to Yeltsin, then moved on to overseeing Harvard's large Russia outpost, funded by the U.S. government. Once again, a group of self-described revolutionaries huddled in secret to write a radical economic program. The reformers waited only one week after Gorbachev resigned to launch their economic shock therapy program, the second of the three traumatic shocks. On October 28, 1991, Yeltsin announced the lifting of price controls, predicting that the liberalization of prices will put everything in its right place. The shock therapy program also included free trade policies and the first phase of the rapid-fire privatization of the country's approximately 225,000 state-owned companies. The country was taken by surprise by the Chicago School Program, one of Yeltsin's original economic advisors were called. That surprise was deliberate, part of Gaidar's strategy of unleashing change so suddenly and quickly that resistance would be impossible. The problem his team was up against was the usual one, the threat of democracy obstructing their plans. Russians did not want their economy organized by a communist central committee, but most still believed firmly in wealth redistribution and in an activist role for government. Like the Polish supporters of Lech Walesa's solidarity in the early 80s, 67% of Russians told pollsters in 1992 they believed workers' cooperatives were the most equitable way to privatize the assets of the communist state, and 79% said they considered maintaining full employment to be a core function of government. That meant 
that if Yeltsin's team had submitted their plans to democratic debate rather than launching a stealth attack on an already deeply disoriented public, the Chicago school revolution would not have stood a chance. Yeltsin made wild promises that, for approximately six months, things will be worse. But then the recovery would begin, and soon enough Russia would be an economic titan, one of the top four economies in the world. This logic of so-called creative destruction resulted in scarce creation and spiraling destruction. After only one year, shock therapy had taken a devastating toll. Millions of middle-class Russians had lost their life savings when money lost its value, and abrupt cuts to subsidies meant millions of workers had not been paid in months. The average Russian consumed 40% less in 1992 than in 1991, and a third of the population fell below the poverty line. The middle class was forced to sell personal belongings from card tables on the streets. Desperate acts that the Chicago school economists praised as entrepreneurial. Proof that a capitalist renaissance was indeed underway, one family heirloom and second-hand blazer at a time. Russians did eventually regain their bearings and begin to demand an end to the sadistic economic adventure. No more experiments was a popular piece of graffiti in Moscow at the time. Under pressure from voters, the country's elected parliament, the same body that had supported Yeltsin's rise to power, decided it was time to rein in the president and his ersatz Chicago boys. In December 1992, they voted to unseat Igor Gaidar, and three months later, in March 1993, the parliamentarians voted to repeal the special powers they had given to Yeltsin to impose his economic laws by decree. From now on, laws had to go through Parliament, a standard measure in any liberal democracy and following the procedure set out in Russia's constitution. The deputies were acting within their rights, but Yeltsin had grown accustomed to his special powers and had come to think of himself less as a president and more as a monarch. He had taken to calling himself Boris I. He retaliated against the Parliament's mutiny by going on television and declaring a state of emergency, which conveniently restored his imperial powers. Three days later, Russia's independent constitutional court, the creation of which was one of Gorbachev's most significant democratic breakthroughs, ruled nine to three that Yeltsin's power grab violated, on eight different counts, the constitution he had sworn to uphold. Until this point, it had still been possible to present economic reform and democratic reform as part of the same project in Russia. But once Yeltsin declared a state of emergency, the two projects were on a collision course, with Yeltsin and his shock therapists in direct opposition to the elected parliament and the constitution. Nevertheless, the West threw its weight behind Yeltsin, who was still cast in the role of a progressive, genuinely committed to freedom and democracy genuinely committed to reform, in the words of the then U.S. President Bill Clinton. The majority of the Western press also sided with Yeltsin against the entire parliament, who were dismissed as communist hardliners trying to roll back democratic reforms. They suffered, according to the New York Times Moscow bureau chief, from a Soviet mentality, suspicious of reform, ignorant of democracy, disdainful of intellectuals or democrats. In fact, for all their flaws, these were the same politicians who had stood with Yeltsin and Gorbachev against the coup by the hardliners in 1991, who had voted to dissolve the Soviet Union, and who had, until recently, thrown their support behind Yeltsin. Yet the Washington Post opted to cast Russia's parliamentarians as anti-government, as if they were interlopers and not themselves part of the government. In the spring of 1993, the collision drew closer when Parliament brought forward a budget bill that did not follow IMF demands for strict austerity. Yeltsin responded by trying to eliminate the Parliament. He hastily threw together a referendum, supported in Orwellian fashion by the press, which asked voters if they supported dissolving Parliament and holding snap elections. Not enough voters turned out to give Yeltsin the mandate he needed. He still claimed victory, however, maintaining that the exercise proved the country was behind him because he had slipped in an entirely non-binding question about whether voters supported his reforms. A slim majority said yes. 
In Russia, the referendum was widely seen as a propaganda exercise, and a failed one at that. The reality was that Yeltsin and Washington were still stuck with a parliament that had the constitutional right to do what it was doing, slowing down the shock therapy transformation. An intense pressure campaign began. Lawrence Summers, then U.S. Treasury Undersecretary, warned that the momentum for Russian reform must be reinvigorated and intensified to ensure sustained multilateral support. The IMF got the message, and an unnamed official leaked to the press that a promised $1.5 billion loan was being rescinded because the IMF was unhappy with Russia's backtracking on reforms. Piotr Avin, a former Yeltsin minister, said, The maniacal obsession of the IMF with budgetary and monetary policy and its absolutely superficial and formal attitude to everything else played not a small role in what happened. What happened was that the day after the IMF leak, Yeltsin, confident that he had the West's support, took his first irreversible step toward what was now being openly referred to as the Pinochet option. He issued Decree 1400, announcing that the Constitution was abolished and Parliament dissolved. Two days later, a special session of Parliament voted 636 to 2 to impeach Yeltsin for this outrageous act, the equivalent of the U.S. President unilaterally dissolving Congress. Vice President Alexander Rutskoy announced that Russia had already paid a dear price for the political adventurism of Yeltsin and the reformers. Some kind of armed conflict between Yeltsin and the parliament was now inevitable. Despite the fact that Russia's constitutional court once again ruled Yeltsin's behavior unconstitutional, Clinton continued to back him, and Congress voted to give Yeltsin $2.5 billion in aid. Emboldened, Yeltsin sent in troops to surround the parliament and got the city to cut off power, heat, and phone lines to the White House Parliament building. Boris Kagarlitsky, director of the Institute of Globalization Studies in Moscow, told me that supporters of Russian democracy were coming in by the thousands trying to break the blockade. There were two weeks of peaceful demonstrations confronting the troops and police forces, which led to partial unblocking of the parliament building with people able to bring food and water inside. Peaceful resistance was growing more popular and gaining broader support every day. With each side becoming more entrenched, the only compromise that could have resolved the standoff would have been for both sides to agree to early elections, putting everybody's job up for public review. Many were urging this outcome, but just as Yeltsin was weighing his options and reportedly leaning toward elections, News came from Poland that voters had rained down their decisive punishment on Solidarity, the party that ultimately betrayed them with shock therapy. After they witnessed Solidarity get pounded at the polls, it was obvious to Yeltsin and his Western advisors that early elections were far too risky. In Russia, too much wealth hung in the balance. Huge oil fields, about 30% of the world's natural gas reserves, 20% of its nickel, not to mention weapons factories and the state media apparatus with which the Communist Party had controlled the vast population. Yeltsin abandoned negotiations and moved into war posture. Having just doubled military salaries, he had most of the army on his side, and he surrounded the parliament with thousands of interior ministry troops, barbed wire, and water cannons, and refused to let anyone pass according to the Washington Post. Vice President Rutskoy, Yeltsin's main rival in Parliament, had by this point armed his guards and welcomed proto-fascist nationalists into his camp. He urged his supporters to not give a moment of peace to Yeltsin's dictatorship. Boris Kagarlitsky, who participated in the protests and wrote a book about the episode, told me that on October 3rd, crowds of supporters of the Parliament marched to the Austin Kino TV Center to demand that news be announced. Some people in the crowd were armed, but most were not. There were children in the crowd. It was met by Yeltsin's troops and machine-gunned. About 100 demonstrators were killed and one member of the military. Yeltsin's next move was to dissolve all city and regional councils in the country. Russia's young democracy was being destroyed piece by piece.
There is no doubt that some parliamentarians showed antipathy for a peaceful settlement by egging on the crowds. But, as even the former U.S. State Department official Leslie Gelb wrote, the parliament was not dominated by a bunch of right-wing crazies. Kagarlitsky estimated that there were three or four right-wing nationalists out of a few hundred deputies. It was Yeltsin's illegal dissolution of parliament and his defiance of the country's highest court that precipitated the crisis. Moves that were bound to be met by desperate measures in a country that had little desire to give up the democracy it had just won. A clear signal from Washington or the EU could have forced Yeltsin to engage in serious negotiations with the parliamentarians, but he received only encouragement. Finally, on the morning of October 4th, 1993, Yeltsin fulfilled his long-prescribed destiny and became Russia's very own Pinochet, unleashing a series of violent events with unmistakable echoes of the coup in Chile exactly 20 years earlier. In what was the third traumatic shock inflicted by Yeltsin on the Russian people, he ordered a reluctant army to storm the Russian White House, setting it on fire and leaving charred the very building he had built his reputation defending just two years earlier. Communism may have collapsed without the firing of a single shot, but Chicago-style capitalism, it turned out, required a great deal of gunfire to defend itself. Yeltsin called in 5,000 soldiers, dozens of tanks and armored personnel carriers, helicopters and elite shock troops armed with automatic machine guns, all to defend Russia's new capitalist economy from the grave threat of democracy. By the end of the day, the all-out military assault had taken the lives of approximately 500 people and wounded almost a 1,000, the most violence Moscow had seen since 1917. But Russia wasn't a repeat of Chile. It was Chile in reverse order. Pinochet staged a coup, dissolved the institutions of democracy, and then imposed shock therapy. Yeltsin imposed shock therapy in a democracy, then could defend it only by dissolving democracy and staging a coup. Both scenarios earned enthusiastic support from the West. Following the coup, Russia was under unchecked dictatorial rule. Its elected bodies were dissolved, the constitutional court was suspended, as was the constitution, tanks patrolled the streets, a curfew was in effect, and the press faced pervasive censorship, though civil liberties were soon restored. So what did the Chicago boys and their Western advisors do at this critical moment? The same thing they did when Santiago smoldered, and the same thing they would do when Baghdad burned. Liberated from the meddling of democracy, they went on a lawmaking binge. And do something they did. These days, Yeltsin's liberal economic team is on a roll, reported Newsweek. The day after the Russian president dissolved parliament, the word came down to the market reformers, start writing decrees. The magazine quoted a jubilant Western economist working closely with the government, who made it absolutely clear that in Russia democracy was always a hindrance to the market plan. With Parliament out of the way, this is a great time for reform. The economists around here were pretty depressed, now we're working day and night. Indeed, there seems to be nothing quite as cheering as a coup, as Charles Blitzer, the World Bank's chief economist for Russia, told the Wall Street Journal. I've never had so much fun in my life. The fun was just beginning. With the country reeling from the attack, Yeltsin's own Chicago boys rammed through the most contentious measures in their program. Huge budget cuts, the removal of price controls on basic food items, including bread, and even more and faster privatizations. The standard policies that cause so much instant misery that they require a police state to stave off rebellion. Change was so rapid that it was impossible for Russians to keep up. Workers often did not even know that their factories and mines had been sold let alone how they had been sold or to whom, a profound confusion I would witness a decade later in the state-owned factories of Iraq. In theory, all this wheeling and dealing was supposed to create the economic boom that would lift Russia out of desperation. In practice, the communist state was simply replaced with a corporatist one. The beneficiaries of the boom were confined to a small club of Russians, many of them former Communist Party apparatchiks, 
and a handful of Western mutual fund managers who made dizzying returns investing in newly privatized Russian companies. A clique of nouveau billionaires, many of whom were to become part of the group universally known as the oligarchs for their imperial levels of wealth and power, teamed up with Yeltsin's Chicago boys and stripped the country of nearly everything of value, moving the enormous profits offshore at a rate of $2 billion a month. Before shock therapy, Russia had no millionaires. By 2003, the number of Russian billionaires had risen to 17, according to the Forbes list. That is partly because, in a rare departure from Chicago school orthodoxy, Yeltsin and his team did not allow foreign multinationals to buy up Russia's assets directly. They kept the prizes for Russians, then opened up the newly privatized companies owned by so-called oligarchs to foreign investment. The returns were still astronomical. Looking for an investment that could gain 2,000% in three years, the Wall Street Journal asked? Only one stock market offers that hope. Russia. Many investment banks, including Credit Suisse First Boston, as well as a few deep-pocketed financiers, quickly set up dedicated Russian mutual funds. For the country's oligarchs and foreign investors, only one cloud loomed on the horizon. Yeltsin's plummeting popularity. The effects of the economic program were so brutal for the average Russian, and the process was so self-evidently corrupt, that his approval ratings fell to the single digits. If Yeltsin was pushed from office, whoever replaced him would likely put a halt to Russia's adventure in extreme capitalism. In December 1994, Yeltsin did what so many desperate leaders have done throughout history to hold on to power. He started a war. His national security chief, Oleg Lobov, had confided to a legislator, we need a small, victorious war to raise the president's ratings. And the defense minister predicted that his army could defeat the forces in the breakaway Republic of Chechnya in a matter of hours. A cakewalk. For a while, at least, the plan seemed to work. In its first phase, the Chechen independence movement was partially suppressed, and Russian troops took over the already abandoned presidential palace in Grozny, allowing Yeltsin to declare glorious victory. But when Yeltsin faced re-election in 1996, he was still so unpopular and his defeat looked so certain that his advisors toyed with cancelling the vote altogether. In the end, the election went ahead and Yeltsin won, thanks to an estimated $100 million in financing from oligarchs, 33 times the legal amount, as well as 800 times more coverage on oligarch-controlled TV stations than his rivals. With the threat of a sudden change in government removed, the knockoff Chicago boys were able to move to the most contentious and most lucrative part of their program, selling off what Lenin had once called the commanding heights. Forty percent of an oil company comparable in size to France's total was sold for $88 million. Total sales in 2006 were $193 billion. Norilsk Nickel, which produced a fifth of the world's nickel, was sold for $170 million, even though its profits alone soon reached $1.5 billion annually. The massive oil company Yukos, which controls more oil than Kuwait, was sold for $309 million. It now earns more than $3 billion in revenue a year. 51% of the oil giant Sedanko went for $130 million. Just two years later, that stake would be valued on the international market at $2.8 billion. A huge weapons factory sold for $3 million, the price of a vacation home in Aspen. The scandal wasn't just that Russia's public riches were auctioned off for a fraction of their worth. It was also that in true corporatist style, they were purchased with public money. In a bold act of collusion between the politicians selling the public companies and the businessmen buying them, several of Yeltsin's ministers, including Igor Gaidar, transferred large sums of public money, which should have gone into the National Bank or Treasury, into private banks that had been hastily incorporated by oligarchs. The state then contracted with the same banks to run the privatization auctions for the oil fields and mines. The banks ran the auctions, but they also bid in them.
And sure enough, the oligarch-owned banks decided to make themselves the proud new owners of the previously public assets. The money that they put up to buy the shares in these public companies was likely the same public money that Yeltsin's ministers had deposited with them earlier. In other words, the Russian people fronted the money for the looting of their own country. With oligarchs firmly in control of the key assets of the Russian state, they opened up their new companies to blue-chip multinationals who snapped up large portions. In 1997, Royal Dutch Shell and BP entered into partnerships with two key Russian oil giants, Gazprom and Sidanko. Wayne Mary, the chief political analyst at the U.S. Embassy in Moscow during the key years of 1990 to 1994, has admitted that the choice between democracy and market interests in Russia was a stark one. The U.S. government chose the economic over the political. We chose the freeing of prices, privatization of industry, and the creation of a really unfettered, unregulated capitalism, and essentially hoped that rule of law, civil society, and representative democracy would develop somehow automatically as a result of that. Unfortunately, the choice was to ignore popular will and to press on with the policy. Shock therapy cracked Russia open to flows of so-called hot money, short-term speculative investment, and currency trading, which are highly profitable. Such intense speculation meant that in 1998, when the Asian financial crisis started spreading, Russia was left wholly unprotected. Its already precarious economy crashed definitively. The public blamed Yeltsin, and his approval rating dropped to an utterly untenable 6%. With the futures of many of the oligarchs in jeopardy once again, it was going to take yet another major shock to save the economic project and stave off the threat of genuine democracy coming to Russia. In September 1999, the country was hit with a series of exceedingly cruel terrorist attacks. Seemingly out of the blue, four apartment buildings were blown up in the middle of the night, killing close to 300 people. In a narrative all too familiar to Americans after September 11, 2001, Every other issue was blasted off the political map by the only force on earth capable of doing the job. It was this sort of very simple fear, explains the Russian journalist Yevgenia Albats. All of a sudden, it appeared that all these discussions about democracy, oligarchs, nothing compared to this fear to die inside your own apartment. The man put in charge of hunting down the animals was Russia's Prime Minister, the steely and vaguely sinister Vladimir Putin. Immediately after the apartment bombings, in late September 1999, Putin launched airstrikes on Chechnya, attacking civilian areas. In the new light of terror, the fact that Putin was a 17-year veteran of the KGB, the most feared symbol of the communist era, suddenly seemed reassuring to many Russians. With Yeltsin's alcoholism making him increasingly dysfunctional, Putin the protector was perfectly positioned to succeed him as president. On December 31, 1999, with the war in Chechnya foreclosing serious debate, oligarchs engineered a quiet handover from Yeltsin to Putin. No elections necessary. Before he left power, Yeltsin took one last page out of the Pinochet playbook and demanded legal immunity for himself. Putin's first act as president was signing a law protecting Yeltsin from any criminal prosecution, whether for the mass corruption of which he stands accused or for the military's killing of pro-democracy demonstrators that took place on his watch. By 1998, more than 80% of Russian farms had gone bankrupt and roughly 70,000 state factories had closed, creating an epidemic of unemployment. In 1989, before shock therapy, two million people in the Russian Federation were living in poverty, on less than four dollars a day. By the time the shock therapists had administered their bitter medicine in the mid-90s, 74 million Russians were living below the poverty line, according to the World Bank. That means that Russia's economic reforms can claim credit for the impoverishment of 72 million people in only eight years. By 1996, 25% of Russians, 
almost 37 million people, lived in poverty described as desperate. Although millions of Russians have been pulled out of poverty in recent years thanks largely to soaring oil and gas prices, Russia's underclass of extreme poor has remained permanent, with all the sicknesses associated with that discarded status. As miserable as life under communism was, with crowded, cold apartments, Russians at least were housed. In 2006, the government admitted that there were 715,000 homeless kids in Russia, and UNICEF has put the number as high as 3.5 million children. During the Cold War, widespread alcoholism was always seen in the West as evidence that life under communism was so dismal that Russians needed large quantities of vodka to get through the day. Under capitalism, however, Russians drink more than twice as much alcohol as they used to, and they are reaching for harder painkillers as well. Russia's drug czar, Alexander Mikhailov, says that the number of users went up 900% from 1994 to 2004, to more than 4 million people, many of them heroin addicts. The drug epidemic has contributed to another silent killer. In 1995, 50,000 Russians were HIV positive. Now, nearly a million Russians are HIV positive. These are the slow deaths but there are fast ones as well. As soon as shock therapy was introduced in 1992, Russia's already high suicide rate began to rise. 1994, the peak of Yeltsin's reforms, saw the suicide rate climb to almost double what it had been eight years earlier. Russians also killed each other with much greater frequency. By 1994, violent crime had increased more than fourfold. What have our motherland and her people gotten out of the last 15 criminal years? Vladimir Gusev, a Moscow academic, asked at a 2006 democracy demonstration. The years of criminal capitalism have killed off 10% of our population. Russia's population is indeed in dramatic decline. The country is losing roughly 700,000 people a year. Between 1992, the first year of shock therapy, and 2006, Russia's population shrank by 6.6 million. Three decades ago, André Gunder Frank, the dissident Chicago economist, wrote a letter to Milton Friedman accusing him of economic genocide. Many Russians describe the slow disappearance of their fellow citizens in similar terms today. This planned misery is made all the more grotesque because the wealth accumulated by the elite is flaunted in Moscow as nowhere else outside of a handful of oil emirates. In Russia today, wealth is so stratified that the rich and the poor seem to be living not only in different countries, but in different centuries. One time zone is downtown Moscow, transformed and fast-forward into a futuristic 21st century Sin City where oligarchs race around in black Mercedes convoys guarded by top-of-the-line mercenary soldiers and where Western money managers are seduced by the open investment rules by day and by the on-the-house prostitutes by night. In the other time zone, a 17-year-old provincial girl asked about her hopes for the future replied, It's difficult to talk about the 21st century when you're sitting here reading by candlelight. The 21st century does not matter. It's the 19th century here. When in doubt, blame corruption. If one reads Western news reports on Russia's shock therapy period, it is striking how closely discussions at that time paralleled debates about Iraq that would unfold more than a decade later. For both the Clinton and Bush senior administrations, not to mention the European Union, the G7 and the IMF, the clear goal in Russia was to erase the pre-existing state and create the conditions for a capitalist feeding frenzy, which in turn would kickstart a booming free market democracy, managed by overconfident Americans barely out of school. In other words, it was Iraq without the explosives. When the zeal for shock therapy in Russia was at its peak, its cheerleaders were absolutely convinced that only total destruction of every single institution would create the conditions for a national rebirth. The dream of the blank slate that would recur in Baghdad. It is 
desirable, wrote the Harvard historian Richard Pipes, for Russia to keep on disintegrating until nothing remains of its institutional structures. When it was no longer possible to hide the failures of Russia's shock therapy program, the spin turned to Russia's culture of corruption, as well as speculation that Russians aren't ready for genuine democracy because of their long history of authoritarianism. Washington's think tank economists hastily disavowed the Frankenstein economy they helped create in Russia, deriding it as mafia capitalism, supposedly a phenomenon peculiar to the Russian character. Nothing good will ever come of Russia, the Atlantic Monthly reported in 2001, quoting a Russian office worker. In the Los Angeles Times, the journalist and novelist Richard Lorry pronounced that the Russians are such a calamitous nation that even when they undertake something sane and banal like voting and making money, they make a total hash of it. The economist Anders Asland had claimed that the temptations of capitalism alone would transform Russia, that the sheer power of greed would provide the momentum to rebuild the country. Asked a few years later what went wrong, he replied, corruption, corruption, and corruption, as if corruption was something other than the unrestrained expression of the temptations of capitalism that he had so enthusiastically praised. The real problem with the Blame Russia narrative is that it preempts any serious examination of what the whole episode has to teach about the true face of the crusade for unfettered free markets, the most powerful political trend of the past three decades. The corruption of many of the oligarchs is still spoken of as an alien force that infected otherwise worthy free market plans. But corruption wasn't an intruder to Russia's free market reforms. Quick and dirty deals were actively encouraged by Western powers at every stage as the fastest way to kickstart the economy. National salvation through the harnessing of greed was the closest thing Russia's Chicago boys and their advisors had to a plan for what they were going to do after they finished destroying Russia's institutions. Nor were these catastrophic results unique to Russia. The entire 30-year history of the Chicago School experiment has been one of mass corruption and corporatist collusion between security states and large corporations, from Chile's piranhas to Argentina's crony privatizations, to Russia's oligarchs to Enron's energy shell game to Iraq's free fraud zone. The point of shock therapy is to open up a window for enormous profits to be made very quickly. Not despite the lawlessness, but precisely because of it. Russia has become a Klondike for international fund speculators, ran a headline in a Russian newspaper in 1997, while Forbes described Russia and Central Europe as the new frontier. The colonial era terms were entirely appropriate. Corruption has been as much a fixture on these contemporary frontiers as it was during the colonial gold rushes. Since the most significant privatization deals are always signed amid the tumult of an economic or political crisis, clear laws and effective regulators are never in place. The atmosphere is chaotic, the prices are flexible, and so are the politicians. What we have been living for three decades is frontier capitalism with the frontier constantly shifting location from crisis to crisis, moving on as soon as the law catches up. And so, far from acting as a cautionary tale, the rise of Russia's billionaire oligarchs proved precisely how profitable the strip mining of an industrialized state could be. And Wall Street wanted more. Immediately following the Soviet collapse, the U.S. Treasury and the IMF became much tougher in their demands for instant privatizations from other crisis-wracked countries. The most dramatic case to date came in 1994, the year after Yeltsin's coup, when Mexico's economy suffered a major meltdown known as the tequila crisis. The terms of the U.S. bailout demanded rapid-fire privatizations, and Forbes announced that the process had minted 23 new billionaires. The lesson here is fairly obvious. To predict whence the next bursts of billionaires will issue, look for countries where markets are opening. It also cracked Mexico open to unprecedented foreign ownership. In 1990, only one of Mexico's banks was foreign-owned, but by 2000, 24 out of 30 were in foreign hands. Clearly, the only lesson learned from Russia 
is that the faster and more lawless the transfer of wealth, the more profitable it will be. The Capitalist Id Russia and the New Era of the Boer Market On the day I went to visit Jeffrey Sachs in October 2006, New York City was under a damp blanket of gray drizzle, punctuated every five paces or so by a vibrant burst of red. It was the week of the grand launch of Bono's Red Brand, and the city was getting the full blitz. Red iPods and Armani sunglasses loomed from billboards overhead. Every bus shelter featured Steven Spielberg or Penelope Cruz in a different red garment. Every gap outlet in the city had given itself over to the launch, and the Apple Store on Fifth Avenue was emitting a rosy glow. Can a tank top change the world? asked one ad. Yes, it can, we were assured, because a portion of the profits was going to the Global Fund to fight AIDS. Shop till it stops, Bono had pronounced in the midst of a televised shopping spree with Oprah a couple of days earlier. I had a hunch that most of the journalists wanting to talk to Sachs that week would be looking for the superstar economist's view on this fashionable new way to raise aid money. After all, Bono refers to Sachs as my professor, and a photo of the two men greeted me as I entered Sachs's office at Columbia University. He left Harvard in 2002. In the midst of all this glamorous charity, I felt like a bit of a spoiler because I wanted to talk about the professor's least favorite topic of all, one that has prompted him to threaten to hang up on reporters mid-interview. I wanted to talk about Russia and what went wrong there. It was in Russia, after the first year of shock therapy, that Sachs began his own transition, from global shock doctor to one of the world's most outspoken campaigners for increasing aid to impoverished countries. It is a transition that, in the years since, has put him in conflict with many former colleagues and collaborators in orthodox economic circles. As far as Sachs is concerned, he isn't the one who changed. He was always committed to helping countries develop market-based economies bolstered by generous aid and debt forgiveness. For years, he had found it possible to achieve these goals by working in partnership with the IMF and the U.S. Treasury. But by the time he was on the ground in Russia, the tenor of discussion had changed, and he came up against a level of official indifference that shocked him and pushed him into a more confrontational stance with Washington's economic establishment. This audiobook has been broken into multiple parts to make the download faster. You have reached the end of a part, but not the end of the complete audiobook. So please check your library for the next part of this audiobook. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program. This is Audible. Audio Renaissance presents The Shock Doctrine The Rise of Disaster Capitalism by Naomi Klein Read for you by Jennifer Wiltsey Seen with hindsight, there is no doubt that Russia marked the beginning of a new chapter in the evolution of the Chicago School Crusade. In earlier shock therapy laboratories of the 70s and 80s, there had been some desire at the U.S. Treasury and the IMF to make the experiments at least superficially successful precisely because they were experiments meant to serve as models for other countries to follow. The Latin American dictatorships of the 70s were rewarded for their attacks on trade unions and their open borders with steady loans, which were granted despite such departures from Chicago school orthodoxy as Chile's continued state control over the world's largest copper mines and the Argentine junta's slow action on privatizations. In Poland, the first Eastern Bloc country to impose shock therapy, Sachs had no trouble securing substantial loans, and once again, major privatizations were slowed and staggered when the original plan encountered strong opposition. Russia was different. Too much shock, not enough therapy, was the widespread verdict. Western powers were totally unyielding in their demand for the most painful reforms, 
at the same time as they were assiduously stingy in the amount of aid they would offer in return. Even Pinochet had cushioned the pain of shock therapy with food programs for the poorest children. Washington lenders saw no reason to help Yeltsin do the same, pushing the country instead into its Hobbesian nightmare. Having a substantive discussion about Russia with Sachs isn't easy. I was hoping to take the conversation beyond his initial defensiveness. I was right and they were completely wrong, he told me. Then, ask Larry Summers, don't ask me. Ask Bob Rubin, ask Clinton, ask Cheney how happy they were with the way Russia went. I also wanted to get beyond the genuine despondency. I was trying to do something at the time, which proved to be completely useless. What I was aiming to understand better was why he was so unsuccessful in Russia. Why Jeffrey Sachs's famous luck ran out at that particular juncture. Sachs now says that he knew something was different as soon as he arrived in Moscow. I had a sense of foreboding from the first moment. I was furious from the first moment. Russia was facing a first-class macroeconomic crisis, one of the most intense and unstable I had ever seen in my life, he said. And as far as he was concerned, the way out was clear. The shock therapy measures he had prescribed for Poland, to get basic market forces working quickly, plus a heck of a lot of aid. I was thinking of $30 billion a year, roughly divided. $15 billion for Russia and $15 billion for the republics, in order to be able to pull off a peaceful and democratic transition. Sachs, it must be said, has a notoriously selective memory when it comes to the draconian policies he pushed in both Poland and Russia. In our interview, he repeatedly glossed over his own calls for swift privatization and large cutbacks. In short, shock therapy, a phrase he now disavows, claiming he was referring only to narrow monetary measures, not wholesale country makeovers. The way he remembers his role, shock therapy played a minor part, and he was almost exclusively focused on fundraising. His plan for Poland, he says, was a stabilization fund, debt cancellation, short-term financial help, integration with the Western European economy. When I was asked by Yeltsin's team to help them, I proposed basically the same thing. There is no debate about the key fact in Sachs's account. Securing a major aid infusion was a central pillar of his plan for Russia. That was Yeltsin's incentive for submitting to the entire program. Sachs based this vision, he says, on the Marshall Plan. The $12.6 billion, $130 billion in today's dollars, that the U.S. allotted for Europe to reconstruct its infrastructure and industry after the Second World War, a scheme widely regarded as Washington's most successful diplomatic initiative. Sachs says the Marshall Plan showed that when a country is in disarray, you can't just expect it to get back up on its feet in a coherent way by itself. So for me, the interesting thing about the Marshall Plan is how a modest amount of monetary infusion created a base for Europe's economic recovery to take hold. Sachs was confident that he could shake a new Marshall Plan out of the U.S. Treasury and the IMF, and not without reason. Probably the most important economist in the world is how the New York Times described him in this period. When he was an advisor to Poland's government, he recalled that he raised $1 billion in one day in the White House. But, Sachs told me, when I suggested the same thing for Russia, there was absolutely no interest at all. None. And the IMF just stared me down like I was crazy. Although Yeltsin and his Chicago boys had plenty of admirers in Washington, no one was willing to come up with the kind of aid they were talking about. That meant Sachs had urged wrenching policies on Russia, and he couldn't keep up his end of the bargain. It was in this period that he came close to self-criticism. My greatest personal mistake, he said in the midst of the Russia debacle, was to say to President Boris Yeltsin, don't worry, help is on the way. I believe deeply that the assistance was too important and too crucial to the West for it to be messed up as significantly and fundamentally as it has been. Sachs had pushed hard for shock therapy before he had any guarantee that they would, a gamble for which millions paid dearly. When I revisited the question with Sachs, he reiterated that his real failing was in misreading Washington's political mood. He recalled a discussion with Lawrence Eagleburger, 
U.S. Secretary of State under George H.W. Bush. Sachs made his case. If Russia was allowed to descend further into economic chaos, it could unleash forces no one could control. Mass famine, resurgent nationalism, even fascism. Surely unwise in a country where virtually the only product held in surplus was nuclear arms. Your analysis may be just right, but it's not going to happen, Eagleburger replied. Then he asked Sachs, Do you know what year this is? It was 1992, the year of the U.S. election in which Bill Clinton was about to defeat Bush Sr. The core of Clinton's campaign was that Bush had neglected economic hardship at home to pursue glory abroad. It's the economy, stupid. Sachs believes that Russia was a casualty of that domestic battle. And, he says, he now sees that there was something else at work. Many of Washington's power brokers were still fighting the Cold War. They saw Russia's economic collapse as a geopolitical victory, the decisive one that ensured U.S. supremacy. I had none of that mindset, Sachs told me, sounding as he often does like a Boy Scout who has stumbled into an episode of The Sopranos. For me, it was just, great, this is the final end of this abominable regime. Now let's really help the Russians. Let's throw everything into it. I'm sure that in retrospect, in the minds of the policy planners, that was viewed as crazy. Despite his failure, Sachs does not feel that the policy toward Russia in this period was driven by free market ideology. It was mostly, he said, characterized by sheer laziness. He said he was amazed by the absence of serious research and debate in forming momentous decisions. But attributing the abandonment of Russia to a bout of collective laziness in Washington offers little by way of explanation. Perhaps a better way to understand the episode is through the lens favored by macroeconomists. Competition in the free market. When the Cold War was in full swing and the Soviet Union was intact, the people of the world could choose, at least theoretically, which ideology they wanted to consume. There were the two poles, and there was much in between. That meant capitalism had to win customers. It needed to offer incentives. It needed a good product. Keynesianism was always an expression of that need for capitalism to compete. President Roosevelt brought in the New Deal not only to address the desperation of the Great Depression, but to undercut a powerful movement of U.S. citizens who, having been dealt a savage blow by the unregulated free market, were demanding a different economic model. Some wanted a radically different one. In the 1932 presidential elections, one million Americans voted for socialist or communist candidates. It was in this context that American industrialists grudgingly accepted FDR's New Deal. The edges of the market needed to be softened with public sector jobs and by making sure no one went hungry. The very future of capitalism was at stake. During the Cold War, no country in the free world was immune to this pressure. In fact, the achievements of mid-century capitalism, or what Sachs calls normal capitalism, workers' protections, pensions, public health care and state support for the poorest citizens in North America, all grew out of the same pragmatic need to make major concessions in the face of a powerful left. The Marshall Plan was the ultimate weapon deployed on this economic front. After the war, the German economy was in crisis, threatening to bring down the rest of Western Europe. Meanwhile, so many Germans were drawn to socialism that the U.S. government opted to split Germany into two parts rather than risk losing it all, either to collapse or to the left. In West Germany, the U.S. government used the Marshall Plan to build a capitalist system that was not meant to create fast and easy new markets for Ford and Sears, but rather to be so successful on its own terms that Europe's market economy would thrive and socialism would be drained of its appeal. By 1949, that meant tolerating from the West German government all kinds of policies that were positively uncapitalist. Direct job creation by the state, huge investment in the public sector, subsidies for German firms, and strong labor unions. In a move that would have been unthinkable in Russia in the 1990s or Iraq under U.S. occupation, the U.S. government infuriated its own corporate sector 
by imposing a moratorium on foreign investment so that war-battered German companies would not be forced to compete before they had recovered. The feeling was that letting foreign companies come in at that point would have been like piracy, I was told by Carolyn Eisenberg, author of an acclaimed history of the Marshall Plan. The main difference between now and then is that the U.S. government did not see Germany as a cash cow. They didn't want to antagonize people. The belief was that if you come in and start pillaging the place, you interfere with the recovery of Europe as a whole. This approach, Eisenberg points out, was not born of altruism. The Soviet Union was like a loaded gun. The economy was in crisis. There was a substantial German left, and they, the West, had to win the allegiance of the German people fast. They really saw themselves battling for the soul of Germany. Eisenberg's account of the battle of ideologies that created the Marshall Plan shows a persistent blind spot in Sachs's work, including his recent laudable efforts to dramatically increase aid spending for Africa. Rarely are mass popular movements even mentioned. For Sachs, the making of history is a purely elite affair, a matter of getting the right technocrats settled on the right policies. As Eisenberg notes, however, the original Marshall Plan came about not out of benevolence or even reasoned argument, but fear of popular revolt. Sachs admires Keynes, but he seems uninterested in what made Keynesianism finally possible in his own country. The messy, militant demands of trade unionists and socialists whose growing strength turned a more radical solution into a credible threat, which in turn made the New Deal look like an acceptable compromise. This unwillingness to recognize the role of mass movements in pressuring reluctant governments to embrace the very ideas he advocates has had serious ramifications. For one, it meant that Sachs could not see the most glaring political reality confronting him in Russia. There was never going to be a Marshall Plan for Russia because there was only ever a Marshall Plan because of Russia. When Yeltsin abolished the Soviet Union, the loaded gun that had forced the development of the original plan was disarmed. Without it, capitalism was suddenly free to lapse into its most savage form, not just in Russia, but around the world. With the Soviet collapse, the free market now had a global monopoly which meant all the distortions that had been interfering with its perfect equilibrium were no longer required. This was the real tragedy of the promise made to the Poles and Russians, that if they followed shock therapy, they would suddenly wake up in a normal European country. Those normal European countries, with their strong social safety nets, workers' protections, powerful trade unions and socialized health care, emerged as a compromise between communism and capitalism. Now that there was no need for compromise, all those moderating social policies were under siege in Western Europe, just as they were under siege in Canada, Australia, and the U.S. Such policies were not about to be introduced in Russia, certainly not subsidized with Western funds. This liberation from all constraints is, in essence, Chicago School economics, otherwise known as neoliberalism or, in the U.S., neoconservatism. Not some new invention, but capitalism stripped of its Keynesian appendages. Capitalism in its monopoly phase, a system that has let itself go, that no longer has to work to keep us as customers, that can be as antisocial, anti-democratic, and boorish as it wants. As long as communism was a threat, the gentleman's agreement that was Keynesianism would live on. Once that system lost ground, all traces of compromise could finally be eradicated, thereby fulfilling the purest goal Friedman had set out for his movement a half-century earlier. So while Sachs saw the collapse of the Soviet Union as a liberation from authoritarian rule and was ready to roll up his sleeves and start helping, his Chicago school colleagues saw it as a freedom of a different sort, as the final liberation from Keynesianism and the do-gooder ideas of men like Jeffrey Sachs. Seen in that light, the do-nothing attitude that so infuriated Sachs when it came to Russia was not sheer laziness, but laissez-faire in action. Let it go. Do nothing. By not lifting a finger to help, all the men charged with Russia policy, from Dick Cheney as Bush Sr.'s defense secretary, to Lawrence Summers, Treasury undersecretary, 
to Stanley Fisher at the IMF, were indeed doing something. They were practicing pure Chicago school ideology, letting the market do its worst. Russia, even more than Chile, was what this ideology looked like in practice, a foreshadowing of the get-rich-or-die-trying dystopia that many of these same players would create a decade later in Iraq. Shock Therapy in the USA The Homeland Security Bubble It was a muggy Monday in Washington, and Donald Rumsfeld was about to do something he hated, talk to his staff. Since taking office as Defense Secretary, he had solidified his reputation among the Joint Chiefs of Staff as high-handed, secretive, and, a word that kept coming up, arrogant. Their animosity was understandable. Since setting foot in the Pentagon, Rumsfeld had brushed aside the prescribed role of leader and motivator and acted instead like a bloodless hatchet man, a CEO secretary on a downsizing mission. When Rumsfeld accepted the post, many wondered why he would even want it. He was 68 years old, had five grandchildren, and a personal fortune estimated at as much as $250 million dollars and he had already held the same post in the Gerald Ford administration. Rumsfeld, however, had no desire to be a traditional defense secretary, defined by the wars waged on his watch. He had greater ambitions than that. The incoming defense secretary had spent the past twenty-odd years heading up multinational corporations and sitting on their boards, often leading companies through dramatic mergers and acquisitions, as well as painful restructurings. In the 90s, he had come to see himself as a man of the new economy, directing a company specializing in digital TV, sitting on the board of another promising e-business solutions, and serving as board chairman of the very sci-fi biotech firm that held the exclusive patent on a treatment for avian flu as well as on several important AIDS medications. When Rumsfeld joined the cabinet of George W. Bush in 2001, it was with a personal mission to reinvent warfare for the 21st century, turning it into something more psychological than physical, more spectacle than struggle, and far more profitable than it had ever been before. Much has been written about Rumsfeld's controversial transformation project, which prompted eight retired generals to call for his resignation and eventually forced him to step down after the 2006 midterm elections. When Bush announced the resignation, he described the sweeping transformation project, and not the war in Iraq or the broader war on terror, as Rumsfeld's most profound contribution. Senior military officials derided transformation as empty buzzwords, and Rumsfeld often seemed determined, almost comically, to prove the critics right. The army is going through what is a major modernization, Rumsfeld said in April 2006. It's moving from a division-oriented force to a modular brigade combat team force, from service-centric warfighting to deconfliction warfighting to interoperability and now toward interdependence. That's a hard thing to do. But the project was never quite as complicated as Rumsfeld made it sound. Beneath the jargon, it was simply an attempt to bring the revolution in outsourcing and branding that he had been part of in the corporate world into the heart of the U.S. military. During the 1990s, many companies that had traditionally manufactured their own products and maintained large, stable workforces embraced what became known as the Nike model. Don't own any factories. Produce your products through an intricate web of contractors and subcontractors and pour your resources into design and marketing. Other companies opted for the alternative Microsoft model. Maintain a tight control center of shareholder employees who perform the company's core competency, and outsource everything else to temps, from running the mailroom to writing code. Some called the companies that underwent these radical restructurings hollow corporations because they were mostly form with little tangible content left over. Rumsfeld was convinced that the U.S. Department of Defense needed an equivalent makeover. There were, of course, some necessary differences. Where corporations unburdened themselves of geography-bound factories and full-time workers, Rumsfeld saw the Army 
shedding large numbers of full-time troops in favor of a small corps of staffers propped up by cheaper temporary soldiers from the Reserve and National Guard. Meanwhile, contractors from security companies such as Blackwater and Halliburton would perform duties ranging from high-risk chauffeuring to prisoner interrogation to catering to health care. And where corporations poured their savings on labor into design and marketing, Rumsfeld would spend his savings from fewer troops and tanks on the latest satellite and nanotechnology from the private sector. Not surprisingly, the generals who were used to holding sway in the Pentagon were pretty sure that things and mass still mattered when it came to fighting wars. They soon became deeply hostile to Rumsfeld's vision of a hollow military. So when Rumsfeld called the rare town hall meeting for Pentagon staff, the speculation began immediately. Was he going to announce his resignation? Was he going to try his hand at a pep talk? Was he belatedly trying to sell the old guard on transformation? As hundreds of Pentagon senior staff filed into the auditorium that Monday morning, the mood was definitely one of curiosity, one staffer told me. The feeling was, how are you going to convince us? because there was already a huge amount of animosity toward him. Rumsfeld's speech began like this. The topic today is an adversary that poses a threat, a serious threat, to the security of the United States of America. This adversary is one of the world's last bastions of central planning. It governs by dictating five-year plans. From a single capital, it attempts to impose its demands across time zones, continents, oceans, and beyond. With brutal consistency, it stifles free thought and crushes new ideas. It disrupts the defense of the United States and places the lives of men and women in uniform at risk. Perhaps this adversary sounds like the former Soviet Union, but that enemy is gone. Our foes are more subtle and implacable today. The adversary's closer to home. It's the Pentagon bureaucracy. As Rumsfeld's rhetorical gimmick revealed itself, the faces in the audience went stony. Most of the people listening had devoted their careers to fighting the Soviet Union and didn't appreciate being compared to commies at this stage in the game. Rumsfeld wasn't finished. We know the adversary. We know the threat. And with the same firmness of purpose that any effort against a determined adversary demands, we must get at it and stay at it. Today, we declare war on bureaucracy. He'd done it. The defense secretary had not only described the Pentagon as a grave threat to America, but declared war against the institution where he worked. The audience was stunned. He was saying we were the enemy, that the enemy was us. And here we were thinking we were doing the nation's business, the staffer told me. Following the corporatist principles of the counter-revolution, in which big government joins forces with big business to redistribute funds upward. Rumsfeld wanted less spent on staff and far more public money transferred directly into the coffers of private companies. And with that, Rumsfeld launched his war. Every department needed to slash its staff by 15%, including every base headquarters building in the world. It's not just the law, it's a good idea, and we're going to get it done. He had already directed his senior staff to scour the Department of Defense for functions that could be performed better and more cheaply through commercial outsourcing. He wanted to know, why is DOD one of the last organizations around that still cuts its own checks? At bases around the world, why do we pick up our own garbage and mop our own floors rather than contracting services out, as many businesses do? And surely we can outsource more computer system support. He even went after the sacred cow of the military establishment. Health care for soldiers. Why were there so many doctors? Rumsfeld wanted to know. Some of those needs, especially where they may involve general practice or specialties unrelated to combat, might be more efficiently delivered by the private sector. After the speech, plenty of Pentagon staffers griped that the only thing standing in the way of Rumsfeld's bold vision of outsourcing the army was the small matter of the U.S. Constitution, which clearly defined national security as the duty of government, not private companies. I thought the speech was going to cost Rumsfeld his job, my source told me. 
it didn't, and the coverage of his declaration of war on the Pentagon was sparse. That's because the date of his contentious address was September 10, 2001. That day, CNN Evening News on September 10 carried a short story under the headline, Defense Secretary Declares War on the Pentagon's Bureaucracy. The next morning, the network would report on an attack on that institution of a distinctly less metaphorical kind, one that killed 125 Pentagon employees and seriously wounded another 110 of the people whom Rumsfeld had portrayed as enemies of the state less than 24 hours earlier. Cheney and Rumsfeld, Proto-Disaster Capitalists By the time the Bush team took office, the privatization mania of the 80s and 90s had successfully sold off or outsourced the large, publicly owned companies in several sectors, from water and electricity to highway management and garbage collection. After these limbs of the state had been lopped off, what was left was the core, those functions so intrinsic to the concept of governing that the idea of handing them to private corporations challenged what it meant to be a nation-state. The military, police, fire departments, prisons, border control, covert intelligence, disease control, the public school system, and the administering of government bureaucracies. The earlier stages of the privatization wave had been so profitable, however, that many of the companies that had devoured the appendages of the state were greedily eyeing these essential functions as the next source of instant riches. By the late 90s, a powerful move was afoot to break the taboos protecting the core from privatization. It was, in many ways, merely a logical extension of the status quo. Just as Russia's oil fields, Latin America's telecoms, and Asia's industry had supplied the stock market with super profits in the 90s, now it would be the U.S. government itself that would play that central economic role. All the more crucial because the backlash against privatization and free trade was spreading rapidly through the developing world, closing off other avenues for growth. It was a move that brought the shock doctrine to a new self-referential phase. Until that point, disasters and crises had been harnessed to push through radical privatization plans after the fact. But the institutions that had the power both to create and respond to cataclysmic events, the military, the CIA, the Red Cross, the UN, emergency first responders, had been some of the last bastions of public control. Now, with the core set to be devoured, the crisis-exploiting methods that had been honed over the previous three decades would be used to leverage the privatization of the infrastructure of disaster creation and disaster response. Friedman's crisis theory was going postmodern. At the vanguard of the push to create what can only be described as a privatized police state were the most powerful figures in the future Bush administration, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and George W. Bush himself. For Rumsfeld, the idea of applying market logic to the U.S. military was a project that dated back four decades. It began in the early 60s, when he used to attend seminars at the University of Chicago's Economics Department. He had developed a particularly close connection with Milton Friedman, who, after Rumsfeld was elected to Congress at the age of 30, took the precocious Republican under his wing, helping him to develop a bold free market policy platform and tutoring him in economic theory. The two men remained close over the years, with Rumsfeld attending an annual birthday celebration for Friedman, organized every year by the Heritage Foundation's president, Ed Fulner. There is something about Milton that when I am around him and talking to him, I feel smarter, Rumsfeld said of his mentor when Friedman turned 90. The admiration was mutual. Friedman was so impressed with Rumsfeld's commitment to deregulated markets that he aggressively lobbied Reagan to name Rumsfeld as his running mate in the 1980 election instead of George H.W. Bush, and he never did quite forgive Reagan for disregarding his advice. Rumsfeld survived being passed over as Reagan's running mate by throwing himself into his burgeoning business career. As CEO of the international drug and chemical company Searle Pharmaceuticals, he used his political connections to secure the controversial and extraordinarily lucrative Food and Drug Administration, FDA, approval for aspartame, marketed as NutraSweet. 
And when Rumsfeld brokered the deal to sell Searle to Monsanto, he personally earned an estimated $12 million. The high-stakes sale established Rumsfeld as a corporate power player, landing him seats on the boards of such blue-chip firms as Sears and Kellogg's. His status as a former defense secretary, meanwhile, made him a score for any company that was part of what Eisenhower had called the military-industrial complex. Rumsfeld sat on the board of the aircraft manufacturer Gulfstream and was also paid $190,000 a year as a board member of ASEA Brown Bovary, ABB. The Swiss engineering giant that gained unwanted attention when it was revealed to have sold nuclear technology to North Korea, including the capacity to produce plutonium. The nuclear reactor sale went through in 2000, and at the time, Rumsfeld was the only North American on the ABB board. He claims to have no memory of the reactor sale coming before the board, though the company insists that board members were informed about the project. It was in 1997 when Rumsfeld was named chairman of the board of the biotech firm Gilead Sciences that he would firmly establish himself as a proto-disaster capitalist. The company had registered the patent for Tamiflu, a treatment for many kinds of influenza, and the preferred drug for avian flu. If there was ever an outbreak of the highly contagious virus or the threat of one, governments would be forced to buy billions of dollars' worth of the treatment from Gilead Sciences. The patenting of drugs and vaccines to treat public health emergencies remains a controversial subject. The U.S. has been epidemic-free for several decades, but when the polio outbreak was at its peak in the mid-50s, the ethics of disease profiteering were hotly debated. With close to 60,000 known cases of polio and parents terrified that their children were going to contract the crippling, often fatal disease, the search for a cure was frantic. When Jonas Salk, a scientist at the University of Pittsburgh, found it and developed the first polio vaccine in 1952, he did not patent the life-saving treatment. There is no patent. Salk told the broadcaster Edward R. Murrow, Could you patent the sun? It's safe to say that if you could patent the sun, Donald Rumsfeld would have long since put in an application with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. His former company, Gilead Sciences, which also owns the patents on four AIDS treatments, spends a great deal of energy trying to block the distribution of cheaper generic versions of its life-saving drugs in the developing world. Gilead sees epidemics as a growth market, and it has an aggressive marketing campaign to encourage businesses and individuals to stockpile Tamiflu, just in case. Before he re-entered government, Rumsfeld was so convinced that he was on to a hot new industry that he helped found several private investment funds specializing in biotechnology and pharmaceuticals. These companies are banking on an apocalyptic future of rampant disease one in which governments are forced to buy at top dollar whatever life-saving products the private sector has under patent. Dick Cheney, a protege of Rumsfeld in the Ford administration, has also built a fortune based on the profitable prospect of a grim future. Though where Rumsfeld saw a boom market in plagues, he was banking on a future of war. As Secretary of Defense under Bush Sr., Cheney scaled down the number of active troops and dramatically increased reliance on private contractors. He contracted Brown and Root, the engineering division of the Houston-based multinational Halliburton, to identify tasks being performed by U.S. troops that could be taken over by the private sector for a profit. Not surprisingly, Halliburton identified all kinds of jobs that the private sector could perform, and those findings led to a bold new Pentagon contract the Logistics Civil Augmentation Program, or LogCap. A select group of companies were invited to apply to provide unlimited logistical support for U.S. military missions, an extremely vague work description. Furthermore, no dollar value was attached to the contract. The winning company was simply assured that whatever it did for the military, it would have its costs covered by the Pentagon, plus a guaranteed profit, what is known as a Cost Plus contract. These were the final days of the Bush Senior Administration, and the company that won the contract in 1992 was none other than Halliburton. In 1995, with Clinton in the White House, 
Halliburton recruited Cheney as its new boss. Under Cheney's leadership, Halliburton's role was to expand so dramatically that it would transform the nature of modern war. Thanks to the loosely worded contract that Halliburton and Cheney had crafted when he was at the Pentagon, the company was able to stretch and expand the meaning of the term logistical support, until Halliburton was responsible for creating the entire infrastructure of a U.S. military operation overseas. All that was required of the Army was to provide the soldiers and the weapons. They were, in a way, content providers, while Halliburton ran the show. The result, first on display in the Balkans, was a kind of McMilitary experience, in which deploying abroad resembled a heavily armed and perilous package vacation. The first person to greet our soldiers as they arrive in the Balkans, and the last one to wave goodbye, is one of our employees, a Halliburton spokesperson explained, making the company's staff sound more like cruise directors than army logistics coordinators. That was the Halliburton difference. Cheney saw no reason why war shouldn't be a thriving part of America's highly profitable service economy. Invasion with a smile. In the Balkans, where Clinton deployed 19,000 soldiers, U.S. bases sprang up as many Halliburton cities. Neat, gated suburbs, built and run entirely by the company. And Halliburton was committed to providing the troops with all the comforts of home, including fast food outlets, supermarkets, movie theaters, and high-tech gyms. Some senior officers wondered what the strip mauling of the military would do to troop discipline, but they too were enjoying the perks. Everything with Halliburton was gold-plated, one told me, so we weren't complaining. As far as Halliburton was concerned, keeping the customer satisfied was good business. It guaranteed more contracts, and because profits were calculated as a percentage of costs, the higher the costs, the higher the profits. In just five years at Halliburton, Cheney almost doubled the amount of money the company extracted from the U.S. Treasury, from $1.2 billion to $2.3 billion, while the amount it received in federal loans and loan guarantees increased 15-fold. And he was well rewarded for his efforts. Before taking office as vice president, Cheney valued his net worth at between $18 million dollars and $81.9 million, including between $6 million and $30 million worth of stock in Halliburton Co. The push to expand the service economy into the heart of government was, for Cheney, a family affair. In the late 90s, while he was turning military bases into Halliburton suburbs, his wife Lynn was earning stock options, in addition to her salary as a board member at Lockheed Martin, the world's largest defense contractor. Lynn's time on the board, from 1995 to 2001, coincided with a key period of transition for companies like Lockheed. The Cold War was over, defense spending was dropping, and with nearly their entire budgets coming from government weapons contracts, these firms needed a new business model. At Lockheed and its fellow arms manufacturers, a strategy emerged to aggressively pursue a new line of work, running the government for a fee. In the mid-90s, Lockheed began taking over information technology divisions of the U.S. government, running its computer systems and a great deal of its data management. Largely under the public radar, the company went so far in this direction that in 2004, the New York Times reported, Lockheed Martin doesn't run the United States, but it does help run a breathtakingly big part of it. It sorts your mail and totals your taxes. It cuts Social Security checks and counts the United States Census. It runs space flights and monitors air traffic. To make all that happen, Lockheed writes more computer code than Microsoft. George W. Bush didn't distinguish himself as governor in too many ways, but there was one area in which he excelled, parceling out to private interests the various functions of the government he was elected to run especially security-related functions, a preview of the privatized war on terror he would soon unleash. Under his watch, the number of private prisons in Texas grew from 26 to 42, prompting the American Prospect magazine to call Bush's Texas 
the world capital of the private prison industry. In 1997, the FBI launched an investigation into a jail in Brazoria County, 40 miles outside Houston, after a local television station aired a videotape of guards kicking unresisting inmates in the groin, shooting them with stun guns, and attacking them with dogs. At least one of the violent guards in the video was wearing the uniform of Capital Correctional Resources, a private company contracted to supply guards for the prison. Bush's enthusiasm for privatization was in no way dampened by the Brazoria incident. A few weeks later, he had what appears to have been an epiphany when he met José Piñera, the Chilean minister who had privatized Social Security during the Pinochet dictatorship. This is Piñera's description of the meeting. By his concentrated focus, his body language, and his relevant questions, I knew immediately that Mr. Bush had fully understood the essence of my idea, that Social Security reform could be used both to provide a decent retirement and to create a world of worker capitalists, an ownership society. He was so enthusiastic that at the end he whispered in my ear with a smile, Go and tell all this to my little brother in Florida. He will also love it. The future president's commitment to auctioning off the state, combined with Cheney's leadership in outsourcing the military, and Rumsfeld's patenting of drugs that might prevent epidemics, provided a preview of the kind of government the three men would construct together. It was a vision of a perfectly hollow government. Though this radical program did not form the centerpiece of Bush's campaign for the presidency in 2000, there were hints of what was in store. There are hundreds of thousands of full-time federal employees that are performing tasks that could be done by companies in the private sector, Bush said in one campaign speech. I will put as many of these tasks as possible up for competitive bidding. If the private sector can do a better job, the private sector should get the contract. September 11 and the Civil Service Comeback As Bush and his cabinet took their posts in January 2001, the need for new sources of growth for U.S. corporations took on an even greater urgency. With the tech bubble now officially popped and the Dow Jones tumbling 824 points in their first two and a half months in office, they found themselves staring in the face of a serious economic downturn. Keynes had argued that governments should spend their way out of recessions, providing economic stimulus with public works. Bush's solution was for the government to deconstruct itself, hacking off great chunks of the public wealth and feeding them to corporate America in the form of tax cuts on the one hand and lucrative contracts on the other. Then came 9-11, and all of a sudden having a government whose central mission was self-immolation did not seem like a very good idea. With a frightened population wanting protection from a strong, solid government, the attacks could well have put an end to Bush's project of hollowing out government just as it was beginning. For a while, that even seemed to be the case. September 11th has changed everything, said Ed Fulner, Milton Friedman's old friend and president of the Heritage Foundation, ten days after the attack, making him one of the first to utter the fateful phrase. Many naturally assumed that part of that change would be a reevaluation of the radical anti-state agenda that Fulner and his ideological allies had been pushing for three decades, at home and around the world. After all, the nature of the September 11th security failures exposed the results of more than 20 years of chipping away at the public sector and outsourcing government functions to profit-driven corporations. Much as the flooding of New Orleans exposed the rotting state of public infrastructure, the attacks pulled back the curtain on a state that had been allowed to grow dangerously weak. Radio communications for the New York City police and firefighters broke down in the middle of the rescue operation. Air traffic controllers didn't notice the off-course planes in time, and the attackers had passed through airport security checkpoints staffed by contract workers, some of whom earned less than their counterparts at the food court. But on September 12th, putting $6 an hour contract workers in charge of airport security seemed reckless. Then, in October, envelopes with white powder were sent to lawmakers and journalists, spreading panic about the possibility of a major anthrax outbreak. Once again, 
90s privatization looked very different in this new light. Why did a private lab have the exclusive right to produce the anthrax vaccine? Had the federal government signed away its responsibility to protect the public from a major public health emergency? It didn't help that Bioport, the privatized lab in question, had failed a series of inspections and that the FDA wasn't even authorizing it to distribute its vaccines at the time. Furthermore, if it was true, as media reports kept claiming, that anthrax, smallpox, and other deadly agents could be spread through the mail, the food supply, or the water systems, was it really such a good idea to be pushing ahead with Bush's plan to privatize the Postal Service? And what about all those laid-off food and water inspectors? Could somebody bring them back? The backlash against the pro-corporate consensus only deepened in the face of new scandals like that of Enron. Three months after the 9-11 attacks, Enron declared bankruptcy, leading thousands of employees to lose their retirement savings, while executives acting on insider knowledge cashed out. The crisis contributed to a general plummeting of faith in private industry to perform essential services, especially when it came out that it was Enron's manipulation of energy prices that had led to the massive blackouts in California a few months earlier. While CEOs were falling from their pedestals, unionized public sector workers, the villains of Friedman's counter-revolution, were rapidly ascending in the public's estimation. Within two months of the attacks, trust in government was higher than it had been since 1968. The uncontested heroes of September 11th were the blue-collar first responders, the New York firefighters, police, and rescue workers, 403 of whom lost their lives as they tried to evacuate the towers and aid the victims. Suddenly, America was in love with its men and women in all kinds of uniforms, and its politicians, slapping on NYPD and FDNY baseball caps with unseemly speed, were struggling to keep up with the new mood. When Bush stood with the firefighters and rescue workers at Ground Zero on September 14th, what his advisors call the bullhorn moment, he was embracing some of the very unionized civil servants that the modern conservative movement had devoted itself to destroying. Of course, he had to do it. Even Dick Cheney put on a hard hat in those days. But he didn't have to do it so convincingly. Through some combination of genuine feeling on Bush's part and the public's projected desire for a leader worthy of the moment, these were the most moving speeches of Bush's political career. For weeks after the attacks, the president went on a grand tour of the public sector, public schools, firehouses and memorials, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, embracing and thanking civil servants for their contributions and humble patriotism. We have gained new heroes, Bush said in a speech, praising not only emergency services personnel, but teachers, postal workers, and healthcare workers. At these events, he treated work done in the public interest with a level of respect and dignity that had not been seen in the United States in four decades. Cost-cutting was suddenly off the agenda, and in every speech the president gave, he announced some ambitious new public program. The twin demands of a sagging economy and an urgent new war on terrorism have transformed the philosophical heart of President Bush's agenda, confidently declared John Harris and Dana Milbank in the Washington Post 11 days after the attacks. A man who came to power offering himself as an ideological descendant of Ronald Reagan has emerged nine months later as something closer to an heir of Franklin D. Roosevelt. They further observed that Bush is working on a large economic stimulus package to stave off recession. He said a weak economy needs its pump primed by government with a big infusion of money. A basic precept of Keynesian economics that was at the heart of FDR's New Deal. A Corporate New Deal Public pronouncements and photo ops aside, Bush and his inner circle had no intention of converting to Keynesianism. Far from shaking their determination to weaken the public sphere, the security failures of 9-11 reaffirmed their deepest ideological and self-interested beliefs that only private firms possessed the intelligence and innovation to meet the new security challenge. Although it was true that the White House was on the verge of spending huge amounts of taxpayer money to stimulate the economy, it most certainly was not going to be on the model of FDR. 
Rather, Bush's New Deal would be exclusively with corporate America, a straight-up transfer of hundreds of billions of public dollars a year into private hands. It would take the form of contracts, many offered secretively, with no competition and scarcely any oversight, to a sprawling network of industries, technology, media, communications, incarceration, engineering, education, healthcare. What happened in the period of mass disorientation after the attacks was, in retrospect, a domestic form of economic shock therapy. The Bush team, Friedmanite to the core, quickly moved to exploit the shock that gripped the nation to push through its radical vision of a hollow government in which everything from war fighting to disaster response was a for-profit venture. It was a bold evolution of shock therapy. Rather than the 90s approach of selling off existing public companies, the Bush team created a whole new framework for its actions. The War on Terror, built to be private from the start. This feat required two stages. First, the White House used the omnipresent sense of peril in the aftermath of 9-11 to dramatically increase the policing, surveillance, detention, and war-waging powers of the executive branch a power grab that the military historian Andrew Basevich has termed a rolling coup. Then those newly enhanced and richly funded functions of security, invasion, occupation, and reconstruction were immediately outsourced, handed over to the private sector to perform at a profit. Although the stated goal was fighting terrorism, the effect was the creation of the disaster capitalism complex, a full-fledged new economy in homeland security, privatized war and disaster reconstruction, tasked with nothing less than building and running a privatized security state, both at home and abroad. The economic stimulus of this sweeping initiative proved enough to pick up the slack where globalization and the dot-com booms had left off. Just as the Internet had launched the dot-com bubble, 9-11 launched the disaster capitalism bubble. It was the pinnacle of the counter-revolution launched by Friedman, for decades, the market had been feeding off the appendages of the state. Now, it would devour the core. And rather than subjecting new policies to fractious public debate in Congress or bitter conflict with public sector unions, the Bush White House could use the patriotic alignment behind the president and the free pass handed out by the press to pursue their agenda. As the New York Times observed in February 2007, Without a public debate or formal policy decision, contractors have become a virtual fourth branch of government. And so, in November 2001, just two months after the attacks, the Department of Defense brought together what it described as a small group of venture capitalist consultants with experience in the dot-com sector. The mission was to identify emerging technology solutions that directly assist in the U.S. efforts in the global war on terrorism. By early 2006, this informal exchange had become an official arm of the Pentagon, the Defense Venture Catalyst Initiative, a fully operational office that continually feeds security information to politically connected venture capitalists, who, in turn, scour the private sector for startups that can produce new surveillance and related products. According to the Bush vision, the role of government is merely to raise the money necessary to launch the new war market, then buy the best products that emerge out of that creative cauldron, encouraging a booming economy in homeland security and 21st century warfare entirely underwritten by taxpayer dollars. The Department of Homeland Security, as a brand new arm of the state created by the Bush regime, is the clearest expression of this wholly outsourced mode of government. Another is counterintelligence field activity, a new intelligence agency created under Rumsfeld that is independent of the CIA. This parallel spy agency outsources 70% of its budget to private contractors. Like the Department of Homeland Security, it was built as a hollow shell. As Ken Minahan, former director of the National Security Agency, explained, Homeland security is too important to be left to the government. Minahan, like hundreds of other Bush administration staffers, has already left his government post to work in the burgeoning homeland security industry, 
which, as a top spy, he helped create. Every aspect of the way the Bush administration has defined the parameters of the war on terror has served to maximize its profitability and sustainability as a market. From the definition of the enemy to the rules of engagement to the ever-expanding scale of the battle. The document that launched the Department of Homeland Security declares, Today's terrorists can strike at any place, at any time, and with virtually any weapon. Which conveniently means that the security services required must protect against every imaginable risk in every conceivable place at every possible time. The result has been a particular boon for the makers of various high-tech detection devices. For instance, because we can conceive of a smallpox attack, the Department of Homeland Security has handed out half a billion dollars to private companies to develop and install detection equipment to guard against this unproven threat. The war on terror is limited by neither time nor space nor target. From a military perspective, these sprawling and amorphous traits make the war an unwinnable proposition. But from an economic perspective, they make it an unbeatable one. Not a flash-in-the-pan war that could potentially be won, but a new and permanent fixture in the global economic architecture. That was the business prospectus that the Bush administration put before corporate America after September 11th. The revenue stream was a seemingly bottomless supply of tax dollars to be funneled from the Pentagon, $270 billion a year to private contractors a $137 billion increase since Bush took office. U.S. intelligence agencies, $20 billion a year to contractors for outsourced intelligence. And the newest arrival, the Department of Homeland Security. Between September 11, 2001 and 2006, the Department of Homeland Security handed out $130 billion to private contractors, money that was not in the economy before, and that is more than the GDP of Chile or the Czech Republic. In 2003, the Bush administration spent $327 billion on contracts to private companies, nearly 40 cents of every discretionary dollar. In a remarkably short time, the suburbs ringing Washington, D.C. became dotted with gray buildings housing security, startups, and incubator companies, hastily thrown together operations where, as in late 90s Silicon Valley, the money came in faster than the furniture could be assembled. The Bush administration, meanwhile, played the part of the free-spending venture capitalist of that same heady era. Whereas in the 90s the goal was to develop the killer application, the next new thing, and sell it to Microsoft or Oracle, now it was to come up with a new search-and-nail terrorist-catching technology and sell it to the Department of Homeland Security or the Pentagon. A corporatist state, removing the revolving door, putting in an archway. In the heat of the midterm elections in 2006, three weeks before announcing Donald Rumsfeld's resignation, George W. Bush signed the Defense Authorization Act in a private Oval Office ceremony. Tucked into its 1,400 pages is a rider that went almost completely unnoticed at the time. It gave the president the power to declare martial law and employ the armed forces, including the National Guard, overriding the wishes of state governors, in the event of a public emergency in order to restore public order and suppress the disorder. That emergency could be a hurricane, a mass protest, or a public health emergency, in which case the army could be used to impose quarantines and to safeguard vaccine supplies. Before this act, the president had these martial law powers only in the face of an insurrection. With his colleagues on the campaign trail, Democratic Senator Patrick Leahy was a lone voice of alarm, entering into the public record that using the military for law enforcement goes against one of the founding tenets of our democracy, and pointing out that the implications of changing the act are enormous but this change was just slipped in the defense bill as a rider with little study. Other congressional committees with jurisdiction over these matters had no chance to comment, let alone hold hearings on these proposals. In addition to the executive branch, which gained the extraordinary new powers, there was at least one other clear winner. 
the pharmaceutical industry. In the case of any kind of disease outbreak, the military can now be called in to safeguard their labs and supplies, a long-standing policy goal of the Bush administration. That was good news for Rumsfeld's former company Gilead Sciences, which owns the patent on Tamiflu, used to treat avian flu. The new law, as well as continued avian flu scares, may even have contributed to Tamiflu's stellar performance after Rumsfeld left office. In just five months, its stock price went up 24%. What role did industry interests play in shaping the specifics of the law? Similarly, and on a much wider scale, what role did the benefits to contractors such as Halliburton and Bechtel and oil companies such as ExxonMobil play in the Bush team's enthusiasm for invading and occupying Iraq? These questions of motivation are impossible to answer with any precision, because the people involved are notorious for conflating corporate interests with the national interest, to the extent that they themselves are seemingly incapable of drawing distinctions. As proto-disaster capitalists, the architects of the war on terror are part of a different breed of corporate politicians from their predecessors. When Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld conflate what is good for Lockheed, Halliburton, Carlisle, and Gilead with what is good for the United States and indeed the world, it is a form of projection with uniquely dangerous consequences. That's because what is unquestionably good for the bottom line of these companies is cataclysm. Wars, epidemics, natural disasters, and resource shortages. Which is why all their fortunes have improved dramatically since Bush took office. What makes their acts of projection even more perilous is the fact that, to an unprecedented degree, key Bush officials have maintained their interests in the disaster capitalism complex even as they have ushered in a new era of privatized war and disaster response allowing them to simultaneously profit from the disasters they help unleash. For instance, when Rumsfeld resigned his post after the Republican defeat in the 2006 midterm elections, the press reported that he was returning to the private sector. The truth was that he had never actually left. When he accepted Bush's nomination as defense secretary, Rumsfeld, like all public officials, was required to divest himself of any holdings that stood to lose or gain from decisions he might make while in office. Simple enough. That meant selling everything related to national security or defense. But Rumsfeld had a great deal of trouble. He was so weighed down with holdings in various disaster-related industries that he claimed it was impossible to disentangle himself in time to meet the deadlines, and he tied the ethics rules in knots trying to hold on to everything he could. He sold off his directly owned stocks in Lockheed, Boeing, and other defense companies, and put up to $50 million worth of stocks in a blind trust. But he still was part, or complete, owner of private investment firms that were devoted to defense and biotechnology stocks. Rumsfeld was unwilling to take losses to sell those companies quickly, and instead asked for two three-month extensions to the time limit, extremely rare at that level of government. That meant he was still looking for what he considered suitable buyers for his companies and assets, a full six months into his term as defense secretary, possibly even longer. When it came to Gilead Sciences, the company Rumsfeld used to chair and that held the patent on Tamiflu, the secretary of defense put his foot down. Asked to choose between his business interests and his public calling, he simply refused. Epidemics are national security issues, and therefore squarely within the portfolio of the defense secretary. Yet despite this glaring conflict of interest, Rumsfeld failed to sell off his Gilead stocks for his entire term in office, holding on to somewhere between $8 million and $39 million worth of Gilead holdings. As the Senate Ethics Committee tried to bring him into compliance with standard conflict rules, Rumsfeld was openly belligerent. At one point, he wrote a letter to the Office of Government Ethics complaining that he had to spend $60,000 on accountant's fees to help him with excessively complex and confusing disclosure forms. For a man bent on holding on to $95 million in shares while in office, $60,000 in finessing fees hardly seemed out of proportion. Rumsfeld's adamant refusal to stop making money from disaster while in the top security post in the country 
affected his job performance in several concrete ways. For much of his first year in office, while he looked to offload his holdings, Rumsfeld had to recuse himself from an alarming range of crucial policy decisions. According to the Associated Press, he has avoided Pentagon meetings in which AIDS is discussed. And when the federal government had to decide whether to intervene in several high-profile mergers and sales involving top defense contractors, including General Electric, Honeywell, Northrop Grumman, and Silicon Valley Graphics, Rumsfeld recused himself from those top-level talks as well. It turned out, according to his official spokesperson, that he had financial ties to all the companies mentioned. For the six years that he held office, Rumsfeld had to leave the room whenever talk turned to the possibility of avian flu treatment and the purchase of drugs for it. According to the letter outlining the arrangement that allowed him to hold on to his stocks, he had to stay out of decisions that may directly and predictably affect Gilead. His colleagues, however, took good care of his interests. In July 2005, the Pentagon purchased $58 million worth of Tamiflu, and the Department of Health and Human Services announced that it would order up to $1 billion worth of the drug a few months later. Rumsfeld's defiance definitely paid off. If he had sold his Gilead stocks at inauguration in January 2001, he would have received a mere $7.45 each. By keeping them through all the avian flu scares, all the bioterror hysteria, and through his own administration's decisions to invest heavily in the company, Rumsfeld ended up with stocks worth $67.60 each when he left office, an 807% increase. By April 2007, the price had reached $84 each. That meant that when Rumsfeld left his post as defense secretary, he did so a significantly wealthier man than when he arrived, a rare occurrence for a multimillionaire in public office. If Rumsfeld never really left Gilead behind, Cheney was equally reluctant to fully sever his ties to Halliburton, an arrangement that, unlike Rumsfeld's with Gilead, has been the subject of a great deal of media attention. Before stepping down as CEO to be George Bush's running mate, Cheney negotiated a retirement package that left him loaded with Halliburton stocks and options. After some uncomfortable press questions, he agreed to sell some of his Halliburton shares, making an impressive $18.5 million profit in the process. But he didn't cash out entirely. According to the Wall Street Journal, Cheney hung on to 189,000 Halliburton shares and 500,000 unvested options even as he entered the vice presidency. The fact that Cheney still maintains such a quantity of Halliburton shares means that throughout his term as vice president, he has collected millions every year in dividends from his stocks and has also been paid an annual deferred income by Halliburton of $211,000 roughly equivalent to his government salary. When he leaves office in 2009 and is able to cash in his Halliburton holdings, Cheney will have the opportunity to profit extravagantly from the stunning improvement in Halliburton's fortunes. The company's stock price rose from $10 before the war in Iraq to $41 three years later, a 300% jump, thanks to a combination of soaring energy prices and Iraq contracts both of which flow directly from Cheney's steering the country into war with Iraq. The revolving door between government and industry has always been there. But for the most part, political figures used to wait until their administration was out of office before cashing in on government connections. Under Bush, the non-stop homeland security market bonanza has proved too tempting for many administration officials to resist. So rather than wait until the end of their terms... Hundreds from a wide range of government agencies have already charged for the door. According to Eric Lipton, who has tracked this phenomenon in the Department of Homeland Security for the New York Times, veteran Washington lobbyists and watchdog groups say the exodus of such a sizable share of an agency's senior management before the end of an administration has few modern parallels. Lipton identified 94 examples of civil servants who had been working on domestic security and who are now working in some aspect of the homeland security industry. There are far too many such cases to detail here, but a few stand out, 
since they involve the key architects of the War on Terror. John Ashcroft, former Attorney General and prime mover behind the Patriot Act, now heads up the Ashcroft Group, specializing in helping homeland security firms procure federal contracts. Tom Ridge, the first head of the Department of Homeland Security, is now at Ridge Global and an advisor to the communication technology company Lucent, which is active in the security sector. Rudy Giuliani, the former New York mayor and hero of the September 11th response, started Giuliani Partners four months later to sell his services as a crisis consultant. Richard Clark, counterterrorism czar under Clinton and Bush and an outspoken critic of the administration, is now chairman of Good Harbor Consulting, specializing in homeland security and counterterrorism. James Woolsey, head of the CIA until 1995, is now at Paladin Capital Group, a private equity firm that invests in homeland security companies, and a vice president at Booz Allen, one of the leaders in the homeland security industry. Joe Allball, head of FEMA on September 11th, cashed out just 18 months later to start New Bridge Strategies, promising to be the bridge between business and the lucrative world of government contracts and investment opportunities in Iraq. He was replaced by Michael Brown, who bolted after only two years to start Michael D. Brown, LLC, specializing in disaster preparedness. Can I quit now? Brown wrote in an infamous email to a fellow FEMA staffer in the middle of the Hurricane Katrina disaster. That is pretty much the philosophy. Stay in government just long enough to get an impressive title in a department handing out big contracts and to collect inside information on what will sell. Then quit and sell access to your former colleagues. Public service is reduced to little more than a reconnaissance mission for future work in the disaster capitalism complex. In some ways, however, the stories about corruption and revolving doors leave a false impression. They imply that there is still a clear line between the state and the complex, when in fact, that line disappeared long ago. The innovation of the Bush years lies not in how quickly politicians move from one world to the other, but in how many feel entitled to occupy both worlds simultaneously. People like Richard Pearl and James Baker make policy, offer top-level advice, and speak in the press as disinterested experts and statesmen, when they are at the same time utterly embedded in the business of privatized war and reconstruction. They embody the ultimate fulfillment of the corporatist mission, a total merger of political and corporate elites in the name of security, with the state playing the role of chair of the business guild, as well as the largest source of business opportunities, thanks to the contract economy. The Power of the Formers One of the distinguishing features of the Bush administration has been its reliance on outside advisors and freelance envoys to perform key functions. James Baker, Paul Bremer, Henry Kissinger, George Schultz, Richard Pearl, as well as the members of the Defense Policy Board and the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq, to name few. While Congress played a rubber stamp role during the pivotal decision-making years, and Supreme Court rulings are treated as little more than gentle suggestions, these mostly volunteer advisors have wielded enormous influence. Their power stems from the fact that these advisors used to perform key roles in government. They are former secretaries of state, former ambassadors, and former undersecretaries of defense. All have been out of government for years, and in the meantime have set up lucrative careers in the disaster capitalism complex. Because they are classified as contractors and not staff, most are not subject to the same conflict of interest rules as elected or appointed politicians, if they are subject to any restrictions at all. The effect has been to eliminate the so-called revolving door between government and industry and put in an archway, as the disaster management specialist Erwin Redliner put it to me. It has allowed the disaster industries to set up shop using the reputations of such illustrious ex-politicians as cover. When in March 2006 James Baker was named co-chair of the Iraq Study Group, the advisory panel charged with recommending a new way forward in Iraq, there was palpable bipartisan relief. Here was a politician of the old school, one who had steered the country in more stable times, a grown-up. Certainly, Baker is a veteran of a less reckless era of U.S. foreign policy than the current one. 
but that was 15 years ago. Who is James Baker now? Like Cheney, when he left office at the end of Bush Sr.'s term, James Baker III made a fortune from his government contacts. Particularly lucrative were the friends he made in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait during the first Gulf War. His Houston-based law firm, Baker Botts, represents the Saudi royal family as well as Halliburton and Gazprom, Russia's largest oil company, and is one of the leading oil and gas law firms in the world. He also became an equity partner in the Carlyle Group, earning an estimated $180 million stake in the highly secretive company. Carlyle has benefited enormously from the war, thanks to sales of robotic systems, defense communication systems, and a major Iraq contract to train police awarded to its holding, USIS. The $56 billion company has a defense-oriented equity firm that specializes in collecting defense contractors and taking them public, a very profitable enterprise in recent years. It's the best 18 months we ever had, said Carlisle's chief investment officer, Bill Conway, referring to the first 18 months of the war in Iraq. We made money, and we made it fast. The war in Iraq, already clearly a disaster, translated into a record-breaking $6.6 billion payout to Carlisle's select investors. When Bush Jr. pulled Baker back into public life by naming him his special envoy on Iraq's debt, Baker did not have to cash out of the Carlisle Group or Baker Botts, despite its direct involvement in the war. At first, several commentators pointed out these serious potential conflicts. The New York Times published an editorial calling on Baker to resign his posts at the Carlyle Group and Baker Botts to preserve the integrity of the debt envoy position. Mr. Baker is far too tangled in a matrix of lucrative private business relationships that leave him looking like a potentially interested party in any debt restructuring formula, stated the editorial. It concluded that it wasn't enough for Baker to forego earnings from clients with obvious connections to Iraqi debts. To perform honorably in his new public job, Mr. Baker must give up these two private ones. In keeping with the examples set at the top of the administration, Baker simply refused. And Bush backed his decision, leaving Baker in charge of the effort of persuading governments around the world to forgive Iraq's crushing foreign debt. After he had been in the role for nearly a year, I obtained a copy of a confidential document that proved that he was in a far more serious and direct conflict of interest than previously understood. The document was a 65-page business plan submitted by a consortium of companies, including the Carlyle Group, to the government of Kuwait, one of Iraq's main creditors. The consortium offered to use its high-level political connections to collect from Iraq $27 billion in unpaid debts to Kuwait, stemming from Saddam's invasion of Kuwait. In other words, to do exactly the opposite of what Baker was supposed to be doing as envoy, which was to convince governments that Saddam-era debts should be cancelled. The document, titled Proposal to Assist the Government of Kuwait in Protecting and Realizing Claims Against Iraq, was submitted almost two months after Baker's appointment. It named James Baker personally eleven times, making it clear that Kuwait would benefit from working with the company that employed the man in charge of erasing Iraq's debts. But there was a price. In exchange for these services, the document said, the government of Kuwait would have to invest one billion dollars with the Carlyle Group. It was straight-up influence peddling. Pay Baker's company to get protection from Baker. I showed the document to Kathleen Clark, a law professor at Washington University and a leading expert on government ethics and regulations. And she said Baker was in a classic conflict of interest. Baker is on two sides of this transaction. He is supposed to be representing the interests of the United States, but he is also a senior counselor at Carlisle, and Carlisle wants to get paid to help Kuwait recover its debts from Iraq. After examining the documents, Clark determined that Carlisle and the other companies are exploiting Baker's current position to try to land a deal with Kuwait that would undermine the interests of the U.S. government. The day after my story about Baker was published in The Nation, Carlisle backed out of the consortium, forfeiting its hope of landing the $1 billion. Several months later, Baker cashed out of the Carlisle Group and resigned as general counsel.
but the real damage had been done. Baker had performed miserably as envoy, failing to secure the kind of debt forgiveness that Bush had pledged and Iraq required. In 2005 and 2006, Iraq made $2.59 billion in reparation payments for Saddam's war, most to Kuwait. Resources that were desperately needed to meet Iraq's humanitarian crisis and to rebuild the country, especially after U.S. firms pulled out with the aid money squandered and the job left undone. Baker's mandate was to erase 90 to 95 percent of Iraq's debt. Instead, the debt was merely rescheduled and is still equivalent to 99 percent of the country's GDP. Other key aspects of Iraq policy were also handed to freelance envoys, whose companies earned record profits from the war. Former Secretary of State George Shultz headed up the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq, a pressure group formed in 2002 at the request of the Bush White House to help it build the case for war in the public mind. Shultz certainly obliged. Since his role was at arm's length from the administration, he was able to whip up hysteria about the imminent danger posed by Saddam, entirely free from any burden of proof or fact. If there is a rattlesnake in the yard, you don't wait for it to strike before you take action in self-defense, he wrote in the Washington Post in September 2002 under the headline, Act Now. The danger is immediate. Saddam Hussein must be removed. Schultz did not disclose to his readers that he was, at the time, a member of the board of directors of Bechtel, where he had served many years earlier as CEO. The company would collect $2.3 billion to reconstruct the country that Schultz was so eager to see destroyed. And then there is Henry Kissinger, the man who kicked off the counter-revolution with his support for Pinochet's coup. In his 2006 book, State of Denial, Bob Woodward revealed that Dick Cheney holds monthly meetings with Kissinger, while Bush meets with Kissinger about half as frequently, making him the most regular and frequent outside advisor to Bush on foreign affairs. Cheney told Woodward, I probably talk to Henry Kissinger more than I talk to anybody else. But who was Kissinger representing in all those top-level meetings? Like Baker and Schultz, he used to be a Secretary of State, but hasn't held that post for three decades. Since 1982, when he started his privately held and secretive company, Kissinger Associates, his job has been to represent a roster of clients that is said to have included everyone from Coca-Cola to Union Carbide to Hunt Oil to the engineering giant Fleur, one of the biggest reconstruction contract winners in Iraq, and even his old partner in the Chilean covert action, ITT. So when he met with Cheney, was he acting as elder statesman? or as high-priced lobbyist for his oil and engineering clients. Kissinger gave a strong indication of where his loyalties lay in November 2002, when Bush named him to chair the 9-11 Commission, perhaps the most crucial role any patriot could be called out of retirement to perform. Yet when the families of the victims asked Kissinger to produce a list of his corporate clients, pointing to potential conflicts of interest with the investigation, he refused to cooperate with this basic gesture of public accountability and transparency. Rather than disclose the names of his clients, he stepped down as chair of the commission. The neocons take great pains to project themselves as egghead intellectuals or hawkish realists, driven by ideology and big ideas, not anything so worldly as profit. Even their most committed critics tend to portray the neocons as true believers, motivated exclusively by a belief in the supremacy of American and Israeli power that is so all-consuming they are prepared to sacrifice economic interests in favor of security. This distinction is both artificial and amnesic. The right to limitless profit-seeking has always been at the center of neocon ideology. Before September 11th, demands for radical privatization and attacks on social spending fueled the neocon movement, Friedmanite to its core, at think tanks such as the American Enterprise Institute, Heritage, and Cato. With the war on terror, the neocons didn't abandon their corporatist economic goals. They found a new, even more effective way to achieve them. Of course, these Washington hawks are committed to an imperial role for the United States in the world and for Israel in the Middle East. It is impossible, however, to separate that military project 
endless war abroad and a security state at home from the interests of the disaster capitalism complex, which has built a multi-billion dollar industry based on these very assumptions. Nowhere has the merger of these political and profit-making goals been clearer than on the battlefields of Iraq. Erasing Iraq in Search of a Model for the Middle East It was March 2004. I had been in Baghdad for less than three hours, and it wasn't going well. First, our car hadn't shown up at the airport checkpoint, and my photographer, Andrew Stern, and I had to hitch a ride on what was already being called the most dangerous road in the world. When we made it to the hotel in the busy Karada district, we were greeted by Michael Birmingham, an Irish peace activist who had moved to Baghdad before the invasion. I had asked if he could introduce me to a few Iraqis concerned about the plans to privatize their economy. No one here cares about privatization, Michael told us. What they care about is surviving. A tense debate followed about the ethics of bringing a political agenda to a war zone. Michael wasn't saying that Iraqis supported the privatization plans, only that most people had more urgent concerns. They were worried about bombs going off in their mosques, or finding a cousin who has disappeared into the U.S.-run Abu Ghraib prison. They were thinking about how to get drinking and bathing water for tomorrow, not whether a foreign company wanted to privatize their water system and sell it back to them in a year. The job of an outsider, he argued, is to try to document the reality of war and occupation, not to decide what Iraqi priorities ought to be. I defended myself as best I could, pointing out that selling this country off to Bechtel and ExxonMobil wasn't an idea I had dreamed up. It was already in its early stages, spearheaded by the White House's top envoy to Iraq, L. Paul Bremer III. For months, I had been reporting on the auctioning off of Iraq state assets, from trade shows in hotel ballrooms, sci-fi events where body armor salesmen terrified delegates with stories of severed limbs, while U.S. trade officials assured everyone that it really wasn't as bad as it seemed on TV. The best time to invest is when there is still blood on the ground, I was told earnestly by a delegate at the Rebuilding Iraq II conference in Washington, D.C. The fact that it was hard to find people in Baghdad who were interested in talking about economics was not surprising. The architects of this invasion were firm believers in the shock doctrine. They knew that while Iraqis were consumed with daily emergencies, the country could be auctioned off discreetly and the results announced as a done deal. As for journalists and activists, we seem to be exhausting our attention on the spectacular physical attacks, forgetting that the parties with the most to gain never show up on the battlefield. And in Iraq, there was plenty to gain. Not just the world's third largest proven oil reserves, but territory that was one of the last remaining holdouts from the drive to build a global market based on Friedman's vision of unfettered capitalism. After the crusade had conquered Latin America, Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia, the Arab world called out as its final frontier. While Michael and I debated back and forth, Andrew went to have a cigarette on the balcony. As he opened the glass door, all the air seemed to be sucked out of the room. Outside the window was a ball of lava-like fire, deep red flecked with black. We grabbed our shoes and ran in our socks down five flights of stairs. The lobby was covered in shattered glass. Around the corner, the Mount Lebanon Hotel lay in rubble, along with a neighboring house, destroyed by a thousand-pound bomb, making it, at that point, the largest attack of its kind since the end of the war. Andrew ran with his camera to the wreckage. I tried not to, but ended up following. After only three hours in Baghdad, I was already breaking my one rule. No bomb chasing. Back at the hotel, all the indie reporters and NGO types were drinking Arak and trying to get their adrenaline under control. Everybody kept grinning at me and saying, Welcome to Baghdad. I glanced at Michael, and we both silently acknowledged that, yes, he had won the argument. The last word came from the war itself. Bombs, not journalists, set the agenda here. And they certainly do. They don't just suck oxygen into their vortex. They demand everything. Our attention, our compassion, our outrage. That night, I thought about Claudio Acuna, the extraordinary journalist I had met in Buenos Aires two years earlier, who had given me a copy of Open Letter from a Writer to the Military Junta. 
written by the legendary Argentinian journalist Rodolfo Walsh. She had warned me that extreme violence has a way of preventing us from seeing the interests it serves. In a way, it had happened already to the anti-war movement. Our explanations for why the war was waged rarely went beyond one-word answers. Oil. Israel. Halliburton. Most of us chose to oppose the war as an act of folly by a president who mistook himself for a king, and his British sidekick who wanted to be on the winning side of history. There was little interest in the idea that war was a rational policy choice, that the architects of the invasion had unleashed ferocious violence because they could not crack open the closed economies of the Middle East by peaceful means, that the level of terror was proportional to what was at stake. The invasion of Iraq was sold to the public on the basis of fear of weapons of mass destruction, because, as Paul Wolfowitz explained, WMDs were the one issue that everyone could agree on. It was, in other words, the lowest common denominator excuse. The most rarefied reason favored by the neo-cons, the most intellectual proponents of the war, was the model theory. According to the pundits who advanced this theory, many of them identified as neo-cons, terrorism was coming from multiple locations in the Arab and Muslim world. The September 11th hijackers were from Saudi Arabia, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates, and Lebanon. Iran was funding Hezbollah. Syria was housing Hamas's leadership. Iraq was sending money to the families of Palestinian suicide bombers. For these war advocates, who conflated attacks on Israel with attacks on the U.S., as if there were no differences between the two, that was enough to qualify the entire region as a potential terrorist breeding ground. So what was it about this part of the world, they asked, that produced terrorism? Ideologically blinded from seeing either U.S. or Israeli policies as contributing factors, let alone provocations, they identified the true cause as something else, the region's deficit in free market democracy. Since the entire Arab world could not be conquered all at once, a single country needed to serve as the catalyst. The U.S. would invade that country and turn it into, as Thomas Friedman, chief media proselytizer of the theory, put it, a different model in the heart of the Arab Muslim world, one that in turn would set off a series of democratic neoliberal waves throughout the region. Within the internal logic of this theory, fighting terrorism, spreading frontier capitalism, and holding elections were bundled into a single unified project. The Middle East would be cleaned out of terrorists, and a giant free trade zone would be created. Then it would all be locked in with the after-the-fact elections, a sort of three-for-one special. George W. Bush later simplified this agenda to a single phrase, spreading freedom in a troubled region, and many mistook the sentiment as a starry-eyed commitment to democracy. But it was always that other kind of freedom, the one offered to Chile in the 70s and to Russia in the 90s, the freedom for Western multinationals to feed off freshly privatized states that was at the center of the model theory. When the idea of invading an Arab country and turning it into a model state first gained currency after September 11th, the names of several possible countries were floated. Iraq, Syria, Egypt, or, Michael Ledeen's preference, Iran. Iraq had a great deal to recommend it, however. In addition to its vast oil reserves, it also made a good central location for military bases now that Saudi Arabia looked less dependable, and Saddam's use of chemical weapons on his own people made him easy to hate. Another factor, often overlooked, was that Iraq had the advantage of familiarity. The 1991 Gulf War had been the U.S.'s last major ground offensive involving hundreds of thousands of troops, and in the 12 years since, the Pentagon had been using the battle as a template in workshops, training, and elaborate war games. One example of this post-game theory was a paper that had captured the imagination of Donald Rumsfeld called Shock and Awe, Achieving Rapid Dominance. Written by a group of maverick strategists at the National Defense University in 1996, the paper positions itself as an all-purpose military doctrine, but it is really about refighting the Gulf War. Its lead author, the retired Navy commander Harlan Ullman, explained that the project began when General Chuck Horner, 
the commander of the air war in the 1991 invasion, was asked about his greatest frustration in fighting Saddam Hussein. He replied that he did not know where to stick the needle to make the Iraqi army collapse. Shock and awe, writes Ullman, who coined the phrase, was intended to address this question. If Desert Storm could be refought, how could we win in half the time or less and with far fewer forces? The key to its success is finding the entry points for Horner's needles, the spots that, when targeted, get an enemy to collapse immediately. The authors were convinced that if the U.S. military ever got the chance to fight Saddam again, it would now be in a far better position to find those entry points, thanks to new satellite technologies and breakthroughs in precision weaponry. Iraq had another advantage. While the U.S. military was busy fantasizing about refighting Desert Storm with a technological upgrade equivalent to the difference between Atari and PlayStation, as one commander put it, Iraq's military capacity had been hurtling backward, eroded by sanctions and virtually disassembled by the United Nations Administered Weapons Inspection Program. That meant that compared with Iran or Syria, Iraq seemed the site for the most winnable war. Thomas Friedman was forthright about what it meant for Iraq to be selected as the model. We are not doing nation-building in Iraq, we are doing nation-creating, he wrote, as if shopping around for a large, oil-rich Arab nation to create from scratch was a natural, even noble thing to do in the 21st century. Friedman is among many of the one-time war advocates who has since claimed that he did not foresee the carnage that would follow from the invasion. It's hard to see how he could have missed that detail. Iraq was not an empty space on a map. It was, and remains, a culture as old as civilization, with fierce anti-imperialist pride, strong Arab nationalism, deeply held faiths, and a majority of the adult male population with military training. If nation-creating was going to happen in Iraq, what exactly was supposed to become of the nation that was already there? The unspoken assumption from the beginning was that much of it would have to disappear to clear the ground for the grand experiment, an idea that contained, at its core, the certainty of extraordinary colonialist violence. Ewan Cameron, the CIA-funded psychiatrist who had tried to de-pattern his patients by regressing them to infantile states, had believed that if a little shock was good for this purpose, more was better. He blasted brains with everything he could think of, electricity, hallucinogens, sensory deprivation, sensory overload, anything that would wipe out what was and give him a blank slate on which to imprint new thoughts, new patterns. With a far larger canvas, that was the invasion and occupation strategy for Iraq. The architects of the war surveyed the global arsenal of shock tactics and decided to go with all of them. Blitzkrieg military bombardment supplemented with elaborate psychological operations, followed up with the fastest and most sweeping political and economic shock therapy program attempted anywhere, backed up, if there was any resistance, by rounding up those who resisted and subjecting them to gloves-off abuse. Often, in the analysis of the war in Iraq, the conclusion is that the invasion was a success, but the occupation was a failure. What this assessment overlooks is that the invasion and occupation were two parts of a unified strategy. The initial bombardment was designed to erase the canvas on which the model nation could be built. Fear Up When the Canadian citizen Maher Arar was grabbed by U.S. agents at JFK Airport in 2002 and taken to Syria, a victim of extraordinary rendition, his interrogators engaged in a tried and tested interrogation technique. They put me on a chair, and one of the men started asking me questions. If I did not answer quickly enough, he would point to a metal chair in the corner and ask, Do you want me to use this? I was terrified, and I did not want to be tortured. I would say anything to avoid torture. The technique Arar was being subjected to is known as the showing of the instruments, or, in U.S. military lingo, fear up. Torturers know that one of their most potent weapons is the prisoner's own imagination. Often just showing fearsome instruments is more effective than using them. As the day of the invasion of Iraq drew closer, U.S. news media outlets were conscripted by the Pentagon to fear up Iraq. They're calling it 
A-Day began a report on CBS News that aired two months before the war began. A as in airstrikes so devastating they would leave Saddam's soldiers unable or unwilling to fight. Viewers were introduced to Harlan Ullman, a shock and awe author, who explained that you have this simultaneous effect, rather like the nuclear weapons at Hiroshima, not taking days or weeks, but in minutes. The anchor, Dan Rather, ended the telecast with a disclaimer. We assure you this report contains no information that the Defense Department thinks could help the Iraqi military. He could have gone further. The report, like so many others in this period, was an integral part of the Department of Defense's strategy. Fear up. Iraqis, who picked up the terrifying reports on contraband satellites or in phone calls from relatives abroad, spent months imagining the horrors of shock and awe. The phrase itself became a potent psychological weapon. Would it be worse than 1991? If the Americans really thought Saddam had WMDs, would they launch a nuclear attack? One answer was provided a week before the invasion. The Pentagon invited Washington's military press corps on a special field trip to Eglin Air Force Base in Florida to witness the testing of the MOAB, which officially stands for Massive Ordnance Air Blast, but which everyone in the military calls the mother of all bombs. At 21,000 pounds, it is the largest non-nuclear explosive ever built, able to create, in the words of CNN's Jamie McIntyre, a 10,000-foot-high mushroom-like cloud that looks and feels like a nuclear weapon. In his report, McIntyre said that even if it was never used, the bomb's very existence could still pack a psychological wallop, a tacit acknowledgement of the role he himself was playing in delivering that wallop. Like prisoners in interrogation cells, Iraqis were being shown the instruments. The goal is to have the capabilities of the coalition so clear and so obvious that there is an enormous disincentive for the Iraqi military to fight, Rumsfeld explained on the same program. When the war began... The residents of Baghdad were subjected to sensory deprivation on a mass scale. One by one, the city's sensory inputs were cut off. The ears were the first to go. On the night of March 28, 2003, as U.S. troops drew closer to Baghdad, the Ministry of Communication was bombed and set ablaze, as were four Baghdad telephone exchanges with massive bunker busters cutting off millions of phones across the city. The targeting of the phone exchanges continued, 12 in total, until by April 2nd, there was barely a phone working in all of Baghdad. During the same assault, television and radio transmitters were also hit, making it impossible for families in Baghdad, huddling in their homes, to pick up even a weak signal carrying news of what was going on outside their doors. Many Iraqis say that the shredding of their phone system was the most psychologically wrenching part of the air attack. The combination of hearing and feeling bombs going off everywhere while being unable to call a few blocks away to find out if loved ones were alive or to reassure terrified relatives living abroad was pure torment. Journalists based in Baghdad were swarmed by desperate local residents begging for a few moments with their satellite phones or pressing numbers into the reporter's hands along with the pleas to call a brother or an uncle in London or Baltimore. Tell him everything is okay. Tell him his mother and father are fine. Tell him hello. Tell him not to worry. By then, most drugstores in Baghdad had sold out of sleeping aids and antidepressants, and the city was completely cleaned out of Valium. Next to go were the eyes. There was no audible explosion, no discernible change in the early evening bombardments, but in an instant, an entire city of five million people was plunged into an awful, endless night the Guardian reported on April 4th. Darkness was relieved only by the headlights of passing cars. Trapped in their homes, Baghdad's residents could not speak to each other, hear each other, or see outside. Like a prisoner destined for a CIA black site, the entire city was shackled and hooded. Next, it was stripped. Comfort Items in hostile interrogations, the first stage of breaking down prisoners is stripping them of their own clothes and any items that have the power to evoke their sense of self, so-called comfort items. 
often objects that are of particular value to a prisoner, like the Koran or a cherished photograph, are treated with open disrespect. The message is, you are no one, you are who we want you to be. The essence of dehumanization. Iraqis went through this unmaking process collectively, as they watched their most important institutions desecrated, their history loaded onto trucks and disappeared. The bombing badly injured Iraq, but it was the looting, unchecked by occupying troops, that did the most to erase the heart of the country that was. The hundreds of looters who smashed ancient ceramics, stripped display cases, and pocketed gold and other antiquities from the National Museum of Iraq pillaged nothing less than records of the first human society, reported the Los Angeles Times. Gone are 80% of the museum's 170,000 priceless objects. The National Library, which contained copies of every book and doctoral thesis ever published in Iraq, was a blackened ruin. Thousand-year-old illuminated Korans had disappeared from the Ministry of Religious Affairs, which was left a burned-out shell. Our national heritage is lost, pronounced a Baghdad high school teacher. A local merchant said of the museum, It was the soul of Iraq. If the museum doesn't recover the looted treasures, I will feel like a part of my own soul has been stolen. McGuire Gibson, an archaeologist at the University of Chicago, called it a lot like a lobotomy, the deep memory of an entire culture, a culture that has continued for thousands of years, has been removed. Thanks mostly to the efforts of clerics who organized salvage missions in the midst of the looting, a portion of the artifacts has been recovered, but many Iraqis were, and still are, convinced that the memory lobotomy was intentional. Part of Washington's plans to excise the strong, rooted nation that was, and replace it with their own model. Baghdad is the mother of Arab culture, 70-year-old Ahmed Abdullah told the Washington Post, and they want to wipe out our culture. As the war planners were quick to point out, the looting was done by Iraqis, not foreign troops, and it's true that Rumsfeld did not plan for Iraq to be sacked, but he did not take measures to prevent it from happening either, or to stop it once it had begun. These were failures that cannot be dismissed as mere oversights. During the 1991 Gulf War, 13 Iraqi museums were attacked by looters, so there was every reason to believe that poverty, anger at the old regime, and the general atmosphere of chaos would prompt some Iraqis to respond in the same way, especially given that Saddam had emptied the prisons several months earlier. The Pentagon had been warned by leading archaeologists that it needed to have an airtight strategy to protect museums and libraries before any attack and a March 26th Pentagon memo to Coalition Command listed, in order of importance, 16 sites that were crucial to protect in Baghdad. Second on the list was the museum. Other warnings had urged Rumsfeld to send an international police contingent in with the troops to maintain public order, another suggestion that was ignored. Even without the police, however, there were enough U.S. soldiers in Baghdad for a few to be dispatched to the key cultural sites, but they weren't sent. There are numerous reports of U.S. soldiers hanging out by their armored vehicles and watching as trucks loaded with loot drove by. A reflection of the stuff-happens indifference coming straight from Rumsfeld. Some units took it upon themselves to stop the looting, but in other instances, soldiers joined in. The Baghdad International Airport was completely trashed by soldiers who, according to time, smashed furniture and then moved on to the commercial jets on the runway. U.S. soldiers looking for comfortable seats and souvenirs ripped out many of the plane's fittings, slashed seats, damaged cockpit equipment, and popped out every windshield. The result was an estimated $100 million worth of damage to Iraq's national airline, which was one of the first assets to be put on the auction block in an early and contentious partial privatization. Some insight into why there was so little official interest in stopping the looting has since been provided by two men who played pivotal roles in the occupation, Peter McPherson, the senior economic advisor to Paul Bremer, and John Agresto, director of higher education reconstruction for the occupation. McPherson said that when he saw Iraqis taking state property, cars, buses, ministry equipment, it didn't bother him. His job, as Iraq's top economic shock therapist, was to radically downsize the state and privatize its assets 
which meant that the looters were really just giving him a jump start. I thought the privatization that occurs sort of naturally when somebody took over their state vehicle or began to drive a truck that the state used to own was just fine, he said. A veteran bureaucrat of the Reagan administration and a firm believer in Chicago school economics, McPherson termed the pillage a form of public sector shrinkage. His colleague, John Agresto, also saw a silver lining as he watched the looting of Baghdad on TV. He envisioned his job, a never-to-be-repeated adventure, as the remaking of Iraq's education system from scratch. In that context, the stripping of the universities and the education ministry was, he explained, the opportunity for a clean start, a chance to give Iraq schools the best modern equipment. If the mission was nation-creating, as so many clearly believed it to be, then everything that remained of the old country was only going to get in the way. Agresto was the former president of St. John's College in New Mexico, which specializes in a great books curriculum. He explained that although he knew nothing of Iraq, he had refrained from reading books about the country before making the trip so that he would arrive with as open a mind as I could have. Like Iraq's schools, Agresto would be a blank slate. If Agresto had read a book or two, he might have thought twice about the need to erase everything and start over. He could have learned, for instance, that before the sanctions strangled the country, Iraq had the best education system in the region, with the highest literacy rates in the Arab world. In 1985, 89% of Iraqis were literate. By contrast, in Agresto's home state of New Mexico, 46% of the population is functionally illiterate and 20% are unable to do basic math to determine the total on a sales receipt. Yet Agresto was so convinced of the superiority of American systems that he seemed unable to entertain the possibility that Iraqis might want to salvage and protect their own culture and that they might feel its destruction as a wrenching loss. Paul Bremer, appointed by Bush to serve as director of the occupation authority in Iraq, admits that when he first arrived in Baghdad, the looting was still going strong and order was far from restored. Baghdad was on fire, literally, as I drove in from the airport. There was no traffic on the streets, there was no electricity anywhere, no oil production, no economic activity. There wasn't a single policeman on duty anywhere. And yet his solution to this crisis was to immediately fling open the country's borders to absolutely unrestricted imports. No tariffs, no duties, no inspections, no taxes. Iraq, Bremer declared two weeks after he arrived, was open for business. Overnight, Iraq went from being one of the most isolated countries in the world, sealed off from the most basic trade by strict UN sanctions, to becoming the widest open market anywhere. While the pickup trucks stuffed with loot were still being driven to buyers in Jordan, Syria, and Iran, passing them in the opposite direction were convoys of flatbeds piled high with Chinese TVs, Hollywood DVDs, and Jordanian satellite dishes, ready to be unloaded on the sidewalks of Baghdad's Karada district. Just as one culture was being burned and stripped for parts, another was pouring in, prepackaged, to replace it. One of the U.S. businesses ready and waiting to be the gateway to this experiment in frontier capitalism was New Bridge Strategies, started by Joe Albaugh, Bush's ex-head of FEMA. It promised to use its top-level political connections to help U.S. multinationals land a piece of the action in Iraq. Getting the rights to distribute Procter & Gamble products would be a gold mine, one of the company's partners enthused. One well-stocked 7-Eleven could knock out 30 Iraqi stores, a Walmart could take over the country. Iraq was going to be bought off with Pringles and pop culture. That, at least, was the Bush administration's idea of a post-war plan. Ideological blowback. A very capitalist disaster. When Bremer started issuing legal decrees in Baghdad, Joseph Stiglitz, the former World Bank chief economist, warned that Iraq was getting an even more radical form of shock therapy than pursued in the former Soviet world. That was quite true. In the original Washington plan, Iraq was going to become a frontier just as Russia had been in the early 90s. But this time, it would be U.S. firms, not local ones or European, 
Russian or Chinese competitors, that would be the first in line for the easy billions. And in Iraq, Washington cut out the middlemen. The IMF and the World Bank were relegated to supporting roles, and the U.S. was front and center. Paul Bremer was the government. As a top U.S. military official told the Associated Press, there was no point in negotiating with the local government because, at this point, we'd be negotiating with ourselves. The proponents of this model theory now claim that this was where the war went horribly wrong. As Richard Pearl said in late 2006, the seminal mistake was bringing Bremer in. Bush speechwriter and neocon David Frum concurred, saying they should have had any kind of an Iraqi face on the remaking of Iraq right away. Instead, they had Paul Bremer, ensconced in Saddam's turquoise-domed Republican palace, receiving trade and investment laws by email from the Department of Defense, printing them out, signing them, and imposing them by fiat on the Iraqi people. Bremer was no quiet American, maneuvering and manipulating behind the scenes. With his movie-of-the-week looks and his fondness for news crews, he seemed intent on flaunting his absolute power over Iraqis, crisscrossing the country in a flashy Black Hawk helicopter flanked by G.I. Joe private security guards from Blackwater, and always in his trademark uniform, immaculately pressed Brooks Brothers suits and beige Timberland boots. The boots were a going-to-bag-dad present from his son. Go kick some butt, dad, the card had said. By his own admission, Bremer knew little of Iraq. I had lived in Afghanistan, he told one interviewer. That ignorance hardly mattered, however, because if there was one thing Bremer knew a great deal about, it was the central mission in Iraq. Disaster. Capitalism. On September 11, 2001, he had been working as managing director and senior political advisor at the insurance giant Marsh & McLennan. The company had its offices in the North Tower of the World Trade Center and was devastated by the attacks. In the first few days, 700 of its workers were unaccounted for. In the end, 295 were confirmed dead. Exactly one month later, on October 11, 2001, Paul Bremer launched Crisis Consulting Practice, a new division of Marsh specializing in helping multinational corporations prepare for possible terrorist attacks and other crises. Advertising his experience as an ambassador at large for counterterrorism under the Reagan administration, Bremer and his company offered clients comprehensive counterterrorism services, from political risk insurance to public relations and even advice on what to stockpile. Bremer's vanguard participation in the homeland security industry was ideal preparation for Iraq. That's because the Bush administration used the same formula to rebuild Iraq that it had pioneered to respond to 9-11. It treated post-war Iraq as if it was an exciting IPO, brimming with freewheeling, quick-profit potential. So while Bremer may have stepped on plenty of toes, his mission never was to win Iraqi hearts and minds. Rather, it was to get the country ready for the launch of Iraq, Inc. Seen in that light, his early, much maligned decisions have an unmistakable logical coherence. Bremer spent his first four months in Iraq almost exclusively focused on economic transformation, passing a series of laws that together make up a classic Chicago school shock therapy program. Before the invasion, Iraq's economy had been anchored by its national oil company and by 200 state-owned companies, which produced the staples of the Iraqi diet and the raw materials of its industry, everything from cement to paper and cooking oil. The month after he arrived in his new job, Bremer announced that the 200 firms were going to be privatized immediately. Getting inefficient state enterprises into private hands, Bremer said, is essential for Iraq's economic recovery. Next came the new economic laws. To entice foreign investors to take part in the privatization auction, and to build new factories and retail outlets in Iraq, Bremer enacted a radical set of laws described by The Economist in glowing terms as the wish list that foreign investors and donor agencies dream of for developing markets. One law lowered Iraq's corporate tax rate from roughly 45% to a flat 15%, straight out of the Milton Friedman playbook. Another allowed foreign companies to own 100% of Iraqi assets preventing a repeat of Russia, where the prizes went to the local oligarchs. Even better, 
investors could take 100% of the profits they made in Iraq out of the country. They would not be required to reinvest, and they would not be taxed. The decree also stipulated that investors could sign leases and contracts that would last for 40 years and then be eligible for renewal, which meant that future elected governments would be saddled with deals signed by their occupiers. The one area on which Washington held back was oil. Its Iraqi advisors warned that any move to privatize the state oil company or to lay claim to untapped reserves before an Iraqi government was in place would be seen as an act of war. But the occupation authority did take possession of $20 billion worth of revenues from Iraq's national oil company to spend as it wished. The White House was so focused on unveiling a shiny new Iraqi economy that it decided, in the early days of the occupation, to launch a brand new currency, a massive logistical undertaking. The UK firm Delarue did the printing, and bills were delivered in fleets of planes and distributed in armored vehicles and trucks that ran at least a thousand missions throughout the country, at a time when 50% of the people still lacked drinking water, the traffic lights weren't working, and crime was rampant. Testifying before a Senate committee, Rumsfeld described Bremer's sweeping reforms as creating some of the most enlightened and inviting tax and investment laws in the free world. At first, investors seemed to appreciate the effort. Within a few months, there was talk of a McDonald's opening in downtown Baghdad, the ultimate symbol of Iraq joining the global economy. Funding was almost in place for a Starwood luxury hotel, and General Motors was planning to build an auto plant. On the financial side, HSBC, the international bank headquartered in London, was awarded a contract to open branches all over Iraq, while Citigroup announced plans to offer substantial loans guaranteed against future sales of Iraqi oil. The oil majors, Shell, BP, ExxonMobil, Chevron, and Russia's Lukoil, made tentative approaches, signing agreements to train Iraqi civil servants in the latest extraction technologies and management models, confident that their time would soon arrive. Bremer's laws, designed to create the conditions for an investor frenzy, were not exactly original. They were merely an accelerated version of what had been implemented in previous shock therapy experiments. Where the Iraq experiment entered bold new terrain was that it transformed the invasion, occupation, and reconstruction into an exciting, fully privatized new market. This market was created, just as the Homeland Security Complex was, with a huge pot of public money. For reconstruction alone, the boom was kicked off with $38 billion from the U.S. Congress, $15 billion from other countries, and $20 billion of Iraq's own oil money. When the initial billions were announced, there were inevitably laudatory comparisons with the Marshall Plan. Bush invited the parallels, declaring the Reconstruction the greatest financial commitment of its kind since the Marshall Plan, and stating in a televised address in the early months of the occupation that America has done this kind of work before. Following World War II, we lifted up the defeated nations of Japan and Germany and stood with them as they built representative governments. What happened to the billions earmarked for Iraq's reconstruction, however, bore no relationship to the history Bush invoked. Under the original Marshall Plan, American firms benefited by sending equipment and food to Europe, but the explicit goal was to help war-torn economies recover as self-sufficient markets, creating local jobs and developing tax bases capable of funding domestic social services, the results of which are in evidence in Germany's and Japan's mixed economies today. The Bush cabinet had in fact launched an anti-Marshall plan, its mirror opposite in nearly every conceivable way. It was a plan guaranteed from the start to further undermine Iraq's badly weakened industrial sector and to send Iraqi unemployment soaring. Where the post-Second World War plan had barred foreign firms from investing to avoid the perception that they were taking advantage of countries in a weakened state, this scheme did everything possible to entice corporate America, with a few bones tossed to corporations based in countries that joined the Coalition of the Willing. It was this theft of Iraq's reconstruction funds from Iraqis, justified by unquestioned racist assumptions about U.S. superiority and Iraqi inferiority, that doomed the project from the start. Iraqis had virtually no role in this plan at all, 
Instead, the U.S. federal government contracts, most of them issued by U.S. aid, commissioned a kind of country in a box, designed in Virginia and Texas, to be assembled in Iraq. Even Iraqis' low-wage labor wasn't required for the assembly process because the major U.S. contractors, such as Halliburton, Bechtel, and the California-based engineering giant Parsons, preferred to import foreign workers whom they felt confident they could control. Once again, Iraqis were cast in the role of awed spectators. First awed by U.S. military technology, and then by its engineering and management prowess. The Bush cabinet was using Iraq's reconstruction, over which it had complete control, in contrast to the federal bureaucracy back home, to implement its radical vision of a fully outsourced, hollow government. In Iraq, there was not a single governmental function that was considered so core that it could not be handed to a contractor, preferably one who provided the Republican Party with financial contributions or Christian foot soldiers during election campaigns. The usual Bush motto governed all aspects of the foreign forces' involvement in Iraq. If a task could be performed by a private entity, it must be. Meanwhile, the model pioneered by Cheney for Halliburton in the Balkans, where bases were transformed into many Halliburton towns, was adopted on a vastly larger scale. In addition to Halliburton's construction and management of military bases across the country, the Green Zone was, from the start, a Halliburton-run city-state with the company in charge of everything from road maintenance to pest control to movie and disco nights. Even the job of building local democracy was privatized, given to the North Carolina-based Research Triangle Institute in a contract worth up to $466 million, though it's not at all clear what qualified RTI to bring democracy to a Muslim country. The leadership of the company's Iraq operation was dominated by high-level Mormons, people like James Mayfield, who told his mission back in Houston that he thought Muslims could be persuaded to embrace the Book of Mormon as compatible with the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. In an email home, he imagined that Iraqis would erect a statue to him as their founder of democracy. As these foreign corporations descended on the country, the machinery in Iraq's 200 state firms stood still, frozen by chronic power blackouts. Iraq once had one of the most sophisticated industrial economies in the region. Now its largest firms couldn't even get a sub-sub-subcontract in their own country's reconstruction. To participate in the gold rush at all, Iraqi firms would have needed emergency generators and some basic repairs, which would not have been insurmountable, given Halliburton's speed in building military bases that look like Midwestern suburbs. Mohammed Tofik at the industry ministry told me he had made repeated requests for generators, pointing out that Iraq's 17 state-owned cement factories were perfectly positioned both to supply the reconstruction effort with building materials and to put tens of thousands of Iraqis to work. The factories received nothing. No contracts, no generators, no help. American companies preferred to import their cement, like their workforce, from abroad, at up to ten times the price. One of Bremer's economic edicts specifically prohibited Iraq's central bank from offering financing to state-owned enterprises, a fact not reported until years later. The reason for this effective boycott of Iraqi industry was not practical, Tofik told me, but ideological. Among those making the decisions, he said, no one believes in the public sector. While private Iraqi firms closed in droves, unable to compete with imports streaming across the open borders, Bremer's staff had few comforting words to offer. Addressing a gathering of Iraqi businessmen, Michael Fleischer, one of Bremer's deputies, confirmed that many of their businesses would indeed fail in the face of foreign competition. But that was the beauty of the free market. Will you be overwhelmed by foreign businesses? he asked rhetorically. The answer depends on you. Only the best of you will survive. He sounded like Igor Gaidar, who reportedly said of small Russian businesses going under as a result of shock therapy, So what? One who is dying deserves to die. As is now well known, nothing about Bush's anti-martial plan went as intended. Iraqis did not see the corporate reconstruction as a gift. Most saw it as a modernized form of pillage, and U.S. corporations didn't wow anyone with their speed and efficiency. Instead, they have managed to turn the word reconstruction into 
as one Iraqi engineer put it, a joke that nobody laughs at. Each miscalculation provoked escalating levels of resistance, answered with counter-repression by foreign troops, ultimately sending the country spiraling into an inferno of violence. As of July 2006, according to the most credible study, the war in Iraq has taken the lives of 655,000 Iraqis who would not have died had there been no invasion or occupation. Iraq's current state of disaster cannot be reduced either to the incompetence or cronyism of the Bush White House, or to the sectarianism or tribalism of Iraqis, as is often suggested in the press. It is a very capitalist disaster, a nightmare of unfettered greed unleashed in the wake of war. The fiasco of Iraq is one created by a careful and faithful application of unrestrained Chicago school ideology. The most widely recognized case of blowback ideology, boomeranging on the people who unleashed it, was provoked by Bremer's first major act, the firing of approximately 500,000 state workers, most of them soldiers, but also doctors, nurses, teachers, and engineers. Debathification, as it was called, was supposedly driven by a desire to clean out the government of Saddam loyalists. No doubt that was part of the motivation, but it does not explain the scale of the layoffs or how deeply they savaged the public sector as a whole, punishing workers who were not high-level officials. The purge resembled similar attacks on the public sector that have accompanied shock therapy programs ever since Milton Friedman advised Pinochet to slash government spending by 25%. Bremer made no secret of his antipathy for Iraq's Stalinist economy, as he described the country's state-run companies and large ministries and he had no appreciation for the specialized skills and the years of accumulated knowledge possessed by Iraq's engineers, doctors, electricians, and road builders. That ideological blindness had three concrete effects. It damaged the possibility of reconstruction by removing skilled people from their posts, it weakened the voice of secular Iraqis, and it fed the resistance with angry people. Dozens of senior U.S. military and intelligence officers have acknowledged that many of the 400,000 soldiers Bremer laid off went straight to the emerging resistance. As Marine Colonel Thomas Hams put it, now you have a couple hundred thousand people who are armed because they took their weapons home with them, who know how to use the weapons, who have no future, who have a reason to be angry at you. At the same time, Bremer's classic Chicago school decision to fling open the borders to unrestricted imports while allowing foreign companies to own 100% of Iraqi assets infuriated Iraq's business class. Many responded by funding the resistance with what little revenue they had left. On a tour of the factory complex in a Baghdad suburb, I met Mahmoud, a confident 25-year-old with a neat beard. He said that when he and his fellow workers heard about the plans to sell their workplace six months into the U.S. occupation, they were shocked. If the private sector buys our company, the first thing they would do is reduce the staff to make more money, and we will be forced into a very hard destiny because the factory is our only way of living. Frightened by this prospect, a group of 17 workers, including Mahmoud, went to confront one of the managers in his office. A fight broke out. One worker struck a manager, and the manager's bodyguard fired at the workers, who then turned on him. He spent a month in hospital. A couple of months later, there was even more violence. The manager and his son were shot and badly injured on their way to work. At the end of our meeting, I asked Mahmoud what would happen if the plant was sold despite their objections. There are two choices, he said, smiling kindly. Either we will set the factory on fire and let the flames devour it to the ground, or we will blow ourselves up inside it. But it will not be privatized. It was an early warning, one of many, that the Bush team had definitely overestimated its ability to shock Iraqis into submission. There was another obstacle to Washington's privatization dreams. The free market fundamentalism that shaped the structure of the occupation itself. Thanks to their rejections of all things statist, the occupation authority running out of the green zone was far too understaffed and under-resourced to pull off its own ambitious plans, especially in the face of the kind of hardcore resistance expressed by workers like Mahmoud. 
As the Washington Post's Rajiv Chandrasekharan revealed, the Coalition Provisional Authority was such a skeletal organization that it had just three people assigned to the enormous task of privatizing Iraq's state-owned factories. Don't bother starting, the three lonely staffers were counseled by a delegation from East Germany, which, when it sold off its state assets, had assigned 8,000 people to the project. In short, the CPA was itself too privatized to privatize Iraq. The problem wasn't just that the CPA was understaffed. It was also that it was staffed by people who lacked the baseline belief in the public sphere that is required for the complex task of reconstructing a state from the ground up. As the political scientist Michael Wolff puts it, conservatives cannot govern well for the same reason that vegetarians cannot prepare a world-class bœuf bourguignon. If you believe that what you are called upon to do is wrong, you are unlikely to do it very well. If within six months of the invasion, Iraqis had found themselves drinking clean water from Bechtel pipes, their homes illuminated by GE lights, their infirm treated in sanitary Parsons-built hospitals, their streets patrolled by competent DynCorp-trained police, many citizens, though not all, would probably have overcome their anger at being excluded from the reconstruction process. But none of this happened, and well before Iraqi resistance forces began systematically targeting reconstruction sites, it was clear that applying laissez-faire principles to such a huge government task had been a disaster. Freed of all regulations, largely protected from criminal prosecution, and on contracts that guaranteed their costs would be covered, plus a profit, Many foreign corporations did something entirely predictable. They scammed wildly. Known in Iraq as the Primes, the big contractors engaged in elaborate subcontracting schemes. They set up offices in the Green Zone, or even Kuwait City and Amman, then subcontracted to Kuwaiti companies, who subcontracted to Saudis, who, when the security situation got too rough, finally subcontracted to Iraqi firms often from Kurdistan, for a fraction of what the contracts were worth. The Democratic Senator Byron Dorgan described this web, using an air conditioning contract in Baghdad as an example. The contract goes to a subcontractor, which goes to another subcontractor, and a fourth-level subcontractor. And the payment for air conditioning turns out to be payments to four contractors, the fourth of which puts a fan in a room. Yes, the American taxpayer paid for an air conditioner, and after the money goes through four hands like ice cubes travel around the room, there is a fan put in a room in Iraq. More to the point, all this time Iraqis watched their aid money stolen as their country boiled. When Bechtel packed up and left Iraq in November 2006, it blamed the overlay of violence for its inability to fulfill its projects. But the contractor failure began well before the armed resistance in Iraq built up steam. The first schools that Bechtel reconstructed drew complaints immediately. In early April 2004, before Iraq had spiraled into violence, I visited the Baghdad Central Children's Hospital. It had supposedly been rebuilt by a different U.S. contractor. But there was raw sewage in the hallways. None of the toilets worked. And the men trying to fix the mess were so poor that they didn't have shoes. They were sub, sub, sub contractors, like the women who sew piecework at their kitchen tables for a Walmart contractor's contractor's contractor. The scamming continued for three and a half years until all the major U.S. reconstruction contractors pulled out of Iraq, their billions spent, the bulk of the work still undone. Parsons was handed $186 million to build 142 health clinics. Only six were ever completed. Even the projects held up as reconstruction success stories have been called into question. In April 2007, U.S. inspectors in Iraq looked into eight projects completed by U.S. contractors, including a maternity hospital and a water purification system, only to find that seven were no longer operating as designed, according to the New York Times. The paper also reported that Iraq's power grid was producing significantly less electricity in 2007 than it did in 2006. As of December 2006, when all the main reconstruction contracts were ending, 
the Inspector General's office was investigating 87 cases of possible fraud relating to U.S. contractors in Iraq. Corruption during the occupation was not the result of poor management, but of a policy decision. If Iraq was to be the next frontier for Wild West capitalism, it needed to be, as the ex cpa -er turned whistleblower Frank Willis put it, a free fraud zone. Bremer's CPA would not try to stop the various scams, side deals, and shell games because the CPA was itself a shell game. Though it was billed as the U.S. Occupation Authority, it's unclear that it held that distinction in anything other than name. This point was forcefully made by a judge in the infamous Custer Battles corruption case. Two former employees of the security firm launched a whistleblower lawsuit against the company, accusing it of cheating on reconstruction-related contracts with the CPA and defrauding the U.S. government of millions of dollars, mostly for work done at the Baghdad International Airport. The case was based on documents produced by the company that clearly showed it was keeping two sets of numbers one for itself, one for invoicing the CPA. Retired Brigadier General Hugh Tant testified that the fraud was probably the worst I've ever seen in my 30 years in the Army. Among Custer Battle's many alleged violations, it is said to have appropriated Iraqi-owned forklifts from the airport, repainted them, and billed the CPA for the cost of leasing the machines. In March 2006, a federal jury in Virginia ruled against the company, finding it guilty of fraud, and forced it to pay $10 million in damages. The company then asked the judge to overturn the verdict with a revealing defense. It claimed that the CPA was not part of the U.S. government and therefore not subject to its laws, including the False Claims Act. The implications of this defense were enormous. The Bush administration had indemnified U.S. corporations working in Iraq from any liability under Iraqi laws. If the CPA wasn't subject to U.S. law either, it meant that the contractors weren't subject to any law at all, U.S. or Iraqi. This time, the judge ruled in the company's favor. He said there was plenty of evidence that Custer Battles had submitted to the CPA false and fraudulently inflated invoices but he ruled that the plaintiffs had failed to prove that the claims were presented to the United States. In other words, the U.S. government presence in Iraq during the first year of its economic experiment had been a mirage. There had been no government, just a funnel to get U.S. taxpayer and Iraqi oil dollars to foreign corporations, completely outside the law. In this way, Iraq represented the most extreme expression of the anti-state counter-revolution a hollow state, where, as the courts finally established, there was no there, there. After handing out its billions to contractors, the CPA melted away. Its former staffers returned to the private sector, and when the scandals hit, there was no one left to defend the Green Zone's dismal record. But in Iraq, the missing billions were keenly felt. The situation now is much worse and it seems not to be improving despite the huge contracts signed with American companies, remarked an engineer with the Ministry of Electricity the week after Bechtel announced its departure from Iraq. It is strange how billions of dollars spent on electricity brought no improvement whatsoever, but in fact worsened the situation. A taxi driver in Mosul asked, What reconstruction? Today we are drinking untreated water from a plant built decades ago that was never maintained. The electricity only visits us two hours a day, and now we are going backward. We cook on the firewood we gather from the forests because of the gas shortage. The catastrophic failure to reconstruct also shared direct responsibility for the most lethal form of blowback, the dangerous rise of religious fundamentalism and sectarian conflict. When the occupation proved unable to provide the most basic services, including security, the mosques and local militias filled the vacuum. The young Shia cleric Muqtada al-Sadr proved particularly adept at exposing the failures of Bremer's privatized reconstruction by running his own shadow reconstruction in Shia slums from Baghdad to Basra, earning himself a devoted following. Funded through donations to mosques and perhaps later with help from Iran, the centers dispatched electricians to fix power and phone lines, organized local garbage collection, 
set up emergency generators, ran blood drives, and directed traffic. I found a vacuum and no one filled the vacuum, Al Sadr said in the early days of the occupation, adding, what I can do, I do. He also took the young men who saw no jobs and no hope in Bremer's Iraq, dressed them in black, and armed them with rusty Kalashnikovs. The result was the Mahdi army, now one of the most brutal forces in Iraqi sectarian battles. Iraq under Bremer was the logical conclusion of Chicago school theory. A public sector reduced to a minimal number of employees, mostly contract workers, living in a Halliburton city-state, tasked with signing corporate-friendly laws drafted by KPMG, and handing out duffel bags of cash to Western contractors protected by mercenary soldiers, themselves shielded by full legal immunity. All around them were furious people, increasingly turning to religious fundamentalism because it's the only source of power in a hollowed-out state. Like Russia's gangsterism and Bush's cronyism, contemporary Iraq is a creation of the 50-year crusade to privatize the world. Rather than being disowned by its creators, it deserves to be seen as the purest incarnation yet of the ideology that gave it birth. Full Circle from blank slate to scorched earth. Is it possible that the Bush administration was unaware that its economic program had the potential to spark a violent backlash in Iraq? If the war's architects convinced themselves that there would be no political blowback from their economic program, it was probably not because they believed Iraqis would actively consent to such policies of systematic dispossession. Rather, the war planners were banking on something else. The disorientation of Iraqis, their collective regression, their inability to keep up with the pace of transformation. They were banking, in other words, on the power of shock. The guiding assumption of Iraq's military and economic shock therapists, best articulated by the former Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage, was that Iraqis would be so stunned by U.S. firepower and so relieved to be rid of Saddam that they could be easily marshaled from point A to point B. Then, after a few months, they would emerge from their post-war days, pleasantly surprised to be living in an Arabic Singapore, a tiger on the Tigris, as some market analysts were excitingly calling it. Instead, a great many Iraqis immediately demanded a say in the transformation of their country. And it was the Bush administration's response to this unexpected turn of events that generated the most blowback of all. Dismantling Democracy In the summer after Iraq's invasion, there was so much pent-up hunger for political participation that Baghdad, for all its daily hardships, enjoyed an almost carnival-like atmosphere. There was anger at Bremer's layoffs and frustration with the blackouts and the foreign contractors. But for months, that anger was primarily expressed through outbursts of unregulated, exuberant free speech. All summer, there were daily protests outside the gates of the Green Zone, many by workers demanding their old jobs back. Hundreds of new newspapers flew off printing presses, filled with articles critical of Bremer and his economic program. Clerics preached politics during the Friday sermons, a freedom impossible under Saddam. Most exciting of all, there were spontaneous elections breaking out in cities, towns, and provinces across the country. Finally free of Saddam's iron grip, neighbors were convening town hall meetings and electing leaders to represent them in this new era. In cities like Samara, Hilla, and Mosul, religious leaders, secular professionals, and tribespeople worked together to set local priorities for reconstruction, defying the worst predictions about sectarianism and fundamentalism. Meetings were heated, but by many accounts they were also joyous. The challenges were enormous, but freedom was becoming a reality. In many cases, U.S. forces believing their president when he said the army had been sent to Iraq to spread democracy, played a facilitating role, helping to organize the elections, even building ballot boxes. The democratic enthusiasm, combined with the clear rejection of Bremer's economic program, put the Bush administration in an extremely difficult position. It had made bold promises to hand over power to an elected Iraqi government in a matter of months, and to include Iraqis in decision-making right away that first summer, 
left no doubt that any relinquishing of power would mean abandoning the dream of turning Iraq into a model privatized economy dotted with sprawling U.S. military bases. Economic nationalism was far too deeply ingrained in the populace, particularly when it came to the national oil reserves, the greatest prize of all. So Washington abandoned its democratic promises and instead ordered increases in the shock levels in the hope that a higher dosage would finally do the trick. It was a decision that brought the crusade for a pure free market back full circle to its roots in the southern cone of Latin America, when economic shock therapy was enforced by brutally suppressing democracy and by disappearing and torturing anyone who stood in the way. Body Shocks As resistance mounted, the occupation forces fought back with escalating shock tactics. These came late at night or very early in the morning, with soldiers bursting through doors, shining flashlights into darkened homes, shouting in English. A few words are understood. Motherfucker. Ali Baba. Osama bin Laden. Women reached frantically for scarves to cover their heads in front of intruding strangers. Men's heads were forcibly bagged before they were thrown into army trucks and sped to prisons and holding camps. In the first three and a half years of occupation, an estimated 61,500 Iraqis were captured and imprisoned by U.S. forces, usually with methods designed to maximize capture shock. Roughly 19,000 remained in custody in the spring of 2007. Inside the prisons, more shocks followed. Buckets of freezing water, snarling teeth-bearing German shepherds, punching and kicking and sometimes the shock of electrical currents running from live wires. Three decades earlier, the neoliberal crusade had begun with tactics like these, with so-called subversives and alleged terrorists grabbed from their homes, blindfolded and hooded, taken to dark cells where they faced beatings and worse. Now, to defend the hope of a model free market in Iraq, the project had come full circle. One factor that made the surge in torture tactics all but inevitable was Donald Rumsfeld's determination to run the military like a modern, outsourced corporation. He had planned the troop deployment less like a defense secretary and more like a Walmart vice president, looking to shave a few more hours from the payroll. Having whittled the generals down from their early requests for 500,000 troops to fewer than 200,000, he still saw fat to trim. At the last minute, satisfying his inner CEO, he cut tens of thousands more troops from the battle plans. Although his just-in-time forces were capable of toppling Saddam, they had no hope of handling what Bremer's edicts created in Iraq. A population in open rebellion and a gaping hole where Iraq's army and police used to be. Lacking the numbers to bring control to the streets, the occupation forces did the next best thing. They scooped the people off the streets and put them in the jails. The thousands of prisoners rounded up in the raids were brought to CIA agents, U.S. soldiers, and private contractors, many of them untrained, who conducted aggressive interrogations to find out whatever they could about the resistance. In the early days of the occupation, the Green Zone had played host to economic shock therapists from Poland and Russia. Now it became a magnet for a different breed of shock experts those specializing in the darker arts of suppressing resistance movements. The private security companies padded their ranks with veterans of the dirty wars in Colombia, South Africa, and Nepal. According to journalist Jeremy Scahill, Blackwater and other private security firms hired more than 700 Chilean troops, many of them special forces operators, for Iraq deployment, some of whom had trained and served under Pinochet. One of the highest-ranking shock specialists was the U.S. commander James Steele, who arrived in Iraq in May 2003. Steele had been a key figure in Central America's right-wing crusades, where he had served as chief U.S. advisor to several Salvadoran army battalions accused of being death squads. More recently, he had been a vice president at Enron and had originally gone to Iraq as an energy consultant. But when the resistance rose up, he switched back to his old persona, becoming Bremer's chief security advisor. Steele was eventually directed to bring to Iraq what unnamed sources at the Pentagon were chillingly calling the Salvador Option. 
John Sifton, senior researcher at Human Rights Watch, told me that the abuse of prisoners in Iraq did not fit the usual pattern. Usually in conflict zones, abuses take place early on, in the so-called fog of war, when the battlefield is chaotic and no one knows the rules. That's what happened in Afghanistan, Sifton said. But Iraq was different. Things started off professional, and then they got worse, not better. According to this timeline, the shock of the torture chamber emerged immediately following Bremer's most controversial economic shocks. Late August was the end of Bremer's long summer of lawmaking and election cancelling. As those moves sent ever more recruits to the resistance, U.S. soldiers were sent to break down doors and try to shake the defiance out of Iraq, one military-age man at a time. The timing of this shift can be clearly tracked through a series of declassified documents that came to light in the wake of the Abu Ghraib scandal. The paper trail begins on August 14, 2003, when Captain William Ponce, an intelligence officer at the top U.S. military headquarters in Iraq, sent an email to his fellow officers stationed around the country. It contained the now notorious statement, The gloves are coming off, gentlemen, regarding these detainees. A colonel has made it clear that we want these individuals broken. Casualties are mounting, and we need to start gathering info to help protect our fellow soldiers from any further attacks. Ponce solicited ideas for the techniques that interrogators would like to use on prisoners, what he called a wish list. Suggestions came shooting back into his inbox, including low-voltage electrocution. Two weeks later, on August 31st, Major General Jeffrey Miller, warden of the Guantanamo Bay Prison, was brought to Iraq on his mission to get Moai's the Abu Ghraib prison. Two weeks after that, on September 14th, Lieutenant General Ricardo Sanchez, top commander in Iraq, authorized a wide range of new interrogation procedures based on the Guantanamo model, including deliberate humiliation, called pride and ego down, exploiting Arab fear of dogs, sensory deprivation, called light control, sensory overload, yelling, loud music, and stress positions. It was shortly after the Sanchez memo was sent out in early October that the incidents documented in the infamous Abu Ghraib photographs took place. The Bush team had failed to shock Iraqis into obedience, either with shock and awe or with economic shock therapy. Now the shock tactics became more personal, using the Kubark interrogation manual's unmistakable formula for inducing regression. Many of the most important prisoners were taken to a secured area near the Baghdad International Airport, run by a military task force and the CIA. Accessible only by special ID and kept hidden from the Red Cross, the facility was so clandestine that even high-level military officials were denied entry. To maintain its cover, it repeatedly changed names, from Task Force 20 to 121 to 6-26 to Task Force 145. Prisoners were held in a small generic building designed to create the textbook Kubark conditions, including complete sensory deprivation. The building was divided into five areas, a medical exam room, a soft room that looked like a living room for cooperative prisoners, a red room, a blue room, and the much-feared black room, a small cell with every surface painted black and speakers in all four corners. The existence of the secret facility became public only when a sergeant who worked there, using the pseudonym Jeff Perry, approached Human Rights Watch to describe this strange place. Compared with the bedlam of Abu Ghraib, with its untrained guards mostly making it up as they went along, the CIA's airport facility was spookily ordered and clinical. According to Perry, when interrogators wanted to use harsh tactics against prisoners in the black room, they went to a computer terminal and printed out a form that was a kind of torture menu. It was already typed out for you, Perry recalled. Environmental controls, hot and cold, you know, strobe lights, music, so forth. Working dogs. You would just check what you want to use off. When they completed the forms, the interrogators took them to a superior officer for authorization. I never saw a sheet that wasn't signed, Perry said. He and other interrogators 
became concerned that the techniques violated the Geneva Convention's prohibition against humiliating and degrading treatment. Worried that they could face prosecution if their work ever became public, Perry and three others confronted their colonel and told him we were uneasy about this type of abuse. The secret prison was so efficient that within two hours, a team of military lawyers descended on the facility with a PowerPoint presentation on why the detainees were not protected by the Geneva Conventions, and why sensory deprivation, despite the CIA's own research to the contrary, was not torture. Oh, it was very fast, Perry said of the response time. It was like they were ready. I mean, they had this two-hour slideshow all prepared. There were other facilities dotted around Iraq where prisoners were subjected to the same Kubark-style sensory deprivation tactics, some even more reminiscent of the McGill experiments all those years ago. Another sergeant told of a prison on a military base called Tiger, near Al-Qaim, close to the Syrian border, which held 20 to 40 prisoners. They were blindfolded, shackled, and put in sweltering hot metal shipping containers for 24 hours. No sleep, no food, no water, the sergeant reported. After they had been softened up by the sensory deprivation box, prisoners were blasted with strobe lights and heavy metal music. Similar methods were used at a special operations base near Tikrit, except that prisoners there were put in boxes even smaller, four feet by four feet and twenty inches deep, too small for an adult to stand or lie down, strongly reminiscent of many of the cells described in Latin America's southern cone. They were kept in that extreme sensory isolation for up to a week. At least one of the prisoners also reported being electrocuted by U.S. soldiers, though the soldiers denied it. There is, however, a significant and little discussed body of evidence suggesting that U.S. soldiers have indeed used electrocution as a torture technique in Iraq. On May 14, 2004, in a case that received almost no publicity, Two Marines were sentenced to prison for electrocuting an Iraqi prisoner one month earlier. According to government documents obtained by the American Civil Liberties Union, one soldier shocked an Iraqi detainee with an electric transformer, held the wires against the shoulder area of the detainee until the detainee danced as he was shocked. When the infamous Abu Ghraib photographs were published, including the one of a hooded prisoner standing on a box with electrical wires dangling from his arms. The military had a strange problem. We have had several detainees claim they were the person depicted in the photograph in question, explained the spokesperson for the Army's Criminal Investigation Command, the agency charged with investigating prisoner abuse. One of those detainees was Haj Ali, a former district mayor. Ali said that he too had been hooded, made to stand on a box, and had electrical wires attached to his body parts. But contradicting the accounts of the guards at Abu Ghraib who claimed the wires were not live, Ali told PBS, When they shocked me with electricity, it felt like my eyeballs were coming out of their sockets. Like thousands of his fellow prisoners, Ali was released from Abu Ghraib without charge, pushed off a truck after being told, You were arrested by mistake. The Red Cross has said that U.S. military officials have admitted that somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of the detentions in Iraq were mistakes. According to Ali, many of those human errors emerged from U.S.-run jails looking for revenge. Abu Ghraib is a breeding ground for insurgents. All the insults and torture make them ready to do just about anything. Who can blame them? Many U.S. soldiers understand and fear this response. If he's a good guy, you know... Now he's a bad guy because of the way we treated him, said a sergeant with the 82nd Airborne, who had been stationed at a particularly brutal makeshift prison on a U.S. Army base outside Fallujah, home to a battalion proudly known as the Murderous Maniacs. The situation is far worse in jails run by Iraqis. Saddam had always relied heavily on torture to hold on to power. If torture was to recede in post-Saddam Iraq, it would have required a focused effort to repudiate such tactics on the part of a new government. Instead, the U.S. embraced torture for its own purposes, setting a degraded standard at the very time it was training and supervising the new Iraqi police force. In January 2005, Human Rights Watch found that torture within Iraqi-run 
and U.S. supervised jails and detention facilities was systematic, including the use of electroshock. An internal report from the 1st Cavalry Division states that electrical shock and choking are consistently used to achieve confessions by Iraqi police and soldiers. Iraqi jailers were also using the ubiquitous symbol of Latin American torture, the picana, the electric cattle prod. In December 2006, the New York Times reported on the case of Faraj Mahmoud, who was stripped and hanged from the ceiling. An electric prod applied to his genitals made his body bounce off the walls, he said. In March 2005, the New York Times magazine reporter Peter Maas was embedded with a special police commando unit that had been trained by James Steele. Maas visited a public library in Samara that had been converted into a macabre prison. Inside, he saw blindfolded and shackled prisoners, some beaten bloody, as well as a desk with bloodstains running down its side. He heard vomiting and screams that he described as chilling, like the screams of a madman, or of someone being driven mad. He also clearly heard the sound of two gunshots, from within or behind the detention center. In El Salvador, death squads were notorious for using murder not just to get rid of political opponents, but to send messages of terror to the broader community. Mutilated bodies that appeared on roadsides told the wider community that if individuals stepped out of line, they could be the next corpse. Often the tortured bodies were left with a sign bearing the signature of the death squad, Mano Blanco, or Maximiliano Hernandez Brigade. By 2005, these sorts of messages had become a regular sight on roadsides in Iraq. Prisoners, last seen in the custody of Iraqi commandos who were usually linked to the Ministry of Interior, found with a single bullet hole in the head, hands still cuffed behind their backs, or with holes in the skull made by electric drills. In November 2005, the Los Angeles Times reported that at the Baghdad morgue, dozens of bodies arrive at the same time on a weekly basis, including scores of corpses with wrists bound by police handcuffs. Often the morgues kept the metal cuffs and returned them to the police. In Iraq, there are also more high-tech ways of conveying messages of terror. Terrorism in the Grip of Justice is a widely watched TV show on the U.S.-funded al Iraqiya network. The series is produced in conjunction with the Salvadorized Iraqi commandos. Several released prisoners have explained how the show's content is produced. Detainees, often grabbed at random in neighborhood sweeps, are beaten and tortured and threats are made against their families until they are ready to confess to any crime, even crimes that lawyers have proved never took place. Then the video cameras come out to record the prisoners confessing to being insurgents, as well as thieves, homosexuals, and liars. Every night, Iraqis watch these confessions, coming from the bruised and swollen faces of the unmistakably tortured. The show has a good effect on civilians, Adnan Tabit, leader of the Salvadorized Commandos, told Mas. Ten months after the Salvador option was first mentioned in the press, its full terrifying implications became clear. The Iraqi commandos, originally trained by Steele, were officially working under Iraq's Ministry of the Interior, which had insisted, when Mas questioned them about what he had seen in the library, that it does not allow any human rights abuses of prisoners that are in the hands of Ministry of Interior Security Forces. But in November 2005, 173 Iraqis were discovered in an Interior Ministry dungeon, some tortured so badly that their skin was falling off, others with drill marks in their skulls and teeth and toenails removed. The released prisoners said that not everyone made it out alive. They compiled a list of 18 people who had been tortured to death inside the ministry dungeon. Iraqis disappeared. When I was researching Ewan Cameron's electroshock experiments in the 1950s, I came across an observation made by one of his colleagues, a psychiatrist named Fred Lowy. The Freudians had developed all these subtle methods of peeling the onion to get at the heart of the problem, he said. Cameron wanted to drill right through and to hell with the layers. But as we later discovered, the layers are all there is.
Cameron thought he could blast away all his patient's layers and start again. He dreamed of creating brand new personalities. But his patients weren't reborn. They were confused, injured, broken. Iraq shock therapists blasted away at the layers too, seeking that elusive blank slate on which to create their new model country. They found only the piles of rubble that they themselves had created, and millions of psychologically and physically shattered people. Shattered by Saddam, shattered by war, shattered by one another. Bush's in-house disaster capitalists didn't wipe Iraq clean. They just stirred it up. Rather than a tabula rasa, purified of history, they found ancient feuds brought to the surface to merge with fresh vendettas from each new attack. On a mosque in Karbala, in Samara, on a market, a ministry, a hospital. Countries, like people, don't reboot to zero with a good shock. They just break and keep on breaking. Which, of course, requires more blasting. Upping the dosage, holding down the button longer. More pain, more bombs, more torture. Former Deputy Secretary of State Richard Armitage, who had predicted that Iraqis would be easily marshaled from A to B, has since concluded that the real problem was that the U.S. was too soft. The humane way in which the coalition fought the war, he said, actually has led to a situation where it is more difficult to get people to come together, not less. In Germany and Japan, after the Second World War, the population was exhausted and deeply shocked by what had happened. But in Iraq, it's been the opposite. A very rapid victory over enemy forces has meant we've not had the cowed population we had in Japan and Germany. The U.S. is dealing with an Iraqi population that is unshocked and unawed. By January 2007, Bush and his advisors were still convinced that they could gain control of Iraq with one good surge, one that wiped out Muqtada al-Sadr, a cancer that undermines the Iraq government. The report on which the surge strategy was based aimed for the successful clearing of central Baghdad. And when Sadr's forces moved to Sadr's city to clear that Shiite stronghold by force as well. In the 70s, when the corporatist crusade began, it used tactics that courts ruled were overtly genocidal. The deliberate erasure of a segment of the population. In Iraq, something even more monstrous has happened. The erasure not of a segment of the population, but of an entire country. Iraq is disappearing, disintegrating. It began, as it often does, with the disappearance of women behind veils and doors. Then the children disappeared from the schools. As of 2006, two-thirds of them stayed home. Next came the professionals. Doctors, professors, entrepreneurs, scientists, pharmacists, judges, lawyers. An estimated 300 Iraqi academics have been assassinated by death squads since the U.S. invasion, including several deans of departments. Thousands more have fled. Doctors have fared even worse. By February 2007, an estimated 2,000 had been killed and 12,000 had fled. In November 2006, the UN High Commission for Refugees estimated that 3,000 Iraqis were fleeing the country every day. By April 2007, the organization reported that 4 million people had been forced to leave their homes, roughly one in seven Iraqis. Only a few hundred of those refugees had been welcomed into the United States. With Iraqi industry all but collapsed, one of the only local businesses booming is kidnapping. Over just three and a half months in early 2006, nearly 20,000 people were kidnapped in Iraq. The only time the international media pays attention is when a Westerner is taken, but the vast majority of abductions are Iraqi professionals, grabbed as they travel to and from work. Their families either come up with tens of thousands in U.S. dollars for the ransom money, or identify their bodies at the morgue. Torture has also emerged as a thriving industry. Human rights groups have documented numerous cases of Iraqi police demanding thousands of dollars from the families of prisoners in exchange for a halt to torture. It's Iraq's own domestic version of disaster capitalism. 
This was not what the Bush administration intended for Iraq when it was selected as the model nation for the rest of the Arab world. The occupation had begun with cheerful talk of clean slates and fresh starts. It didn't take long, however, for the quest for cleanliness to slip into talk into pulling Islamism up from the root in Sadr City or Najaf, and removing the cancer of radical Islam from Fallujah and Ramadi. What was not clean would be scrubbed out by force. That is what happens with projects to build model societies in other people's countries. The cleansing campaigns are rarely premeditated. It is only when the people who live on the land refuse to abandon their past that the dream of the clean slate morphs into its doppelganger, the scorched earth. Only then that the dream of total creation morphs into a campaign of total destruction. The unanticipated violence that now engulfs Iraq is the creation of the lethally optimistic architects of the war. It was preordained in that original seemingly innocuous, even idealistic phrase, a model for a new Middle East. The disintegration of Iraq has its roots in the ideology that demanded a tabula rasa on which to write its new story. And when no such pristine tableau presented itself, the supporter of that ideology proceeded to blast and surge and blast again in the hope of reaching that promised land. Failure, the new face of success. On my flight leaving Baghdad, every seat was filled by a foreign contractor fleeing the violence. It was April 2004, and both Fallujah and Najaf were under siege. Fifteen hundred contractors pulled out of Iraq that week alone. Many more would follow. At the time, I was convinced that we were seeing the first full-blown defeat of the corporatist crusade. Iraq had been blasted with every shock weapon short of a nuclear bomb, and yet nothing could subdue this country. The experiment, clearly, had failed. Now I'm not sure. On one level, there is no question that parts of the project were a disaster. Bremer was sent to Iraq to build a corporate utopia. Instead, Iraq became a ghoulish dystopia, where going to a simple business meeting could get you lynched, burned alive, or beheaded. By May 2007, more than 900 contractors had been reported killed and more than 12,000 wounded in battle or injured on the job, according to a New York Times analysis. The investors Bremer had done so much to attract had never showed up. Not HSBC or Procter & Gamble, which put its joint venture on hold, as did General Motors. New Bridge Strategies, the company that had gushed about how a Walmart could take over the country, conceded that McDonald's is not opening any time soon. Bechtel's reconstruction contracts did not roll easily into long-term contracts to run the water and electricity systems. And by late 2006, the privatized reconstruction efforts that were at the center of the anti-Marshall plan had almost all been abandoned on the ground. And some rather dramatic policy reversals were in evidence. Stuart Bowen, U.S. Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, reported that in the few cases where contracts were awarded directly to Iraqi firms, it was more efficient and cheaper, and it has energized the economy because it puts the Iraqis to work. It turns out that funding Iraqis to rebuild their own country is more efficient than hiring lumbering multinationals who don't know the country or the language, surround themselves with $900 a day mercenaries, and spend as much as 55% of their contract budgets on overhead. John C. Bowersox, who worked as the health advisor at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, offered this radical observation. The problem with Iraq's reconstruction, he said, was its desire to build everything from scratch. We could have gone in and done low-cost rehabs and not try to transform their health care system in two years. An even more dramatic about turn came from the Pentagon. In December 2006, it announced a new project to get Iraq's state-owned factories up and running, the same ones that Bremer had refused to supply with emergency generators because they were Stalinist throwbacks. Now the Pentagon realized that instead of buying cement and machine parts from Jordan and Kuwait, it could be purchasing them from languishing Iraqi factories, putting tens of thousands to work and sending revenue to surrounding communities. 
Paul Brinkley, U.S. Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Business Transformation in Iraq, said, We've looked at some of these factories more closely and found they aren't quite the run-down Soviet-era enterprises we thought they were, though he did admit that some of his colleagues had begun calling him a Stalinist. Army Lieutenant General Peter W. Chiarelli, the top U.S. field commander in Iraq, explained that we need to put the angry young men to work. A relatively small decrease in unemployment would have a very serious effect on the level of sectarian killing going on. He couldn't help adding, I find it unbelievable after four years that we haven't come to that realization. To me, it's huge. It's as important as just about any other part of the campaign plan. Do these about turns signal the death of disaster capitalism? Hardly. By the time U.S. officials came to the realization that they didn't need to rebuild a shiny new country from scratch, that it was more important to provide Iraqis with jobs and for their industry to share in the billions raised for reconstruction, the money that would have financed such an undertaking had already been spent. Meanwhile, in the midst of the wave of neo-Keynesian epiphanies, Iraq was hit with the boldest attempt at crisis exploitation yet. In December 2006, the bipartisan Iraq study group fronted by James Baker issued its long-awaited report. It called for the U.S. to assist Iraqi leaders to reorganize the national oil industry as a commercial enterprise and to encourage investment in Iraq's oil sector by the international community and by international energy companies. Most of the Iraq study group's recommendations were ignored by the White House, but not this one. The Bush administration immediately pushed ahead by helping to draft a radical new oil law for Iraq, which would allow companies like Shell and BP to sign 30-year contracts in which they could keep a large share of Iraq's oil profits, amounting to tens or even hundreds of billions of dollars, unheard of in countries with as much easily accessible oil as Iraq, and a sentence to perpetual poverty in a country where 95% of government revenues come from oil. This was a proposal so wildly unpopular that even Paul Bremer had not dared make it in the first year of occupation. Yet it was coming up now, thanks to deepening chaos. Explaining why it was justified for such a large percentage of the profits to leave Iraq, the oil companies cited the security risks. In other words, it was the disaster that made the radical proposed law possible. Washington's timing was extremely revealing. At the point when the law was pushed forward, Iraq was facing its most profound crisis to date. The country was being torn apart by sectarian conflict, with an average of 1,000 Iraqis killed every week. Saddam Hussein had just been put to death in a depraved and provocative episode. Simultaneously, Bush was unleashing his surge of troops in Iraq, operating with less restricted rules of engagement. Iraq in this period was far too volatile for the oil giants to make major investments so there was no pressing need for a new law, except to use the chaos to bypass a public debate on the most contentious issue facing the country. Many elected Iraqi legislators said they had no idea that a new law was even being drafted, and had certainly not been included in shaping its outcome. Greg Muddit, a researcher with the Oil Watch Group platform, reported, I was recently at a meeting of Iraqi MPs and asked them how many of them had seen the law. Out of 20, only one MP had seen it. According to Muddit, if the law was passed, Iraqis would lose out massively because they don't have the capacity at the moment to strike a good deal. Iraq's main labor unions declared that the privatization of oil is a red line that may not be crossed, and in a joint statement, condemned the law as an attempt to seize Iraq's energy resources at a time when the Iraqi people are seeking to determine their own future while still under conditions of occupation. The law that was finally adopted by Iraq's cabinet in February 2007 was even worse than anticipated. It placed no limits on the amount of profits that foreign companies can take from the country, and placed no specific requirements about how much or little foreign investors would partner with Iraqi companies or hire Iraqis to work in the oil fields. Most brazenly, it excluded Iraq's elected parliamentarians from having any say in the terms for future oil contracts. Instead, it created a new body, 
the Federal Oil and Gas Council, which, according to the New York Times, would be advised by a panel of oil experts from inside and outside Iraq. This unelected body, advised by unspecified foreigners, would have ultimate decision-making power on all oil matters, with the full authority to decide which contracts Iraq did and did not sign. In effect, the law called for Iraq's publicly owned oil reserves, the country's main source of revenues, to be exempted from democratic control and run instead by a powerful wealthy oil dictatorship, which would exist alongside Iraq's broken and ineffective government. It's hard to overstate the disgrace of this attempted resource grab. Iraq's oil profits are the country's only hope of financing its own reconstruction when some semblance of peace returns. To lay claim to that future wealth in a moment of national disintegration was disaster capitalism at its most shameless. There was another little-discussed consequence of the chaos in Iraq. The longer it wore on, the more privatized the foreign presence became, ultimately forging a new paradigm for the way wars are fought and how human catastrophes are responded to. This is where the ideology of radical privatization at the heart of the anti-martial plan paid off handsomely. The Bush administration's steadfast refusal to staff the war in Iraq whether with troops or with civilian administrators under its control, had some very clear benefits for its other war, the one to outsource the U.S. government. This crusade, while it ceased to be the subject of the administration's public rhetoric, has remained a driving obsession behind the scenes, and it has been far more successful than all the administration's more public battles combined. Because Rumsfeld designed the war as a just-in-time invasion— with soldiers there to provide only core combat functions, and because he eliminated 55,000 jobs in the Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs in the first year of the Iraq deployment, the private sector was left to fill in the gaps at every level. In practice, what this configuration meant was that, as Iraq spiraled into turmoil, an ever more elaborate privatized war industry sprang up to prop up the stripped-down army whether on the ground in Iraq or back home treating soldiers at the Walter Reed Medical Center. Since Rumsfeld steadfastly rejected all solutions that required increasing the size of the army, the military had to find ways to get more soldiers into combat roles. Private security companies flooded into Iraq to perform functions that had previously been done by soldiers, providing security for top officials, guarding bases, escorting other contractors. Once they were there, their roles expanded further in response to the chaos. Blackwater's original contract in Iraq was to provide private security for Bremer, but a year into the occupation, it was engaging in all-out street combat. During the April 2004 uprising of Muqtada al-Sadr's movement in Najaf, Blackwater actually assumed command over active-duty U.S. Marines in a day-long battle with the Mahdi army during which dozens of Iraqis were killed. At the start of the occupation, there were an estimated 10,000 private soldiers in Iraq, already far more than during the first Gulf War. Three years later, a report by the U.S. Government Accountability Office found that there were 48,000 private soldiers from around the world deployed in Iraq. Mercenaries represented the largest contingent of soldiers after the U.S. military more than all the other members of the Coalition of the Willing combined. The Baghdad boom, as it was called in the financial press, took what was a frowned-upon shadowy sector and fully incorporated it into the U.S. and U.K. warfighting machines. Blackwater hired aggressive Washington lobbyists to erase the word mercenary from the public vocabulary and turn its company into an all-American brand. According to its CEO, Eric Prince, this goes back to our corporate mantra, we're trying to do for the national security apparatus what FedEx did for the Postal Service. When the war moved inside the jails, the military was so short on trained interrogators and Arabic translators that it couldn't get information out of its new prisoners. Desperate for more interrogators and translators, it turned to the defense contractor CACI International, Inc. In its original contract, CACI's role in Iraq was to provide information technology services to the military. 
but the wording of the work order was vague enough that information technology could be stretched to mean interrogation. The flexibility was intentional. CACI is part of a new breed of contractor that acts as a temp agency for the federal government. It has ongoing, loosely worded contracts and keeps large numbers of potential workers on call, ready to fill whatever positions come up. Calling CACI, whose workers did not need to meet the rigorous training and security clearances required of government employees, was as easy as ordering new office supplies. Dozens of new interrogators arrived in a flash. The corporation that gained most from the chaos was Halliburton. Before the invasion, it had been awarded a contract to put out oil fires set by Saddam's retreating armies. When those fires did not materialize, Halliburton's contract was stretched to include a new function, providing fuel for the entire nation, a job so big that it bought up every available tanker truck in Kuwait and imported hundreds more. In the name of freeing up soldiers for the battlefield, Halliburton took on dozens more of the Army's traditional functions, including maintaining Army vehicles and radios. Even recruiting, long since seen as the job of soldiers, rapidly became a for-profit business as the war wore on. By 2006, new soldiers were being recruited by private headhunting firms such as Serco, or a division of the weapons giant L3 Communications. The private recruiters, many of whom had never served in the military, were paid bonuses every time they signed up a soldier. So one company spokesperson bragged, if you want to eat steak, you have to put people in the army. Rumsfeld's reign also fueled a boom in outsourced training. Companies such as Cubic Defense Applications and Blackwater ran soldiers through live combat training and war games, bringing them to privately owned training facilities where they practiced house-to-house -house combat in simulated villages. And thanks to Rumsfeld's privatization obsession, as he first suggested in his speech on September 10, 2001, when soldiers came home sick or suffering from post-traumatic stress, they were treated by private health care companies for whom the trauma-heavy war in Iraq generated windfall profits. One of these companies, HealthNet, became the seventh strongest performer in the Fortune 500 in 2005, owing largely to the number of traumatized soldiers returning from Iraq. Another was IAP Worldwide Services, Inc., which won the contract to take over many of the services at the military hospital Walter Reed. The move to privatize the running of the medical center allegedly contributed to a shocking deterioration in maintenance and care, as more than a hundred skilled federal employees left the facility. The greatly expanded role of private companies was never openly debated as a question of policy, much in the way Iraq's proposed oil law suddenly materialized. Rumsfeld did not have to engage in pitched battles with federal employees' unions or high-ranking generals. Instead, it all just happened on the fly in the field, in what the military describes as mission creep. The longer the war wore on, the more it became a privatized war. And soon enough, this was simply the new way of war. Crisis was the enabler of the boom, just as it had been for so many before. The numbers tell the dramatic story of corporate mission creep. During the first Gulf War in 1991, there was one contractor for every hundred soldiers. At the start of the 2003 Iraq invasion, the ratio had jumped to one contractor for every ten soldiers. Three years into the U.S. occupation, the ratio had reached one to three. Less than a year later, with the occupation approaching its fourth year, there was one contractor for every 1.4 U.S. soldiers. But that figure includes only contractors working directly for the U.S. government, not for other coalition partners or the Iraqi government. And it doesn't account for the contractors based in Kuwait and Jordan who had farmed out their jobs to subcontractors. British soldiers in Iraq are already far outnumbered by their countrymen working for private security firms at a ratio of three to one. When Tony Blair announced in February 2007 that he was pulling 1,600 soldiers out of Iraq, the press reported instantly that civil servants hope mercenaries can help fill the gap left behind, with the companies paid directly by the British government. At the same time, the Associated Press put the number of contractors in Iraq at 120,000, 
almost equivalent to the number of U.S. troops. In scale, this kind of privatized warfare has already overshadowed the United Nations. The UN's budget for peacekeeping in 2006-2007 was $5.25 billion. That's less than a quarter of the $20 billion Halliburton got in Iraq contracts, and the latest estimates are that the mercenary industry alone is worth $4 billion. So while the reconstruction of Iraq was certainly a failure for Iraqis and for U.S. taxpayers, it has been anything but for the disaster capitalism complex. Made possible by the September 11th attacks, the war in Iraq represented nothing less than the violent birth of a new economy. This was the genius of Rumsfeld's transformation plan. Since every possible aspect of both destruction and reconstruction has been outsourced and privatized, there's an economic boom when the bombs start falling, when they stop, and when they start up again. A closed profit loop of destruction and reconstruction, of tearing down and building up. For companies that are clever and far-sighted, like Halliburton and the Carlyle Group, the destroyers and rebuilders are different divisions of the same corporations. The Bush administration has taken several important and little examined measures to institutionalize the privatized warfare model forged in Iraq, making it a permanent fixture of foreign policy. In July 2006, Bowen, the Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction, issued a report on Lessons Learned, from the various contractor debacles. It concluded that the problem stemmed from insufficient planning. Rather, it called for the creation of a deployable reserve corps of contracting personnel who are trained to execute rapid relief and reconstruction contracting during contingency operations, and to pre-qualify a diverse pool of contractors with expertise in specialized reconstruction areas. In other words, a standing contractor army. In his 2007 State of the Union address, Bush championed the idea, announcing the creation of a brand new civilian reserve corps. Such a corps would function much like our military reserve. It would ease the burden on the armed forces by allowing us to hire civilians with critical skills to serve on missions abroad when America needs them, he said. It would give people across America who do not wear the uniform a chance to serve in the defining struggle of our time. A year and a half into the Iraq occupation, the U.S. State Department launched a new branch, the Office of Reconstruction and Stabilization. On any given day, it is paying private contractors to draw up detailed plans to reconstruct 25 different countries that may, for one reason or another, find themselves the target of U.S.-sponsored destruction, from Venezuela to Iran. Corporations and consultants are lined up on pre-signed contracts so that they are ready to leap into action as soon as disaster strikes. For the Bush administration, it was a natural evolution. After claiming it had a right to cause unlimited preemptive destruction, it then pioneered preemptive reconstruction, rebuilding places that have not yet been destroyed. So in the end, the war in Iraq did create a model economy. It was just not the tiger on the tigress that the neocons had advertised. Instead, it was a model for privatized war and reconstruction, a model that quickly became export-ready. Until Iraq, the frontiers of the Chicago Crusade had been bound by geography. Russia, Argentina, South Korea. Now, a new frontier can open up wherever the next disaster strikes. Disaster Apartheid, a world of green zones and red zones. During the second week of September 2005, I was in New Orleans with my husband Avi, as well as Andrew, with whom I had traveled in Iraq, shooting documentary footage in the still partially flooded city. As the nightly six o'clock curfew descended, we found ourselves driving in circles, unable to find our way. The traffic lights were out and half the street signs had been blown over or twisted sideways by the storm. Debris and water obstructed passage along many roads, and most of the people trying to navigate the obstacles were, like us, out-of-towners, with no idea where they were going. The accident was a bad one, a T-bone at full speed in the middle of a major intersection. Our car spun out into a traffic light, went through a wrought iron fence, and parked in a porch. 
The injuries to the people in both cars were thankfully minor, but before I knew it I was being strapped to a stretcher and driven away. Through the haze of concussion, I was aware that wherever the ambulance was going, it wouldn't be good. I had visions of the horrific scene at the makeshift health clinic at the New Orleans airport. There were so few doctors and nurses that elderly evacuees were being left unattended for hours, slumped in their wheelchairs. I thought about Charity Hospital, New Orleans' primary public emergency room, which we had passed earlier in the day. It flooded during the storm, and its staff had struggled without power to keep patients alive. I pleaded with the paramedics to let me out. I remember telling them that I was fine, really. Then I passed out. I came to as we arrived at the most modern and calm hospital I have ever been in. Unlike the clinics crowded with evacuees, at the Oxner Medical Center, offering health care with peace of mind, doctors, nurses, and orderlies far outnumbered the patients. In fact, there seemed to be only a handful of other patients on the Immaculate Ward. In minutes, I was settled into a spacious private room, my cuts and bruises attended to by a small army of medical staff. Three nurses immediately took me in for a neck x-ray. A genteel southern doctor removed some glass fragments and put in a couple of stitches. To a veteran of the Canadian public health care system, these were wholly unfamiliar experiences. I usually wait for 40 minutes to see my general practitioner, and this was downtown New Orleans ground zero of the largest public health emergency in recent U.S. history. A polite administrator came into my room and explained that, in America we pay for health care. I am so sorry, dear. It's really terrible. We wish we had your system. Just fill out this form. Within a couple of hours, I would have been free to go were it not for the curfew that had locked down the entire city. The biggest problem, a private security guard told me in the lobby where we were both biding time, is all the junkies. They're jonesing and want to get into the pharmacy. Since the pharmacy was locked tight, a medical intern was kind enough to slip me a few painkillers. I asked him what it had been like at the hospital at the peak of the storm. I wasn't on duty, thank God, he said. I live outside the city. When I asked if he had gone to any of the shelters to help, he seemed taken aback by the question and a little embarrassed. I hadn't thought of that, he said. I quickly changed the subject to what I hoped was safer ground, the fate of Charity Hospital. It was so underfunded that it was barely functioning before the storm, and people were already speculating that with the water damage, it might never reopen. They'd better reopen it, he said. We can't treat those people here. It occurred to me that this affable young doctor and the spa-like medical care I had just received were the embodiment of the culture that had made the horrors of Hurricane Katrina possible, the culture that had left New Orleans' poorest residents to drown. As a graduate of a private medical school and then an intern at a private hospital, he had been trained simply not to see New Orleans' uninsured, overwhelmingly African-American residents as potential patients. That was true before the storm, and it continued to be true even when all of New Orleans turned into a giant emergency room. He had sympathy for the evacuees, but that didn't change the fact that he still could not see them as potential patients of his. When Katrina hit, the sharp divide between the worlds of Oxner Hospital and Charity Hospital suddenly played out on the world stage. The economically secure drove out of town, checked into hotels, and called their insurance companies. The 120,000 people in New Orleans without cars who depended on the state to organize their evacuation, waited for help that did not arrive, making desperate SOS signs or rafts out of their refrigerator doors. Those images shocked the world, because even if most of us had resigned ourselves to the daily inequalities of who has access to health care and whose schools have decent equipment, there was still a widespread assumption that disasters were supposed to be different. It was taken for granted that the state at least in a rich country, would come to the aid of the people during a cataclysmic event. The images from New Orleans showed that this general belief, that disasters are a kind of time-out for cutthroat capitalism, when we all pull together and the state switches into higher gear, had already been abandoned, and with no public debate. There was a brief window of two or three weeks when it seemed that the drowning of New Orleans would provoke a crisis for the economic logic 
that had greatly exacerbated the human disaster with its relentless attacks on the public sphere. The storm exposed the consequences of neoliberalism's lies and mystifications in a single locale and all at once, wrote the political scientist and New Orleans native Adolph Reed Jr. The facts of this exposure are well known. From the levees that were never repaired, to the underfunded public transit system that failed, to the fact that the city's idea of disaster preparedness was passing out DVDs telling people that if a hurricane came, they should get out of town. Then there was the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, a laboratory for the Bush administration's vision of government run by corporations. In the summer of 2004, more than a year before Katrina hit, the state of Louisiana put in a request to FEMA for funds to develop an in-depth contingency plan for a powerful hurricane. The request was refused. Disaster Mitigation Advanced Government Measures to Make the Effects of Disasters Less Devastating was one of the programs gutted under Bush. Yet that same summer, FEMA awarded a $500,000 contract to a private firm called Innovative Emergency Management. Its task was to come up with a catastrophic hurricane disaster plan for southeast Louisiana and the city of New Orleans. The private company spared no expense. It brought together more than a 100 experts, and when money ran out, it went back to FEMA for more. Eventually, the bill for the exercise doubled to $1 million. The company came up with scenarios for a mass evacuation, covering everything from delivering water to instructing neighboring communities to identify empty lots that could immediately be transformed into trailer parks for evacuees. All the sensible things that didn't happen when a hurricane like the one they were imagining actually hit. That's partly because eight months after the contractor submitted its report, no action had been taken. Money was not available to do the follow-up, explained Michael Brown, head of FEMA at the time. The story is typical of the lopsided state that Bush built. A weak, underfunded, ineffective public sector on the one hand, and a parallel, richly funded corporate infrastructure on the other. When it comes to paying contractors, the sky is the limit. When it comes to financing the basic functions of the state, the coffers are empty. Just as the U.S. occupation authority in Iraq turned out to be an empty shell, when Katrina hit, so did the U.S. federal government at home. In fact, it was so thoroughly absent that FEMA could not seem to locate the New Orleans Superdome, where 23,000 people were stranded without food or water, despite the fact that the world media had been there for days. For some free market ideologues, this spectacle of what the New York Times columnist Paul Krugman termed the can't-do government provoked a crisis of faith. The collapsed levees of New Orleans will have consequences for neoconservatism just as long and deep as the collapse of the wall in East Berlin had on Soviet communism, wrote the repentant true believer Martin Kelly in a much-circulated essay. Hopefully all of those who urge the ideology on, myself included, will have a long time to consider the error of our ways. Even neocon stalwarts like Jonah Goldberg were begging big government to ride to the rescue. When a city is sinking into the sea and rioting runs rampant, government probably should saddle up. No such soul-searching was in evidence at the Heritage Foundation, where the true disciples of freedmanism can always be found. Katrina was a tragedy, but, as Milton Friedman wrote in his Wall Street Journal op-ed, it was also an opportunity. On September 13, 2005, 14 days after the levees were breached, the Heritage Foundation hosted a meeting of like-minded ideologues and Republican lawmakers. They came up with a list of pro-free market ideas for responding to Hurricane Katrina and high gas prices. 32 policies in all each one straight out of the Chicago School playbook, and all of them packaged as hurricane relief. The first three items were automatically suspend Davis-Bacon prevailing wage laws in disaster areas, a reference to the law that required federal contractors to pay a living wage. Make the entire affected area a flat tax-free enterprise zone, and make the entire region an economic competitiveness zone. Comprehensive tax incentives and waiving of regulations. 
another demand called for giving parents vouchers to use at charter schools. All these measures were announced by President Bush within the week. He was eventually forced to reinstate the labor standards, though they were largely ignored by contractors. The meeting produced more ideas that gained presidential support. Climate scientists have directly linked the increased intensity of hurricanes to warming ocean temperatures. This connection, however, didn't stop the working group at the Heritage Foundation from calling on Congress to repeal environmental regulations on the Gulf Coast, give permission for new oil refineries in the United States, and greenlight drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. All these measures would increase greenhouse gas emissions, the major human contributor to climate change. Yet they were immediately championed by the president under the guise of responding to the Katrina disaster. Within weeks, the Gulf Coast became a domestic laboratory for the same kind of government run by contractors that had been pioneered in Iraq. The companies that snatched up the biggest contracts were the familiar Baghdad gang. Halliburton's KBR unit had a $60 million gig to reconstruct military bases along the coast. Blackwater was hired to protect FEMA employees from looters, with guards paid as much as $950 a day. Parsons, infamous for its sloppy Iraq work, was brought in for a major bridge construction project in Mississippi. Floor, Shaw, Bechtel, CH2M Hill, all top contractors in Iraq, were handed contracts to provide mobile homes to evacuees just ten days after the levees broke. Their contracts ended up totaling $3.4 billion. No open bidding required. As many remarked at the time, within days of the storm, it was as if Baghdad's green zone had lifted off from its perch on the Tigris and landed on the bayou. The parallels were undeniable. To spearhead its Katrina operation, Shaw hired the former head of the U.S. Army's Iraq Reconstruction Office. Floor sent its senior project manager from Iraq to the flood zone. Our rebuilding work in Iraq is slowing down, and this has made some people available to respond to our work in Louisiana, a company representative explained. Joe Albaugh, whose company New Bridge Strategies had promised to bring Walmart and 7-Eleven to Iraq, was the lobbyist in the middle of many of the deals. The similarities were so striking that some of the mercenary soldiers fresh from Baghdad were having trouble adjusting. When David Enders, a reporter, asked an armed guard outside a New Orleans hotel if there had been much action, he replied, Nope, it's pretty green zone here. Other things were pretty green zone too. On contracts valued at $8.75 billion, congressional investigators found significant overcharges wasteful spending, or mismanagement. The fact that exactly the same errors as those made in Iraq were instantly repeated in New Orleans should put to rest the claim that Iraq's occupation was merely a string of mishaps and mistakes marked by incompetence and lack of oversight. When the same mistakes are repeated over and over again, it's time to consider the possibility that they are not mistakes at all. In New Orleans, as in Iraq, no opportunity for profit was left untapped. Kenyon, a division of the Mega Funeral Conglomerate Service Corporation International, a major Bush campaign donor, was hired to retrieve the dead from homes and streets. The work was extraordinarily slow, and bodies were left in the broiling sun for days. Emergency workers and local volunteer morticians were forbidden to step in to help because handling the bodies impinged on Kenyon's commercial territory. The company charged the state $12,500 a victim. And it has since been accused of failing to properly label many bodies. For almost a year after the flood, decayed bodies were still being discovered in attics. Another pretty green zone touch. Relevant experience often appeared to have nothing to do with how contracts were allocated. Ashbrit, the company paid half a billion dollars to remove debris, reportedly didn't own a single dump truck and farmed out the entire job to contractors. Even more striking was the company that FEMA paid $5.2 million to perform the crucial role of building a base camp for emergency workers in St. Bernard Parish, a suburb of New Orleans. The camp construction fell behind schedule and was never completed. When the contractor was investigated, it emerged that the company, 
Lighthouse Disaster Relief, was actually a religious group. About the closest thing I have done to this is just organize a youth camp with my church, confessed Lighthouse's director, Pastor Gary Heldreth. As in Iraq, government once again played the role of a cash machine equipped for both withdrawals and deposits. Corporations withdrew funds through massive contracts, then repaid the government not with reliable work, but with campaign contributions and or loyal foot soldiers for the next elections. According to the New York Times, the top 20 service contractors have spent nearly $300 million since 2000 on lobbying and have donated $23 million to political campaigns. The Bush administration, in turn, increased the amount spent on contractors by roughly $200 billion between 2000 and 2006. Something else was familiar. The contractor's aversion to hiring local people who might have seen the reconstruction of New Orleans not only as a job, but as part of healing and re-empowering their communities. Washington could easily have made it a condition of every Katrina contract that companies hire local people at decent wages to help them put their lives back together. Instead, the residents of the Gulf Coast, like the people of Iraq, were expected to watch as contractors created an economic boom based on easy taxpayer money and relaxed regulations. The result, predictably, was that after all the layers of subcontractors had taken their cut, there was next to nothing left for the people doing the work. For instance, the author Mike Davis tracked the way FEMA paid Shaw $175 a square foot to install blue tarps on damaged roofs, even though the tarps themselves were provided by the government. Once all the subcontractors took their share, the workers who actually hammered in the tarps were paid as little as $2 a square foot. Every level of the contracting food chain, in other words, is grotesquely overfed except the bottom rung, Davis wrote, where the actual work is carried out. According to one study, a quarter of the workers rebuilding the city were immigrants lacking papers, almost all of them Hispanic making far less money than legal workers. In Mississippi, a class-action lawsuit forced several companies to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in back wages to immigrant workers. Some were not paid at all. On one Halliburton KBR job site, undocumented immigrant workers reported being wakened in the middle of the night by their employer, a sub-subcontractor, who allegedly told them that immigration agents were on their way. Most workers fled to avoid arrest. After all, they could end up in one of the new immigration prisons that Halliburton KBR had been contracted to build for the federal government. The attacks on the disadvantaged, carried out in the name of reconstruction and relief, did not stop there. In order to offset the tens of billions going to private companies in contracts and tax breaks, in November 2005, the Republican-controlled Congress announced that it needed to cut $40 billion from the federal budget. Among the programs that were slashed were student loans, Medicaid, and food stamps. In other words, the poorest citizens in the country subsidized the contractor bonanza twice. First, when Katrina relief morphed into unregulated corporate handouts, providing neither decent jobs nor functional public services. And second, when the few programs that directly assist the unemployed and working poor nationwide were gutted to pay those bloated bills. Not so long ago, disasters were periods of social leveling, rare moments when atomized communities put divisions aside and pulled together. Increasingly, however, disasters are the opposite. They provide windows into a cruel and ruthlessly divided future in which money and race buy survival. Baghdad's Green Zones is the starkest expression of this world order. It has its own electrical grid its own phone and sewage systems, its own oil supply, and its own state-of-the-art hospital with pristine operating theaters, all protected by five-meter-thick walls. It feels, oddly, like a giant fortified carnival cruise ship parked in the middle of a sea of violence and despair, the boiling red zone that is Iraq. If you can get on board, there are poolside drinks, bad Hollywood movies, and Nautilus machines. If you are not among the chosen, you can get yourself shot just by standing too close to the wall. 
everywhere in Iraq, the wildly divergent value assigned to different categories of people is crudely evident. Westerners and their Iraqi colleagues have checkpoints at the entrance to their streets, blast walls in front of their houses, body armor, and private security guards on call at all hours. They travel the country in menacing armored convoys, with mercenaries pointing guns out the windows as they follow their prime directive to protect the principal. With every move, they broadcast the same unapologetic message. We are the chosen. Our lives are infinitely more precious. Middle-class Iraqis, meanwhile, cling to the next rung down the ladder. They can afford to buy protection from local militias, and they are able to pay off kidnappers to have a family member released. But the vast majority of Iraqis have no protection at all. They walk the streets wide open to any possible violence, with nothing between them and the next car bomb but a thin layer of fabric. In Iraq, the lucky get Kevlar, the rest get prayer beads. At first, I thought the green zone phenomenon was unique to the war in Iraq. Now, after years spent in other disaster zones, I realize that the green zone emerges everywhere that the disaster capitalism complex descends, with the same stark partitions between the included and the excluded, the protected and the damned. It happened in New Orleans. After the flood, an already divided city turned into a battleground between gated green zones and raging red zones. The result not of water damage, but of the free market solutions embraced by the president. The Bush administration refused to allow emergency funds to pay public sector salaries, and the city of New Orleans, which lost its tax base, had to fire 3,000 workers in the months after Katrina. Among them were 16 of the city's planning staff, with shades of debathification, laid off at the precise moment when New Orleans was in desperate need of planners. Instead, millions of public dollars went to outside consultants, many of whom were powerful real estate developers. And of course, thousands of teachers were also fired, paving the way for the conversion of dozens of public schools into charter schools, just as Friedman had called for. Almost two years after the storm, Charity Hospital was still closed. The court system was barely functioning, and the privatized electricity company, Entergy, had failed to get the whole city back online. After threatening to raise rates dramatically, the company managed to extract a controversial $200 million bailout from the federal government. The public transit system was gutted and lost almost half its workers. The vast majority of publicly owned housing projects stood boarded up and empty, with 5,000 units slotted for demolition by the Federal Housing Authority. Much as the tourism lobby in Asia had longed to be rid of the beachfront fishing villages, New Orleans' powerful tourism lobby had been eyeing the housing projects, several of them on prime land close to the French Quarter, the city's tourism magnet. Andesha Joakali helped set up a protest camp outside one of the boarded-up projects, St. Bernard Public Housing, explaining that they've had an agenda for St. Bernard a long time, but as long as people lived here, they couldn't do it, so they used the disaster as a way of cleansing the neighborhood when the neighborhood is weakest. This is a great location for bigger houses and condos. The only problem is you got all these poor black people sitting on it. Amid the schools, the homes, the hospitals, the transit system, and the lack of clean water in many parts of town, New Orleans' public sphere was not being rebuilt. It was being erased, with the storm used as the excuse. At an earlier stage of capitalist creative destruction, Large swaths of the United States lost their manufacturing bases and degenerated into rust belts of shuttered factories and neglected neighborhoods. Post-Katrina New Orleans may be providing the first Western world image of a new kind of wasted urban landscape. The Mold Belt Destroyed by the deadly combination of weathered public infrastructure and extreme weather. The American Society of Civil Engineers said in 2007 that the U.S. had fallen so far behind in maintaining its public infrastructure, roads, bridges, schools, dams, that it would take more than a trillion and a half dollars over five years to bring it back up to standard. Instead, these types of expenditures are being cut back. At the same time, 
public infrastructure around the world is facing unprecedented stress, with hurricanes, cyclones, floods, and forest fires all increasing in frequency and intensity. It's easy to imagine a future in which growing numbers of cities have their frail and long-neglected infrastructures knocked out by disasters and then are left to rot, their core services never repaired or rehabilitated. The well-off, meanwhile, will withdraw into gated communities, their needs met by privatized providers. Signs of that future were already in evidence by the time hurricane season rolled around in 2006. In just one year, the disaster response industry had exploded, with a slew of new corporations entering the market, promising safety and security should the next big one hit. One of the more ambitious ventures was launched by an airline in West Palm Beach, Florida. HelpJet bills itself as the first hurricane escape plan that turns a hurricane evacuation into a jet-setter vacation. When a storm is coming, the airline books holidays for its members at five-star golf resorts, spas, or Disneyland. With the reservations all made, the evacuees are then whisked out of the hurricane zone on a luxury jet. No standing in lines, no hassle with crowds, just a first-class experience that turns a problem into a vacation. Enjoy the feeling of avoiding the usual hurricane evacuation nightmare. For the people left behind, there is a different kind of privatized solution. In 2006, the Red Cross signed a new disaster response partnership with Walmart. It's all going to be private enterprise before it's over, said Billy Wagner, chief of emergency management for the Florida Keys. They've got the expertise, they've got the resources. He was speaking at the National Hurricane Conference in Orlando, Florida a fast-growing annual trade show for the company selling everything that might come in handy during the next disaster. Some folks here said, Man, this is huge business. This is my new business. I'm not in the landscaping business anymore. I'm going to be a hurricane debris contractor, said Dave Blanford, an exhibitor at the conference, showing off his self-heating meals. Much of the parallel disaster economy has been built with taxpayers' money, thanks to the boom in privatized war zone reconstruction. The giant contractors that have served as the primes in Iraq and Afghanistan have come under frequent political fire for spending large portions of their income from government contracts on their own corporate overhead, between 20 and 55 percent, according to a 2006 audit of Iraq contractors. Much of those funds have, quite legally, gone into huge investments in corporate infrastructure. Bechtel's battalions of earth-moving equipment, Halliburton's planes and fleets of trucks, and the surveillance architecture built by L3, CACI, and Booz Allen. Most dramatic has been Blackwater's investment in its paramilitary infrastructure. Founded in 1996, the company has used the steady stream of contracts during the Bush years to build up a private army of 20,000 mercenary soldiers on call and a massive military base in North Carolina worth between 40 and 50 million dollars. According to one account, Blackwater's capacity now includes the following. A burgeoning logistics operation that can deliver 100 or 200 tons self-contained humanitarian relief response packages faster than the Red Cross. A Florida aviation division with 26 different platforms from helicopter gunships to a massive Boeing 767. The company even has a Zeppelin, the country's largest tactical driving track, a 20-acre man-made lake with shipping containers that have been mocked up with ship rails and portholes, floating on pontoons used to teach how to board a hostile ship, a canine training facility that currently has 80 dog teams deployed around the world, a 1,200-yard-long firing range for sniper training, a right-wing journal in the U.S., pronounced Blackwater, Al-Qaeda for the good guys. It's a striking analogy. Wherever the disaster capitalism complex has landed, it has produced a proliferation of armed groupings outside the state. That is hardly a surprise. When countries are rebuilt by people who don't believe in governments, the states they build are invariably weak, creating a market for alternative security forces, whether Hezbollah, Blackwater, the Mahdi Army, or the gang down the street in New Orleans. The emergence of this parallel privatized infrastructure reaches far beyond policing. 
when the contractor infrastructure built up during the Bush years is looked at as a whole, what is seen is a fully articulated state within a state that is as muscular and capable as the actual state is frail and feeble. This corporate shadow state has been built almost exclusively with public resources. 90% of Blackwater's revenues come from state contracts, including the training of its staff, overwhelmingly former civil servants, politicians, and soldiers. Yet the vast infrastructure is all privately owned and controlled. The citizens who have funded it have absolutely no claim to this parallel economy or its resources. The actual state, meanwhile, has lost the ability to perform its core functions without the help of contractors. Its own equipment is out of date, and the best experts have fled to the private sector. When Katrina hit, FEMA had to hire a contractor to award contracts to contractors. Similarly, when it came time to update the Army Manual on the rules for dealing with contractors, the Army contracted out the job to one of its major contractors. MPRI. It no longer had the know-how in-house. The CIA is losing so many staffers to the parallel privatized spy sector that it has had to bar contractors from recruiting in the agency dining room. One recently retired case officer said he had been approached twice while in line for coffee, reported the Los Angeles Times. And when the Department of Homeland Security decided it needed to build virtual fences on the U.S. borders with Mexico and Canada, Michael P. Jackson, Deputy Secretary of the Department, told contractors, This is an unusual invitation. We're asking you to come back and tell us how to do our business. The Department's Inspector General explained that Homeland Security does not have the capacity needed to effectively plan, oversee, and execute the Secure Border Initiative program. Under Bush, the state still has all the trappings of a government, the impressive buildings, presidential press briefings, policy battles, but it no more does the actual work of governing than the employees at Nike's Beaverton campus stitch running shoes. The implications of the decision by the current crop of politicians to systematically outsource their elected responsibilities will reach far beyond a single administration. Once a market has been created, it needs to be protected. The companies at the heart of the disaster capitalism complex increasingly regard both the state and non-profits as competitors. From the corporate perspective, whenever governments or charities fulfill their traditional roles, they are denying contractors work that could be performed at a profit. Neglected Defense Mobilizing the Private Sector to Support Homeland Security, a 2006 report whose advisory committee included some of the largest corporations in the sector, warned that the compassionate federal impulse to provide emergency assistance to the victims of disasters affects the market's approach to managing its exposure to risk. Published by the Council on Foreign Relations, the report argued that if people know the government will come to the rescue, they have no incentive to pay for privatized protection. In a similar vein, a year after Katrina, CEOs from 30 of the largest corporations in the United States joined together under the umbrella of the Business Roundtable, which includes in its membership Floor, Bechtel, and Chevron. The group, calling itself Partnership for Disaster Response, complained of mission creep by the nonprofit sector in the aftermath of disasters. Apparently, charities and NGOs were infringing on their market by donating building supplies rather than having Home Depot supply them for a fee. The mercenary firms, meanwhile, have been loudly claiming that they are better equipped to engage in peacekeeping in Darfur than the UN. Much of this new aggressiveness flows from the fact that the corporate world knows that the golden era of bottomless federal contracts cannot last much longer. The U.S. government is barreling toward an economic crisis, in no small part thanks to the deficit spending that has bankrolled the construction of the privatized disaster economy. That means that sooner, rather than later, the contracts are going to dip significantly. In late 2006, defense analysts began predicting that the Pentagon's acquisitions budget could shrink by as much as 25% 
in the coming decade. When the disaster bubble bursts, firms such as Bechtel, Fleur, and Blackwater will lose much of their primary revenue streams. They will still have all the high-tech gear and equipment bought at taxpayer expense, but they will need to find a new business model, a new way to cover their high costs. The next phase of the disaster capitalism complex is all too clear. With emergencies on the rise, government no longer able to foot the bill, and citizens stranded by their can't-do state, the parallel corporate state will rent back its disaster infrastructure to whoever can afford it, at whatever price the market will bear. For sale will be everything from helicopter rides off rooftops to drinking water to beds and shelters. Already, wealth provides an escape hatch for most disasters. It buys early warning systems for tsunami-prone regions and stockpiles of Tamiflu for the next outbreak. It buys bottled water, generators, satellite phones, and rent -a cops During the Israeli attack on Lebanon in 2006, the U.S. government initially tried to charge its citizens for the cost of their own evacuations, though it was eventually forced to back down. If we continue in this direction, the images of people stranded on New Orleans rooftops will not only be a glimpse of America's unresolved past of racial inequality, but will also foreshadow a collective future of disaster apartheid, in which survival is determined by who can afford to pay for escape. Looking ahead to coming disasters, ecological and political, we often assume that we are all going to face them together. That what's needed are leaders who recognize the destructive course we are on. But I'm not so sure. Perhaps part of the reason why so many of our elites, both political and corporate, are so sanguine about climate change is that they are confident they will be able to buy their way out of the worst of it. This may also partially explain why so many Bush supporters are Christian end-timers. It's not just that they need to believe there is an escape hatch from the world they are creating. It's that the rapture is a parable for what they are building down here a system that invites destruction and disaster, then swoops in with private helicopters and airlifts them and their friends to divine safety. As contractors rush to develop alternative stable sources of revenue, one avenue is disaster-proofing other corporations. This was Paul Bremer's line of business before he went to Iraq, turning multinationals into security bubbles, able to function smoothly even if the states in which they are functioning are crumbling around them. The early results can be seen in the lobbies of many major office buildings in New York or London. Airport-style check-ins complete with photo ID requirements and X-ray machines. But the industry has far greater ambitions, including privatized global communications networks, emergency health and electricity, and the ability to locate and provide transportation for a global workforce in the midst of a major disaster. Another potential growth area identified by the disaster capitalism complex is municipal government, the contracting out of police and fire departments to private security companies. What they do for the military in downtown Fallujah, they can do for the police in downtown Reno, a spokesperson for Lockheed Martin said in November 2004. The industry predicts that these new markets will expand dramatically over the next decade. A frank vision of where these trends are leading is provided by John Robb, a former covert action mission commander with Delta Force turned successful management consultant. In a widely circulated manifesto for Fast Company magazine, he describes the end result of the war on terror as a new, more resilient approach to national security, one built not around the state, but around private citizens and companies. Security will become a function of where you live and whom you work for much as health care is allocated already. Rob writes, Wealthy individuals and multinational corporations will be the first to bail out of our collective system, opting instead to hire private military companies, such as Blackwater and Triple Canopy, to protect their homes and facilities and establish a protective perimeter around daily life. Parallel transportation networks evolving out of the timeshare aircraft companies such as Warren Buffett's NetJets will cater to this group leapfrogging its members from one secure, well-appointed lily pad to the next. That elite world is already largely in place. 
but Rob predicts that the middle class will soon follow suit, forming suburban collectives to share the costs of security. These armored suburbs will deploy and maintain backup generators and communications links, and be patrolled by private militias that have received corporate training and boast their own state-of-the-art emergency response systems. In other words, a world of suburban green zones. As for those outside the secured perimeter, they will have to make do with the remains of the national system. They will gravitate to America's cities where they will be subject to ubiquitous surveillance and marginal or non-existent services. For the poor, there will be no other refuge. The future Rob described sounds very much like the present in New Orleans, where two very different kinds of gated communities emerged from the rubble. On the one hand were the so-called Femavilles, desolate, out-of-the-way trailer camps for low-income evacuees, built by Bechtel or Fleur subcontractors, administered by private security companies who patrolled the gravel lots, restricted visitors, kept journalists out, and treated survivors like criminals. On the other hand were the gated communities built in the wealthy areas of the city, such as Audubon and the Garden District, bubbles of functionality that seemed to have seceded from the state altogether. Within weeks of the storm, residents there had water and powerful emergency generators. Their sick were treated in private hospitals, and their children went to new charter schools, and they had no need for public transit. In St. Bernard Parish, a New Orleans suburb, DynCorp had taken over much of the policing. Other neighborhoods hired security companies directly. Between the two kinds of privatized sovereign states was the New Orleans version of the Red Zone, where the murder rate soared and neighborhoods like the storied Lower Ninth Ward descended into a post-apocalyptic no-man's land. A hit song by the rapper Juvenile in the summer after Katrina summed up the atmosphere. We live in like Haiti without no government. Failed state, USA. Bill Quigley a local lawyer and activist, observed, What is happening in New Orleans is just a more concentrated, more graphic version of what is going on all over our country. Every city in our country has some serious similarities to New Orleans. Every city has some abandoned neighborhoods. Every city in our country has abandoned some public education, public housing, public health care, and criminal justice. Those who do not support public education, health care, and housing will continue to turn all of our country into the Lower Ninth Ward unless we stop them. The process is already well underway. Another glimpse of the disaster apartheid future can be found in a wealthy Republican suburb outside Atlanta. Its residents decided that they were tired of watching their property taxes subsidize schools and police in the county's low-income African-American neighborhoods. They voted to incorporate as their own city, Sandy Springs, which could spend its taxes on services for its 100,000 citizens and not have the revenues redistributed throughout the larger Fulton County. The only difficulty was that Sandy Springs had no government structures and needed to build them from scratch, everything from tax collection to zoning to parks and recreation. In September 2005, the same month that New Orleans flooded, the residents of Sandy Springs were approached by the construction and consulting giant CH2M Hill with a unique pitch. Let us do it for you. For the starting price of $27 million a year, the contractor pledged to build a complete city from the ground up. A few months later, Sandy Springs became the first contract city. Only four people worked directly for the new municipality. Everyone else was a contractor. Rick Hurstcorn, heading up the project for CH2M Hill, described Sandy Springs as a clean sheet of paper with no governmental processes in place. He told another journalist that no one in our industry has done a complete city of this size before. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution reported that when Sandy Springs hired corporate workers to run the new city, it was considered a bold experiment. Within a year, however, contract city mania was tearing through Atlanta's wealthy suburbs, and it had become standard procedure in North Fulton County. Neighboring communities took their cue from Sandy Springs 
and also voted to become standalone cities and contract out their government. One new city, Milton, immediately hired CH2M Hill for the job. After all, it had the experience. Soon, a campaign began for the new corporate cities to join together to form their own county, which would mean that none of their tax dollars would go to the poor neighborhoods nearby. The plan has encountered fierce opposition outside the proposed enclave, where politicians say that without those tax dollars, they will no longer be able to afford their large public hospital and public transit system, that partitioning the county would create a failed state on the one hand and a hyper-serviced one on the other. What they were describing sounded a lot like New Orleans and a little like Baghdad. In these wealthy Atlanta suburbs, the three-decade corporatist crusade to strip-mine the state was complete. It wasn't just every government service that had been outsourced, but also the very function of government, which is to govern. It was particularly fitting that the new ground was broken by CH2M Hill. The corporation was a multi-million dollar contractor in Iraq, paid to perform the core government function of overseeing other contractors. In Sri Lanka, after the tsunami, it had not only built ports and bridges, but was responsible for the overall management of the infrastructure program. In post-Katrina New Orleans, it was awarded $500 million to build FEMA villes and put on standby to be ready to do the same for the next disaster. A master of privatizing the state during extraordinary circumstances, it was now doing the same under ordinary ones. If Iraq was a laboratory of extreme privatization, the testing phase was clearly over. Losing the Peace Incentive Israel as Warning For decades, the conventional wisdom was that generalized mayhem was a drain on the global economy. Individual shocks and crises could be harnessed as leverage to force open new markets, of course. But after the initial shock had done its work, relative peace and stability were required for sustained economic growth. That was the accepted explanation for why the 90s had been such prosperous years. With the Cold War over, economies were liberated to concentrate on trade and investment. And as countries became more enmeshed and interdependent, they were far less likely to bomb each other. At the 2007 World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, however, political and corporate leaders were scratching their heads over a state of affairs that seemed to flout this conventional wisdom. It was being called the Davos Dilemma, which the Financial Times columnist Martin Wolf described as the contrast between the world's favorable economics and troublesome politics. As he put it, the economy had faced a series of shocks. The stock market crash after 2000, the terrorist outrages of September 11, 2001, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, friction over U.S. policies, a jump in real oil prices to levels not seen since the 1970s, the cessation of negotiations in the Doha round of WTO talks, and the confrontation over Iran's nuclear ambitions. And yet it found itself in a golden period of broadly shared growth. Put bluntly, the world was going to hell, there was no stability in sight, and the global economy was roaring its approval. Soon after, former U.S. Treasury Secretary Lawrence Summers described the near-complete disconnect between politics and markets as something out of Dickens. You talk to international relations experts, and it's the worst of all times. Then you talk to potential investors, and it's one of the best of all times. This puzzling trend has also been observed through an economic indicator called the Guns to Caviar Index. The index tracks the sales of fighter jets, guns, and executive jets, caviar. For 17 years, it consistently found that when fighter jets were selling briskly, sales of luxury executive jets went down, and vice versa. When executive jet sales were on the rise, fighter jet sales dipped. Of course, a handful of war profiteers always managed to get rich from selling guns, but they were economically insignificant. It was a truism of the contemporary market that you couldn't have booming economic growth in the midst of violence and instability. But that truism is no longer true. Since 2003, the year of the Iraq invasion, 
the index found that spending has been going up on both fighter jets and executive jets rapidly and simultaneously, which means that the world is becoming less peaceful while accumulating significantly more profit. The galloping economic growth in China and India played a part in the increased demand for luxury items. But so did the expansion of the narrow military-industrial complex into the sprawling disaster capitalism complex. Today, global instability does not just benefit a small group of arms dealers. It generates huge profits for the high-tech security sector, for heavy construction, for private health care companies treating wounded soldiers, for the oil and gas sectors, and, of course, for defense contractors. The scale of the revenues at stake is certainly enough to fuel an economic boom. Lockheed Martin, whose former vice president chaired the committee loudly agitating for war in Iraq, received $25 billion of U.S. taxpayer dollars in 2005 alone. The Democratic congressman Henry Waxman noted that the sum exceeded the gross domestic product of 103 countries, including Iceland, Jordan, and Costa Rica and was also larger than the combined budgets of the Department of Commerce, the Department of the Interior, the Small Business Administration, and the entire legislative branch of government. Lockheed itself was an emerging market. Companies like Lockheed, whose stock price tripled between 2000 and 2005, are a large part of the reason why the U.S. stock markets were saved from a prolonged crash following September 11th. While conventional stock prices have underperformed, the Spade Defense Index, a benchmark for defense, homeland security, and aerospace stocks, went up every year from 2001 to 2006 by an average of 15%. Seven and a half times the Standard & Poor's 500 average increase in that same period. The Davos Dilemma is being further fueled by the intensely profitable model of privatized reconstruction that was forged in Iraq. Heavy construction stocks, which include the big engineering firms that land juicy no-bid contracts after wars and natural disasters, went up 180% between 2001 and April 2007. Reconstruction is now such big business that every new destruction is greeted with the excitement of hot initial public stock offerings. $30 billion for Iraq reconstruction, $13 billion for tsunami reconstruction, $100 billion for New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, and $7.6 billion for Lebanon. Terrorist attacks, which used to send the stock market spiraling downward, now receive a similarly upbeat market reception. After September 11, 2001, the Dow Jones plummeted 685 points as soon as markets reopened. In sharp contrast, on July 7, 2005, the day four bombs ripped through London's public transport system, killing dozens and injuring hundreds, the U.S. stock market closed higher than it did the day before, with the Nasdaq up seven points. The following August, on the day British law enforcement agencies arrested 24 suspects allegedly planning to blow up jetliners headed to the U.S., the Nasdaq closed 11.4 points higher, largely thanks to soaring homeland security stocks. Then there are the outrageous fortunes of the oil sector, a $40 billion profit in 2006 for ExxonMobil alone, the largest profit ever recorded, and its colleagues at rival companies like Chevron were not far behind. Like those corporations linked to defense, heavy construction, and homeland security, the oil sector's fortunes improve with every war, terrorist attack, and Category 5 hurricane. In addition to reaping the short-term benefits of high prices linked to uncertainty in key oil-producing regions, the oil industry has consistently managed to turn disasters to its long-term advantage whether by ensuring that a large portion of the reconstruction funds in Afghanistan went into the expensive road infrastructure for a new pipeline, while most other major reconstruction projects stalled, by pushing through Iraq's oil law while the country burned, or by piggybacking on Hurricane Katrina to plan the first new refineries in the United States since the 70s. The oil and gas industry is so intimately entwined with the economy of disaster, both as root cause behind many disasters and as a beneficiary from them, that it deserves to be treated as an honorary adjunct of the disaster capitalism complex. 
No conspiracies required. The recent spate of disasters has translated into such spectacular profits that many people around the world have come to the same conclusion. The rich and powerful must be deliberately causing the catastrophes so that they can exploit them. In July 2006, a national poll of U.S. residents found that more than a third of respondents believed that the government had a hand in the 9-11 attacks or took no action to stop them because they wanted the United States to go to war in the Middle East. Similar suspicions dog most of the catastrophes of recent years. In Louisiana, in the aftermath of Katrina, the shelters were alive with rumors that the levees hadn't broken, but had been covertly blown up in order to destroy the black part of town and keep the white part dry, as the Nation of Islam's leader Louis Farrakhan suggested. In Sri Lanka, I often heard that the tsunami had been caused by underwater explosions detonated by the United States so that it could send troops into Southeast Asia and take full control over the region's economies. The truth is at once less sinister and more dangerous. An economic system that requires constant growth, while bucking almost all serious attempts at environmental regulation, generates a steady stream of disasters all on its own, whether military, ecological, or financial. The appetite for easy, short-term profits offered by purely speculative investment has turned the stock, currency, and real estate markets into crisis creation machines, as the Asian financial crisis, the Mexican peso crisis, and the dot-com collapse all demonstrate. Our common addiction to dirty, non-renewable energy sources keeps other kinds of emergencies coming. Natural disasters, up 430% since 1975. And wars waged for control over scarce resources. Not just Iraq and Afghanistan, but lower-intensity conflicts such as those that rage in Nigeria, Colombia, and Sudan, which in turn create terrorist blowback. A 2007 study calculated that the number of terrorist attacks since the start of the Iraq War had increased sevenfold. Given the boiling temperatures, both climatic and political, future disasters need not be cooked up in dark conspiracies. All indications are that simply by staying the current course, they will keep coming with ever more ferocious intensity. Disaster generation can therefore be left to the market's invisible hand. This is one area in which it actually delivers. While the disaster capitalism complex does not deliberately scheme to create the cataclysms on which it feeds, though Iraq may be a notable exception, there is plenty of evidence that its component industries work very hard indeed to make sure that current disastrous trends continue unchallenged. Large oil companies have bankrolled the climate change denial movement for years. ExxonMobil has spent an estimated $16 million on the crusade over the past decade. While this phenomenon is well known, the interplay between disaster contractors and elite opinion makers is far less understood. Several influential Washington think tanks, including the National Institute for Public Policy and the Center for Security Policy, are heavily funded by weapons and homeland security contractors, which profit directly from these institutes' ceaseless portrayal of the world as a dark and menacing place. Its troubles responsive only to force. The homeland security sector is also becoming increasingly integrated with media corporations, a development with Orwellian implications. In 2004, the digital communications giant LexisNexis paid $775 million for CSENT, a data mining company that works closely on surveillance with federal and state agencies. That same year, General Electric, which owns NBC, purchased InVision, the major producer of controversial high-tech bomb detection devices used in airports and other public spaces. InVision received a staggering $15 billion in homeland security contracts between 2001 and 2006 more of such contracts than any other company. The creeping integration of the disaster capitalism complex may prove to be a new kind of corporate synergy, one building on the vertical integration that became so popular in the 90s. It certainly makes sound business sense. The more panicked our societies become, convinced that there are terrorists lurking in every mosque, the higher the news ratings soar.
The more biometric IDs and liquid explosive detection devices the complex sells, and the more high-tech fences it builds. If the dream of the open, borderless, small planet was the ticket to profits in the 90s, the nightmare of the menacing, fortressed western continents, under siege from jihadists and illegal immigrants, plays the same role in the new millennium. The only prospect that threatens the booming disaster economy on which so much wealth depends from weapons to oil to engineering to surveillance to patented drugs, is the possibility of achieving some measure of climatic stability and geopolitical peace. Israel and the Standing Disaster Apartheid State As analysts struggle to understand the Davos Dilemma, a new consensus is emerging. It is not that the market has become immune to instability, at least not exactly. It is that a steady flow of disasters is now so expected that the ever-adaptable market has changed to fit this new status quo. Instability is the new stability. In discussions of this post-9-11 economic phenomenon, Israel is often held up as a sort of Exhibit A. For much of the past decade, Israel has been experiencing its own miniaturized Davos dilemma. Wars and terrorist attacks have been increasing, but the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange has been rising to record levels right alongside this violence. As one stock analyst noted on Fox News after the July 7th London bombings, in Israel, they deal with the threat of terror daily, and that market is up for the year. Like the global economy in general, Israel's political situation is, most agree, disastrous, but its economy has never been stronger with 2007 growth rates rivaling those of China and India. What makes Israel interesting as a guns and caviar model is not only that the Israeli economy is resilient in the face of major political shocks such as the 2006 war with Lebanon, but also that Israel has crafted an economy that expands markedly in direct response to escalating violence. The reasons for Israeli industry's comfort level with disaster are not mysterious. Years before U.S. and European companies grasped the enormous potential of the global security boom, Israeli technology firms were busily pioneering the homeland security industry, and they continue to dominate the sector today. From a corporate perspective, this development has made Israel a model to be emulated in the post-9-11 market. From a social and political perspective, however, Israel should serve as something else. A stark warning. The fact that Israel continues to enjoy booming, if poorly shared, prosperity, even as it wages war against its neighbors and escalates the brutality in the occupied territories, demonstrates just how perilous it is to build an economy based on the premise of continual war and deepening disasters. Israel's current ability to combine guns and caviar is the culmination of a dramatic shift in the nature of its economy over the past 15 years one that has had a profound and little examined impact on the parallel disintegration of prospects for peace. The last time there was a credible prospect of peace breaking out in the Middle East was the early 90s, a time when a powerful constituency of Israelis believed that continued conflict was no longer an option. Communism had collapsed, the information revolution was beginning, and there was a widespread conviction inside Israel's business community that the bloody occupation of Gaza and the West Bank, compounded by the boycott of Israel by Arab states, was putting Israel's economic future in dire peril. Seeing the explosion of emerging markets around the world, Israeli corporations were tired of being held back by war. They wanted to be part of the high-profit borderless world, not penned in by regional strife. If the Israeli government could negotiate some sort of peace agreement with the Palestinians, Israel's neighbors would have to lift their boycotts, and the country would be perfectly positioned to be the Middle East's free trade hub. In 1993, Dan Gillerman, then president of the Federation of Israeli Chambers of Commerce, was a vocal proponent of this position. Israel could become just another state, or it could become the strategic, logistic, and marketing center of the whole region like a Middle Eastern Singapore or Hong Kong where multinational companies base their head offices. We are talking about an utterly different economy. Israel must act and fast to adjust, or this once-in-a-lifetime economic opportunity will be missed.
only for us to say, we could have. That same year, Shimon Peres, then foreign minister, explained to a group of Israeli journalists that peace was now inevitable. It was a very particular kind of peace, however. We are not seeking a peace of flags, Peres said. We are interested in a peace of markets. A few months later, the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and the Palestinian Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat shook hands on the White House lawn to mark the inauguration of the Oslo Accords. The world cheered. The three men shared the 1994 Nobel Peace Prize. And then it all went horribly wrong. Oslo may have been the most optimistic period in Israeli-Palestinian relations, but the famous handshake did not mark the sealing of a deal. It was merely an agreement to start a process, with all the most contentious questions left unresolved. Arafat was in a terrible bargaining position, having to negotiate his own return to the occupied territories, and he secured no agreement on the fate of Jerusalem, on Palestinian refugees, on Jewish settlers, or even on the right to Palestinian self-determination. The Oslo strategy, the negotiators claimed, was to push ahead with the peace of markets, based on the idea that the rest would fall into place. By flinging open borders and joining the globalization juggernaut, both Israelis and Palestinians were supposed to experience such concrete improvements in daily life that a more hospitable context would be created for a peace of flags in the negotiations to come. That, at least, was the Oslo promise. Many factors contributed to the subsequent breakdown. Israelis tend to blame suicide bombings and Rabin's assassination. Palestinians point to Israel's frenetic expansion of illegal settlements during the Oslo period as proof that the peace process was founded, in the words of Shlomo Ben-Ami, Israel's foreign minister in the labor government of Ehud Barak, on a neo-colonialist basis, designed so that when there will finally be peace between us and the Palestinians, there will be a situation of dependence, of a structured lack of equality between the two entities. The debates about who derailed the peace process, or whether peace was ever the real goal of the process, are well known and have been exhaustively explored. However, two factors that contributed to Israel's retreat into unilateralism are little understood and rarely discussed both related to the unique ways that the Chicago School free market crusade played out in Israel. One was the influx of Soviet Jews, which was a direct result of Russia's shock therapy experiment. The other was the flipping of Israel's export economy from one based on traditional goods and high technology to one disproportionately dependent on selling expertise and devices relating to counterterrorism. Both factors were greatly disruptive to the Oslo process. The arrival of Russians reduced Israel's reliance on Palestinian labor and allowed it to seal in the occupied territories, while the rapid expansion of the high-tech security economy created a powerful appetite inside Israel's wealthy and most powerful sectors for abandoning peace in favor of fighting a continual and continuously expanding war on terror. By unfortunate historical coincidence, the start of the Oslo period coincided precisely with the most painful phase of the Chicago School experiment in Russia. The handshake on the White House lawn was on September 13, 1993. Exactly three weeks later, Yeltsin sent in the tanks to set fire to the Parliament building, paving the way for his most brutal dose of economic shock. Over the course of the 1990s, roughly one million Jews left the former Soviet Union and moved to Israel. Immigrants who came from the former Soviet Union in this period now make up more than 18% of Israel's total Jewish population. It's hard to overstate the impact of such a large and rapid population transfer to a country as small as Israel. Proportionally, it would be the equivalent of every person in Angola, Cambodia, and Peru packing their bags and moving to the United States all at once. In Europe, it would be equivalent to all of Greece moving to France. When the first wave of Soviet Jews headed for Israel, many were choosing to live in a Jewish state after a lifetime of religious persecution. Following that initial wave, however, the number of Russian immigrants to Israel increased dramatically and in direct relation to the amount of pain being inflicted on the Russian people 
by their economic shock doctors. These later waves of Soviet immigrants were not idealistic Zionists. Many had quite tenuous claims to being Jewish. They were desperate economic refugees. It is not where we are going that is most important, but from where we are coming, an immigrant waiting outside the Israeli embassy in Moscow told the Washington Times in 1992. A spokesperson for the Soviet Jewry Zionist Forum confessed of the exodus that they are not drawn to Israel. They feel expelled from the USSR by the political instability and economic deterioration there. By far, the largest wave came in the wake of Yeltsin's coup in 1993, just as the peace process was beginning in Israel. After that, an additional 600,000 people moved from former Soviet states to Israel. This demographic transformation upended the agreement's already precarious dynamic. Before the arrival of the Soviet refugees, Israel could not have severed itself for any length of time from the Palestinian populations in Gaza and the West Bank. Its economy could no more survive without Palestinian labor than California could run without Mexicans. Roughly 150,000 Palestinians left their homes in Gaza and the West Bank every day and traveled to Israel to clean streets and build roads, while Palestinian farmers and tradespeople filled trucks with goods and sold them in Israel and other parts of the territories. Each side depended on the other economically, and Israel took aggressive measures to prevent the Palestinian territories from developing autonomous trade relationships with Arab states. Then, just as Oslo came into effect, that deeply interdependent relationship was abruptly severed. Unlike Palestinian workers, whose presence in Israel challenged the Zionist project by making demands on the Israeli state for restitution of stolen land and for equal citizenship rights, the hundreds of thousands of Russians who came to Israel at this juncture had the opposite effect. They bolstered Zionist goals by markedly increasing the ratio of Jews to Arabs, while simultaneously providing a new pool of cheap labor. Suddenly, Tel Aviv had the power to launch a new era in Palestinian relations. On March 30, 1993, Israel began its policy of closure, sealing off the border between Israel and the occupied territories, often for days or weeks at a time, preventing Palestinians from getting to their jobs and selling their goods. Closure began as a temporary measure, ostensibly as an emergency response to the threat of terrorism. It quickly became the new status quo, with territories sealed off not just from Israel, but from each other, policed through an ever more elaborate and demeaning system of checkpoints. 1993 had been held up as the dawn of a new hopeful era. Instead, it was the year that the occupied territories were transformed from run-down dormitories, housing the underclass of the Israeli state, into suffocating prisons. In this same period, between 1993 and 2000, the Israeli settlers living in the occupied territories doubled their numbers. What had been in many places rough-hewn settler outposts were transformed into lush, fortified suburbs with their own restricted access roads clearly designed to be an addition to the Israeli state. During the Oslo years, Israel also continued to claim key water reserves in the West Bank, feeding the settlements and diverting scarce water back to Israel. The new immigrants played a little examined part here as well. Many residents of the former Soviet Union who arrived in Israel penniless after seeing their life savings disappear in the shock therapy devaluations, were easily lured into the occupied territories, where houses and apartments were far cheaper and special loans and bonuses were on offer. Some of the most ambitious settlements, such as Ariel in the West Bank, which boasts a university, a hotel, and a Texas mini-golf course, aggressively recruited in the former Soviet Union, sending scouts and launching Russian-language websites. Ariel managed to double its population thanks to this approach, and today it stands as a kind of mini-Moscow, with store signs advertising in both Hebrew and Russian. Half its residents are new immigrants from the former Soviet Union. The Israeli group Peace Now estimates that about 25,000 Israeli citizens living in illegal settlements fall into this category, and it also notes that many Russians made the move 
without a clear understanding of where they were going. In Israel, the years after the Oslo Accords delivered on their promise of trading conflict for prosperity in dramatic fashion. In the mid and late 90s, Israeli companies took the global economy by storm, particularly high-tech firms specializing in telecommunications and web technology, with Tel Aviv and Haifa becoming Middle Eastern outposts of Silicon Valley. At the peak of the dot-com bubble, 15% of Israel's gross domestic product came from high-tech and about half its exports. That made Israel's economy the most tech-dependent in the world, according to Business Week, twice as dependent as the United States. Once again, the new arrivals played a decisive role in the boom. Among the hundreds of thousands of Soviets who came to Israel in the 90s were more highly trained scientists than Israel's top tech institute had graduated in the 80 years of its existence. These were many of the scientists who had kept up the Soviet side of the Cold War. And as one Israeli economist put it, they became the rocket fuel for Israel's tech industry. Shlomo Ben-Ami describes the years after the White House handshake as one of the most breathtaking eras of economic growth and opening up of markets in Israel's history. That opening of markets had promised to benefit both sides in the conflict. But with the exception of a corrupt elite around Arafat, Palestinians were conspicuously absent from the post-Oslo boom. The biggest obstacle was closure, a policy that was never once lifted in the 14 years since it was first imposed in 1993. According to the Harvard Middle East specialist Sarah Roy, when the borders were abruptly sealed in 1993, the effects on Palestinian economic life were catastrophic. Closure has been the single most damaging feature to the economy during the Oslo period and since, the one measure that has imposed the greatest damage on an already compromised economy, she said in an interview. Workers couldn't work. Traders couldn't sell their goods. Farmers couldn't reach their fields. In 1993, per capita GNP in the occupied territories plummeted close to 30%. By the following year, poverty among Palestinians was up 33%. By 1996, says Roy, who has extensively documented the economic impact of closure, 66% of the Palestinian labor force was either unemployed or severely underemployed. Far from a piece of markets, what Oslo meant for Palestinians was disappearing markets, less work, less freedom, and crucially, as the settlements expanded, less land. It was this utterly untenable situation that turned the occupied territories into the tinderbox that went up in flames when Ariel Sharon visited the site in Jerusalem called Al-Haram Al-Sharif by Muslims, by Jews the Temple Mount, in September 2000, setting off the second intifada. In Israel and the international press, it is generally argued that the reason the peace process collapsed was that Ehud Barak's offer at Camp David in July 2000 was the best deal the Palestinians were ever going to get and Arafat turned his back on Israel's generosity, thus proving that he was never genuine in the quest for peace. After that experience, and the eruption of the Second Intifada, Israelis lost faith in negotiation, elected Ariel Sharon, and started building what they called the security barrier, and Palestinians call the apartheid wall, the network of concrete walls and steel fences that protrudes from the 1967 Green Line border, reaching hungrily into Palestinian territory and pulling huge settlement blocks into the Israeli state, as well as 30% of the water sources in some areas. There is no doubt that Arafat wanted a better deal than the ones produced either at Camp David or Taba in January 2001. But these deals were also not the prizes they have been made out to be. Though consistently presented by Israelis as an offer unparalleled in its generosity, Camp David would have provided almost no redress to Palestinians who had been forced from their homes and land when the Israeli state was created in 1948, and it did not come close to satisfying the minimal rights of Palestinians to self-determination. In 2006, 
Shlomo Benami, a lead negotiator for the Israeli government at both Camp David and Taba, broke ranks with the party line and admitted that Camp David was not the missed opportunity for the Palestinians, and if I were Palestinian, I would have rejected Camp David as well. There were other factors contributing to Tel Aviv's abandonment of serious negotiations at peace talks post-2001. Factors just as powerful as Arafat's alleged intransigence or Sharon's personal drive to create a greater Israel. One related to the rise of Israel's tech economy. In the early 90s, Israel's economic elites wanted peace for prosperity. But the kind of prosperity they then built during the Oslo years ended up relying far less on peace than they had originally assumed. When Israel's niche in the global economy turned out to be information technologies, it meant that the key to growth was sending software and computer chips to Los Angeles and London, not shipping heavy cargo to Beirut and Damascus. Success in the tech sector did not require Israel to have friendly relationships with its Arab neighbors or to end its occupation of the territories. The rise of the tech economy was only the first phase of Israel's fateful economic transformation, however. The second came after the dot-com economy crashed in 2000, and Israel's leading companies needed to find a new niche in the global market. With the most tech-dependent economy in the world, Israel was hit harder by the dot-com crash than anywhere else. The country went into immediate freefall, and by June 2001, analysts were predicting that roughly 300 high-tech Israeli firms would go bankrupt, with tens of thousands of layoffs. The Tel Aviv business newspaper Globes declared in a headline that 2002 was the worst year for Israeli economy since 1953. The only reason the recession was not even worse, the newspaper observed, was that the Israeli government quickly intervened with a powerful 10.7% increase in military spending partially financed through cutbacks in social services. The government also encouraged the tech industry to branch out from information and communication technologies and into security and surveillance. In this period, the Israeli Defense Forces played a role similar to a business incubator. Young Israeli soldiers experimented with network systems and surveillance devices while they fulfilled their mandatory military service, then turned their findings into business plans when they returned to civilian life. A slew of new startups were launched, specializing in everything from search and nail, data mining, to surveillance cameras, to terrorist profiling. When the market for these services and devices exploded in the years after September 11th, the Israeli state openly embraced a new national economic vision. The growth provided by the dot-com bubble would be replaced with a homeland security boom. It was the perfect marriage of the Likud party's hawkishness and its radical embrace of Chicago school economics, as embodied by Sharon's finance minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and Israel's new central bank chief, Stanley Fisher, chief architect of the IMF shock therapy adventures in Russia and Asia. By 2003, Israel was already making a stunning recovery, and by 2004, the country had seemed to pull off a miracle. After its calamitous crash, it was performing better than almost any Western economy. Much of this growth was due to Israel's savvy positioning of itself as a kind of shopping mall for homeland security technologies. The timing was perfect. Governments around the world were suddenly desperate for terrorist hunting tools, as well as for human intelligence know-how in the Arab world. Under the leadership of the Likud party, the Israeli state billed itself as a showroom for the cutting-edge homeland security state, drawing on its decades of experience and expertise fighting Arab and Muslim threats. Israel's pitch to North America and Europe was straightforward. The war on terror you are just embarking on is one we have been fighting since our birth. Let our high-tech firms and privatized spy companies show you how it's done. Overnight, Israel became, in the words of Forbes magazine, the go-to country for anti-terrorism technologies. Every year since 2002, Israel has played host to at least half a dozen major homeland security conferences for lawmakers, police chiefs, sheriffs, and CEOs from around the world, with their size and scope growing every year.
As traditional tourism suffered in the face of security fears, this kind of official counter-terror tourism emerged to partially fill the gap. During one such gathering in February 2006, billed as a behind-the-scenes tour of Israel's struggle against terrorism, delegates from the FBI, Microsoft, and Singapore's mass transit system, among others, traveled to some of Israel's most popular tourism destinations. The Knesset, the Temple Mount, the Wailing Wall. At each location, the visitors examined and admired the fortress-style security systems to see what they could apply at home. In May 2007, Israel hosted the directors of several large U.S. airports who attended workshops on the types of aggressive passenger profiling and screening used at Ben Gurion International Airport near Tel Aviv. Stephen Grossman, head of aviation at the International Airport in Oakland, California, explained that he was there because the Israelis are legendary for their security. Some of the events are macabre and theatrical. At the International Homeland Security Conference 2006, for instance, the Israeli military staged an elaborate simulation of a mass casualty disaster that started in the city of Nes Zayana and concluded in Asaf Harafa Hospital, according to the organizers. These are not policy conferences, but highly lucrative trade shows designed to demonstrate the prowess of Israeli security firms. As a result, Israeli companies selling high-tech consultation services to foreign firms, much of it security-related, now makes up 31% of the country's total exports. Israel has more technology stocks listed on the Nasdaq exchange than any other foreign country, and it has more tech patents registered in the U.S. than China and India combined. Its technology sector, much of it linked to security, grew by 16% in 2006 alone, and now makes up 60% of all exports. Len Rosen, a prominent Israeli investment banker, told Fortune magazine, It's security that matters more than peace. During Oslo, people were looking for peace to provide growth. Now they're looking for security so violence doesn't curtail growth. He could have gone much further. The business of providing security in Israel and around the world is directly responsible for much of Israel's meteoric economic growth in recent years. It is not an exaggeration to say that the war on terror industry saved Israel's faltering economy, much as the disaster capitalism complex helped rescue the global stock markets. With more and more countries turning themselves into fortresses, walls and high-tech fences are going up on the border between India and Kashmir, Saudi Arabia and Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan, Security barriers may prove to be the biggest disaster market of all. The extraordinary performance of Israel's homeland security companies is well known to stock watchers, but it is rarely discussed as a factor in the politics of the region. It should be. It is not a coincidence that the Israeli state's decision to put counter-terrorism at the center of its export economy has coincided precisely with its abandonment of peace negotiations as well as a clear strategy to reframe its conflict with the Palestinians not as battle against a nationalist movement with specific goals for land and rights, but rather as part of the global war on terror, one against illogical, fanatical forces bent only on destruction. Economics is by no means the primary motivator for the escalation in the region since 2001. There is, of course, no shortage of fuel for violence on all sides. Yet within this context that is so weighted against peace, economics has, at certain points, been a countervailing force, pushing reluctant political leaders into negotiations, as was the case in the early 90s. What the homeland security boom has done is change the direction of that pressure, creating yet another powerful sector invested in continued violence. As has been the case on previous Chicago school frontiers, Israel's post-9-11 growth spurt has been marked by the rapid stratification of society between rich and poor inside the state. The security buildup has been accompanied by a wave of privatizations and funding cuts to social programs that has virtually annihilated the economic legacy of labor Zionism and created an epidemic of inequality, the likes of which Israelis have never known. 
In 2007, 24.4% of Israelis were living below the poverty line, with 35.2% of all children in poverty, compared with 8% of children 20 years earlier. Yet even though the benefits of the boom have not been widely shared, they have been so lucrative for a small sector of Israelis, particularly the powerful segment that is seamlessly integrated into both the military and government, with all the familiar corporatist corruption scandals, that a crucial incentive for peace has been obliterated. The Israeli business sector's shift in political direction has been dramatic. The vision that captivates the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange today is no longer that of Israel as a regional trade hub, but rather as a futuristic fortress, able to survive even in a sea of determined enemies. The revised attitude was most pronounced in the summer of 2006, when the Israeli government turned what should have been a prisoner exchange negotiation with Hezbollah into a full-scale war. Israel's largest corporations didn't just support the war, they sponsored it. Bank Leumi, Israel's newly privatized megabank, distributed bumper stickers with the slogans, We will be victorious, and We are strong. While, as the Israeli journalist the novelist Yitzhak Leor wrote at the time, the current war is the first to become a branding opportunity for one of our largest mobile phone companies, which is using it to run a huge promotional campaign. Clearly, Israeli industry no longer has reason to fear war. In contrast to 1993, when conflict was seen as a barrier to growth, the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange went up in August 2006, the month of the devastating war with Lebanon. In the final quarter of the year, which had also included the bloody escalation in the West Bank and Gaza following the election of Hamas, Israel's overall economy grew by a staggering 8%, more than triple the growth rate of the U.S. economy in the same period. The Palestinian economy, meanwhile, contracted by between 10 and 15% in 2006, with poverty rates reaching close to 70%. One month after the UN declared a ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah, the New York Stock Exchange hosted a special conference on investing in Israel. More than 200 Israeli firms attended, many of them in the homeland security sector. At that moment in Lebanon, economic activity was at a virtual standstill, and roughly 140 factories, manufacturers of everything from prefab homes to medical products to milk, were clearing away the rubble after being hit by Israeli bombs and missiles. Impervious to the impact of the war, the message of the New York gatherings was upbeat. Israel is open for business, has always been open for business, announced Israel's ambassador to the United Nations, Dan Gillerman, welcoming delegates to the event. Only a decade earlier, this kind of wartime exuberance would have been unimaginable. It was Gillerman who, as head of the Israeli Federation of Chambers of Commerce, had called for Israel to seize the historic opportunity and become a Middle Eastern Singapore. Now he was one of the most inflammatory of Israel's pro-war hawks, pushing for an even wider escalation. On CNN, Gillerman said that, while it may be politically incorrect and may be even untrue to say that all Muslims are terrorists, it happens to be very true that nearly all terrorists are Muslim. So this is not just Israel's war. This is the world's war. This recipe for endless worldwide war is the same one that the Bush administration offered as a business prospectus to the nascent disaster capitalism complex after September 11th. It is not a war that can be won by any country. But winning is not the point. The point is to create security inside fortress states bolstered by endless low-level conflict outside their walls. In a way, it is the same goal that the private security companies have in Iraq. Secure the perimeter, protect the principle. Baghdad, New Orleans, and Sandy Springs provide glimpses of a kind of gated future built and run by the disaster capitalism complex. It is in Israel, however, that this process is most advanced. An entire country has turned itself into a fortified gated community, surrounded by locked-out people living in permanently excluded red zones. This is what a society looks like when it has lost its economic incentive for peace and is heavily invested in fighting and profiting from an endless 
and unwinnable war on terror. One part looks like Israel, the other part looks like Gaza. Israel's case is extreme, but the kind of society it is creating may not be unique. The disaster capitalism complex thrives in conditions of low-intensity grinding conflict. That seems to be the end point in all the disaster zones, from New Orleans to Iraq. In April 2007, U.S. soldiers began implementing a plan to turn several volatile Baghdad neighborhoods into gated communities, surrounded by checkpoints and concrete walls, and where Iraqis would be tracked using biometric technology. We'll be like the Palestinians, predicted one resident of Atamaya, watching his neighborhood being sealed in by the barrier. After it becomes clear that Baghdad is never going to be Dubai, and New Orleans won't be Disneyland, Plan B is to settle into another Colombia, or Nigeria. Never-ending war, fought in large measure by private soldiers and paramilitaries, damped down just enough to get the natural resources out of the ground, helped along by mercenaries guarding the pipelines, platforms, and water reserves. It has become commonplace to compare the militarized ghettos of Gaza and the West Bank with their concrete walls, electrified fences, and checkpoints, to the Bantustan system in South Africa, which kept blacks in ghettos and demanded passes when they left. Israel's laws and practices in the OPT, Occupied Palestinian Territories, certainly resemble aspects of apartheid, said John Dugard, the South African lawyer who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories, in February 2007. The similarities are stark, but there are differences too. South Africa's Bantustans were essentially work camps, a way to keep African laborers under tight surveillance and control so they would work cheaply in the mines. What Israel has constructed is a system designed to do the opposite, to keep workers from working, a network of open holding pens for millions of people who have been categorized as surplus humanity. Palestinians are not the only people in the world who have been so categorized. Millions of Russians also became surplus in their own country, which is why so many fled their homes in the hope of finding a job and a decent life in Israel. Although the original Bantustans had been dismantled in South Africa, the one in four people who live in shacks in fast-expanding slums are also surplus in the new, neoliberal South Africa. This discarding of 25 to 60 percent of the population has been the hallmark of the Chicago School Crusade since the misery villages began mushrooming throughout the southern cone in the 70s. In South Africa, Russia, and New Orleans, the rich build walls around themselves. Israel has taken this disposal process a step further. It has built walls around the dangerous poor. Conclusion Shock wears off. The rise of people's reconstruction. We do not always respond to shocks with regression. Sometimes, in the face of crisis, we grow up, fast. This impulse was in powerful evidence in Spain on March 11, 2004, when ten bombs ripped through commuter trains and rail stations in Madrid, killing nearly 200 people. President José María Aznar immediately went on television and told Spaniards to blame the Basque separatists and to give him their support for the war in Iraq. No negotiation is possible or desirable with these assassins who so many times have sown death all around Spain. Only with firmness can we end the attacks, he said. Spaniards reacted badly to that kind of talk. We are still hearing the echoes of Franco, said José Antonio Martínez Soler, a prominent Madrid newspaper editor who had been persecuted under Francisco Franco's dictatorship. In every act, in every gesture, in every sentence, Asnar told the people he was right, that he was the owner of the truth, and those who disagreed with him were his enemies. In other words, the very same qualities that Americans identified as strong leadership in their president after September 11th were, in Spain, regarded as ominous signs of a rising fascism. The country was three days away from national elections. And remembering a time when fear governed politics, voters defeated Asnar and chose a party that would pull troops out of Iraq. As in Lebanon, it was the collective memory of past shocks 
that made Spain resistant to the new ones. All shock therapists are intent on the erasure of memory. Ewan Cameron was convinced that he needed to wipe out the minds of his patients before he could rebuild them. The U.S. occupiers of Iraq felt no need to stop the looting of Iraq's museums and libraries, thinking it might make their jobs easier. But like Cameron's former patient, Gail Kastner, with her intricate architecture of papers, books, and lists, recollections can be rebuilt. New narratives can be created. Memory, both individual and collective, turns out to be the greatest shock absorber of all. Despite the successful attempts to exploit the 2004 tsunami in Asia, memory also proved to be an effective tool of resistance in some areas where it struck, particularly in Thailand. Dozens of coastal villages were flattened by the wave, but unlike in Sri Lanka, where many fishing families were forced to relocate inland and to find another means of survival, many Thai settlements were successfully rebuilt within months. The difference did not come from the government. Thailand's politicians were just as eager as those elsewhere to use the storm as an excuse to evict fishing people and hand over land tenure to large resorts. Yet what set Thailand apart was that villagers approached all government promises with intense skepticism and refused to wait patiently in camps for an official reconstruction plan. Instead, within weeks... Hundreds of villagers engaged in what they called land reinvasions. They marched past the armed guards on the payroll of developers, tools in hand, and began marking off the sites where their old houses had been. In some cases, reconstruction began immediately. I am willing to bet my life on this land, because it is ours, said Ratri Kangwatmai, who lost most of her family in the tsunami. The most daring reinvasions were performed by Thailand's indigenous fishing peoples called the Mokan, or Sea Gypsies. After centuries of disenfranchisement, the Mokan had no illusions that a benevolent state would give them a decent piece of land in exchange for the coastal properties that had been seized. So, in one dramatic case, the residents of the Bantung Wa village in the Pang Na province gathered themselves together and marched right back home where they encircled their wrecked village with rope in a symbolic gesture to mark their land ownership, explained a report by a Thai NGO. With the entire community camping out there, it became difficult for the authorities to chase them away, especially given the intense media attention being focused on tsunami rehabilitation. In the end, the villagers negotiated a deal with the government to give up part of their oceanfront property in exchange for legal security on the rest of their ancestral land. Today, the rebuilt village is a showcase of Mokan culture, complete with museum, community center, school, and market. Now, officials from the sub-district come to Bantung Wa to learn about people-managed tsunami rehabilitation, while researchers and university students turn up there by the busful to study indigenous people's wisdom. All along the Thai coast where the tsunami hit, this kind of direct action reconstruction is the norm. The key to their success, community leaders say, is that people negotiate for their land rights from a position of being in occupation. Some have dubbed the practice negotiating with your hands. Thailand survivors have also insisted on a different kind of aid. Rather than settling for handouts, they have demanded the tools to carry out their own reconstruction. Dozens of Thai architecture students and professors, for example, volunteered to help community members design their new houses and draw their own rebuilding plans. Master boat builders trained villagers to make their own, more sophisticated fishing vessels. The results are communities stronger than they were before the wave. The houses on stilts, built by Thai villagers in Ban Tung Wa and Ban Nai Rai, are beautiful and sturdy. They are also cheaper, larger and cooler than the sweltering prefab cubicles on offer there from foreign contractors. A manifesto drafted by a coalition of Thai tsunami survivor communities explains the philosophy. The rebuilding work should be done by local communities themselves as much as possible. Keep contractors out. Let communities take responsibility for their own housing. 
A year after Katrina hit the New Orleans area, a remarkable exchange took place in Thailand between the leaders of that country's grassroots reconstruction effort after the devastating tsunami and a small delegation of hurricane survivors from New Orleans. The visitors from the United States toured several rebuilt Thai villages and were taken aback by the speed with which rehabilitation had become a reality. In New Orleans, we're waiting around on the government to do things for us. But here, you all are doing by yourselves, said Andesha Joakali, founder of the Survivor's Village in New Orleans. When we go back, he pledged, your model is our new goal. After the community leaders from New Orleans returned home, there was indeed a wave of direct action in the city. Joakali, whose own neighborhood was still in ruins, organized teams of local contractors and volunteers to gut the flood-damaged interiors in every house on the block. Then they moved on to the next one. He said that his trip to the tsunami region gave him a good perspective on how the people of New Orleans are going to have to put FEMA aside and the city and state government aside and begin to say, what can we do right now to start to bring our neighborhoods back in spite of the government, not because of it? Another veteran of the Asia trip, Viola Washington, also returned to her New Orleans neighborhood, Gentilly, with an entirely new attitude. She broke down a map of Gentilly into sections, organized representative committees for each section, and appointed leaders who meet to discuss rebuilding needs. She explained that, as we fight the government to get our money, we don't want to be doing nothing to try to get ourselves back. There was still more direct action in New Orleans. In February 2007, groups of residents who had lived in the public housing projects that the Bush administration was planning to demolish began reinvading their old homes and taking up residence. Volunteers helped clean out apartments and raised money to buy generators and solar panels. My home is my castle, and I'm taking it back, announced Gloria Williams, a resident of the housing project C.J. Pete. The reinvasion turned into a block party, complete with a New Orleans brass band. There was much to celebrate. At least for now, this one community had escaped the great cultural bulldozer that calls itself Reconstruction. Uniting all these examples of people rebuilding for themselves is a common theme. Participants say they are not just repairing buildings, but healing themselves. It makes perfect sense. The universal experience of living through a great shock is the feeling of being completely powerless. In the face of awesome forces, parents lose the ability to save their children, Spouses are separated. Homes, places of protection, become death traps. The best way to recover from helplessness turns out to be helping, having the right to be part of a communal recovery. Reopening Our Schools says this is a very special community, tied together by more than location, but by spirituality, by bloodlines, and by a desire to come home said the assistant principal of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans. Such people's reconstruction efforts represent the antithesis of the disaster capitalism complex's ethos, with its perpetual quest for clean sheets and blank slates on which to build model states. Like Latin America's farm and factory co-ops, they are inherently improvisational, making do with whoever is left behind and whatever rusty tools have not been swept away, broken, or stolen. Unlike the fantasy of the rapture, the apocalyptic erasure that allows the ethereal escape of true believers, local people's renewal movements begin from the premise that there is no escape from the substantial messes we have created, and that there has already been enough erasure of history, of culture, of memory. These are movements that do not seek to start from scratch, but rather from scrap, from the rubble that is all around. As the corporatist crusade continues its violent decline, turning up the shock dial to blast through the mounting resistance it encounters, these projects point a way forward between fundamentalisms. Radical only in their intense practicality, rooted in the communities where they live, these men and women see themselves as mere repair people, taking what's there and fixing it, reinforcing it, making it better and more equal. Most of all, 
they are building in resilience for when the next shock hits. We hope you've enjoyed The Shock Doctrine, an audio renaissance audiobook from Henry Holt. This program was produced by Paul Rubin, executive producer Laura Wilson, text copyright 2007 by Naomi Klein, production copyright 2007 by Audio Renaissance, a division of Holt Spring Publishers, LLC. All rights reserved. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.